Here at Firebase, we want to make it easier for you to build more successful mobile and web apps. And over the last few years, we've been hard at work making Firebase better for all developers, from the smallest one-person startups to the largest enterprise businesses. For example, just last month, we announced that Firebase Crashlytics is available for Unity, so all you game developers can get in on the fun of squashing bugs before they become big enough for your customers to notice. MLKit added a number of new features, including the Smart Reply API, which can come up with helpful reply suggestions based on your conversation history. We've also added a number of improvements you've been asking for to Firebase Test Lab, including flaky test detection, better gaming support, and more. And all you enterprise businesses will be happy to know that Firebase is now part of the Google Cloud Platform support plan. And this year at Google I.O. 2019, we've announced even more features to put a smile on your face. For the last couple of years, native mobile developers have loved using Firebase performance monitoring to find out what parts of their app are running slower than they expect and for which customers. But why should they have all the fun? Firebase performance monitoring is now available for the web. Now you can find out important page load and network metrics just by including a small script on your site. Performance monitoring visualizes the distribution of load times across your user base. You can drill into the distribution by browser, region, device type, and more, so you can see exactly which customers are having a great experience with your website and which ones aren't. And if you've been using Crashlytics for Firebase, you'll be happy to know we've added support for creating custom velocity alerts, so you can decide exactly how often you want to be alerted when your app's stability changes. MLKit has added support for several new features, including AutoML Vision Edge. This will allow you to create custom machine learning models tailored to your needs. Want to build an app that distinguishes between different birds? Or identify a whale based on its tail? Just upload your training data to the Firebase console, and we can use Google's powerful AutoML technology to build a custom machine learning model for you to run locally on your user's device. Over in Firebase Hosting, we've added support for Cloud Run, which combines Firebase Hosting's global CDN and caching features with Cloud Run's fully managed stateless containers, making it easy for you to add performance server-side rendering for your websites in just about any language you want without ever having to stand up or manage a server of your own. We've built a brand new emulator for Cloud Functions for Firebase that can communicate with both the real-time database and Cloud Firestore emulators. So if you want to build a function that listens to a Cloud Firestore document, perform some logic, and then writes changes back to Cloud Firestore, you can develop and test that entire flow locally for much faster development. And for Cloud Firestore, we've added support for collection group queries. This allows you to search for fields across all collections of the same name, no matter where they are in the database. And that means it's easier to organize your data in a way that makes sense to you, while still being able to search for the documents you want. In the analytics world, we've added more features to dynamic audiences with a brand new audience builder. This will let you create more sophisticated and finely tuned groups of users, or audiences, so you can better optimize their experience and keep them happier and coming back to your app. We've also combined analytics data with the power of Google's machine learning to create custom reporting insights for analytics, which will tell you about unusual trends in your app as they happen. But of course, we're not done. Now that Google I.O. is over, we'll be hard at work. Uh, I said we'll be hard at work. That's better making even more improvements you've been asking for, and probably adding another surprise or two. So be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, check out our blog, and subscribe to our monthly newsletter to stay on top of all
The first time I came to get my first round of chemo, I was so nervous. The whole experience. Please welcome to the stage Frank Van Puffelen. Wow. Welcome everyone to the Firebase Summit. They told me that you shouldn't start a keynote at 10 a.m. in Spain. And they were sort of wrong, right? Thank you for all being here. I love having you all here. It's great. Um, let's see. We've been doing this for a bit now. This is the fourth Firebase Summit. Can you believe that? We started this in 2016 in Berlin. Then we went to Amsterdam. Last year, we were in Prague. And I'm so happy to be here with all of you today in the IFEMA in Madrid. It's going to be an exciting day. I think I see some familiar faces here. Who has been to all four Firebase summits? And that, of course, includes me. Yes, I love it. I see a few folks. And honestly, that's impressive, right? Thanks for being with us for such a long time already. We really appreciate it. But we don't just appreciate the old timers. For who is this their first Firebase summit? Ooh, I love that. Welcome. Welcome so much. I yeah, you might notice I'm excited about all the new people that we're bringing to Firebase. I look forward to chatting to as many of you as possible in the breaks. It won't be everyone. There's just too many of us today. OK. Now, that's just the people in person. We actually also have people joining on the live stream. And let's see if I can find them. And right over there. Hey, everyone on the live stream. Thanks for joining us today. It's actually going to be fairly simple for you, right? You only have one choice to make. Tune in or don't tune in. And you made the right choice already because you tuned in. So you're going to be seeing everything that we're doing on this main stage today, so the keynote and the sessions. And then we're also going to have a special treat for you. Because while everyone here is having lunch, we'll be hosting a special episode of our YouTube series, Ask Firebase, right here on this stage. So tune in for that and ask your questions if you didn't do so already. OK. Back to everyone here, though. Honestly, I just want to get started on the keynote, right? We have such cool announcements. Um, there's just one thing that I want to get out of the way, but this is fun. We are, uh, right, we're Firebasers. We're an inclusive community. We welcome each and every one of you. And we want you to have a great experience today. It doesn't matter what your background or experience level is. We want you to have a great time. And to do that, I sort of need help from everyone, right? Have a look to your left. And look to your right. Also, when you have a moment, look behind you and in front of you. There's bound to be somebody who you haven't met before, right? Because there's so many of us here. So during the breaks, get to know people, right? Talk to somebody who you haven't seen before and introduce yourselves. One thing that I always like is building off each other. So if somebody says something, reinforce what they said and tell about your experience with the same thing. And since we're at the Firebase Summit, you have at least one thing in common, right? Spanish tapas. OK. We have community guidelines posted throughout the venue. So I recommend that you read them if you haven't done so already. 
And um, if you see something that you, you makes you feel uncomfortable or that you really think we should know about, tell one of our staff members and we'll investigate. Um, I like it, especially since I'm pretty much done here. So <laughs> with that, we're ready to kick off for the keynote. And like I said, this is probably the most exciting thing for me because we have so many new launches. So without further ado, let's give a very, very, very warm welcome to Director of Products for Google, Paul Manuel. Hola, buenos días y bienvenidos a Firebase Summit 2019. Y bienvenidos a Madrid. So as you can see, I'm very happy to be in Madrid and so glad that all of you could come and join us in person. I gotta say, I've really been enjoying the tapas and the churros con chocolate. I hope you get to enjoy the food while you're here too. I also wanted to say hello to our live stream viewers. Thank you all for tuning in from all over the world. I'm Paul Manuel. In addition to being a churro aficionado and a madrileño at heart, I'm also the director of product and engineering at Google. And I'm so excited to welcome all of you to our fourth annual Firebase Summit. In 2016, we held the event in Berlin and were joined by hundreds of developers. Right now, we have more than 1,000 developers in this room from over 70 countries. It's amazing to see our community grow stronger each year, always ready to learn from each other and share to make Firebase better. To date, the Firebase community has contributed over 1.4 million lines of code to Firebase. Give yourself a round of applause for that. Thank you, everybody. So this compares pretty favorably to the 900,000 lines of code you also deleted. <laughs> so thank you for making Firebase a really healthy code base, an incredibly healthy community. We couldn't do it without you. So we love collaborating with developers like you because you are the architects of the future. You dare to solve impossible problems. Then with gusto, write the code that brings your vision to life. Together, we can move technology forward by leaps and bounds. So before we jump into all the exciting news from Firebase, I wanted to quickly step back and talk about why Google invests in developers. Google is like you all. We're founded by developers who wanted to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful so that anyone, anywhere, with a dream could gain the knowledge to put it to life. But the world is changing, and so we're evolving the way we approach our mission. We're moving from a company that helps you find answers to a company that helps you get things done. We want our products to work harder for you in the context of your home, your job, and your life. So when you need to find the fastest route to a restaurant for dinner, Google Maps is there to help you. When you need to buy flowers to celebrate your anniversary, because you might have forgotten, I've never done that. The Google Assistant is there with a friendly reminder. And when you need to take a break after a long day, YouTube has hours and hours of content. And you all play a critical role in creating these magical experiences. It's your products that really help people in moments big and small. And we believe that a vibrant developer ecosystem that's open with innovation coming from all quarters benefits all of us. And that's why we invest in the tools and resources to make development easier and faster. All the way across the spectrum, from mobile, where just a few weeks ago we launched Android 10, adding support for 5G, and many privacy and security features. Also in the cloud, where we introduced Anthos, our new hybrid cloud platform that helps you run an app anywhere, simply, flexibly, and securely. And for machine learning, we're committed to expanding TensorFlow, our open source platform that democratizes ML and makes it available to everyone. And of course, there's Firebase, the app development platform that brought you all here today. 
So we know that navigating this landscape can be tough. So we're bringing the things together on Google.dev. Google.dev is a new home where you can get up to speed on all of the tools and resources that Google offers. Those of you who are here today in the, in the audience and those watching on live stream can get early access by going to the link on the screen. It's google.dev forward slash topics forward slash Firebase. But today, today is all about Firebase. Through Firebase, we're pushing to make app development seamless so that mobile and web developers can succeed, which is why the team has been hard at work expanding and enhancing its capabilities. And for me, it's really exciting to see that now over 2 million apps actively use Firebase every month. I know I speak for the rest of the team when I say it's an honor to be trusted by so many of you and to see the work that you're doing. Just to give a few examples, right here in Spain, Cabify is using Firebase to help people inform of their cab's arrival time. In France, Le Figaro is using Firebase to grow their subscription base by personalizing content for their users. And in the United States, a startup named Mighty Immersion is using Firebase to transform care for cancer patients. And it really is incredible to see what you all do. And at Firebase, and across all of Google's developer products, the best part of our platform is you all, our developer community. We believe that developers are critical to our success, which is why we want to have a vibrant and open developer ecosystem. An ecosystem that we all benefit from, and an ecosystem that helps you bring your ideas to life. We're here to help you on that journey. So now, I'd like to share a story about Mighty Immersion, a mighty three-person team that, with a little help from technology, is changing lives. Roll the video. The first time I came to get my first round of chemo, I was so nervous. The whole experience of accepting that your child has cancer and um, being able to not take it away was probably the hardest thing as a parent. Health has always been our greatest wealth, but often healthcare visits are surrounded by pain and fear, especially when children are involved. My name's Luke Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of Mighty Immersion, and I work developing virtual reality tools to reduce pain and anxiety in pediatric patients. The way VR works is it keeps the child engaged. They are focused on what's going on in the virtual world, and that allows them to, to really uh, be removed from what's going on in some cases around them, which can be stressful or painful. I feel like it really helps all around because when you're watching yourself get like a needle put in your port, it can be hard to watch, especially if you're already not a big needle person. The second we started seeing success in the experiences that we were developing, uh, we realized that we needed to distribute this at a larger scale. We had to grow the, the headset base from a couple headsets to 10, 20, even 50 headsets in certain hospitals. That's when we needed Firebase in order to manage all these devices through a simple web portal online. Using Firebase made developing and management system extremely fast. We were able to have this idea and put it into practice immediately. We, we didn't have to focus on any of the backend development. We could rely on Firebase and really focus on the core of what we were building. So much is taken away from you when you're a patient in a hospital, and to be able to smile and, and enjoy your life a little bit is actually extremely powerful and brings us a lot of joy as well. Hi, everyone. I'm Francis, head of product for Firebase. What a touching video, right? The first time I watched it, I got a little teary-eyed because I know what it's like to have close family members battle with cancer. But this is exactly why we do what we do, to enable companies like Mighty Immersion make the world a better place. 
And it's stories like this and many others are what inspire our team to work hard every day to help developers like you succeed. Now together, we've come a long way, yet the best is yet to come. Now as we look forward to the future of Firebase, we're invested in three key areas. First, helping you accelerate your app development by giving you the building blocks to solve many of the common and core problems in app development. Second, helping you run your app more efficiently by simplifying your workflows and servicing insights when you need it so it helps you improve your app quality and increase user engagement. And third, making Firebase more extensible so that you can tailor it to your needs as you scale by giving you the control, flexibility, and transparency. Now, we've got exciting announcements across all three of these areas today. So let's get started. We'll dive right into how Firebase helps you accelerate your app development. Now, as developers, we often spend a lot of time setting up infrastructure or writing code that doesn't differentiate our app. Things like having to store our data, manage databases, authentication, or scaling our servers. And to help you focus more on building amazing user experiences and running your business, Firebase provides fully managed back-end services to help you solve many of these common and core problems, from databases to help you store and sync data, to cloud functions that helps you run your code in the cloud, to MLKit that helps you apply machine learning and bring that into your app. Now, if you've used these services, you know they take the hard parts of building an app and make them easy. But we've also heard from you that there's an area where we can do more is helping you with your development workflow. Now, today, as you develop and build an app, this is how it goes. You make some code changes, maybe push it to the cloud, switch over to your mobile device, and see if it works. And if you need to make a small change, you've got to start this cycle all over again. So we hear your feedback that you want a faster and better way to do this. And that's why we built the Firebase Emulator Suite. Now, the Emulator Suite is a set of tools that lets you run emulated versions of Firestore, functions, real-time database, and hosting locally on your computer for a faster and safer development experience. And since the suite runs locally on your machine, it enables rapid iteration without touching production data. And furthermore, it supports hot reloading when you're changing functions or your security rules. Another great aspect is that it enables you to scale your development across larger teams. So for example, let's say that you have each developer having a local instance of emulator running on their machine. You can develop them in parallel, say you have a team of five, writing five different features without creating conflicts. So over the past few months, we've expanded the functionality of the emulators. In addition to supporting Firestore and functions, we've also added support for the real-time database. We've also expanded the SDK from Android to iOS and web, and many of the server-side admin SDKs as well, like Java, Node, and Python. Now, to show you some of these new updates, I'm going to pass it to my teammate, Julio, to show us a demo. Hi, everyone. I was born and raised here in Madrid, so it's very exciting for me to be back home as a software engineer at Google, talking to you about some of the cool stuff Firebase has to offer. One of my favorite things about Firebase is how easy it makes our lives as developers. And to show you just how easy it is to develop using the emulator suite, let me introduce you to our Friendly Eats demo app. Friendly Eats allows us to search for restaurants, write reviews, and see the reviews others have left. Currently, it can save reviews, but it doesn't update the restaurant's rating when a new review is added. So we're going to be adding that functionality here. Usually, Friendly Eats connects to Firestore and functions in the cloud. But we're going to be using the emulator suite to develop locally. So we'll connect to our local emulated instances of Firestore and Functions running directly on my machine. Now let's walk through how the app will work with local emulators. When someone leaves a review, we write it to Firestore, which will trigger the update rating function on my machine. This function will calculate the average rating and then write the results back to Firestore, which we'll see immediately since we're using Firestore's real-time syncing. 
And all of this is going to happen locally on my machine. Okay, let's see this workflow in action. First, we'll start the emulators. Once we have the Firebase CLI installed, we'll go to the terminal and run the command Firebase Emulator Start, which will start the emulators we selected for our project. Here, you can see the Firestore and Functions emulators starting. Okay, they're all done, so let's switch over to our IDE and connect to them. We're going to need to connect to both the Functions and Firestore emulators. The nice thing is we only need one statement from each to connect. So I'm going to do what all good developers do and copy and paste this from the docs. So we already have our instance of Firestore, so we only need the settings. So let me copy that and apply them. OK, that's Firestore done. Let's do the same for functions now. And that's functions. So what this does is tell the SDK to connect to our local emulators instead of going to the cloud. Now, to make sure this is working as intended, let's run our app. We should see an empty list of restaurants for now, since we're a local Firestore instance has no data yet. Let's give this a second to start. It's building, it's starting, there we go. OK, there we go. So let's start by adding some fake restaurants. And there we have it. Let's see what happens when we leave a review. So as you can see, the review was added, but we haven't updated the rating or the number of reviews for the restaurant. To do this, we're going to need to add our function to update this information. So let's go to the functions file. Here, we need this function to run whenever a new review is written, and the first three lines of code will do exactly that. Then, this function will calculate the update, updated restaurant information and store it into Firestore. All that's left is to export this function so it can be executed. So let's do that. Great. So this should do the trick. And since local emulators have hot loading, I only need to save the changes, and they're ready immediately. So let's try to leave another review and see if it works this time. And there we have it. You see that now we calculate the updated information and see it immediately. Hot reloading really is a game changer when it comes to development velocity. Instead of waiting for our code to deploy, we make a change and see the results instantly. Now, as well as allowing rapid local development, the emulator suite also enables testing automation. For example, we can set up the emulator to run programmatically with our continuous integration system, like Travis or Jenkins, to automatically run regression tests before deploying to prod for a faster and safer development experience. Back to you, Francis. Thanks, Julio. So as you can see, our emulator suite gives you a local playground where you can safely build and test new features before rolling them out to production. But the most striking advantage of using the emulator is that you can develop your code so much faster. Now I want to highlight another building block that you can use to accelerate your efforts to bring machine learning into your app, MLKit. Last year, we launched MLKit, bringing together machine learning technologies from across Google and making them available to every mobile developer in one easy-to-use package. Through MLKit, we give you access to on-device and cloud-based APIs that you can use out of the box, even if you have no previous experience with machine learning. Now, these APIs provide functionality such as face detection, image labeling, text recognition, and we keep adding more. Now, while the base APIs are extremely easy to get started, we also recognize that many of you require solutions that are more customized for your app. And that's why MLKit also supports for custom TensorFlow-like models. And with Firebase, you can host your models on our global infrastructure and then deploy them dynamically to your app 
directly to your end users' devices. Now, in this year, we've taken support for custom models even further. Previously, to integrate your own custom model, you still have to create, train, optimize the model all on your own. Recognizing this process requires some ML expertise that may not be widely available. We've made this much easier with the launch of AutoML Vision Edge. Now, to create custom models for image labeling, all you have to do is gather your training images for the classes of items you want to identify and then upload them to Firebase. From there, we're going to take care of the training and optimization process and automatically generate an on-device TensorFlow Lite model that's ready for you to implement into your app. No ML expertise is required. To show this to you in action, I want to pass it back to Julio. Thanks, Francis. So let's continue with our friendly eats example. To make it easier for our users to identify what dishes the reviews were for, we want to automatically tag the pictures uploaded using ML. To do this, I'm going to use AutoML Vision Edge to create a custom model that identifies different types of food. Let's go through how to do this. We'll start in the Firebase console in the ML Kit section, where we'll create a new data set called Food and upload the images. So let's do that. Here, we'll upload those images. And because uploading can take a little while, let's jump over to the data set I created earlier, where the images are already uploaded. Here, you can see that you have the images with the labels, and you can add or remove images, as well as update their labels. Once we're happy here, we'll move on to the next step, which is training the model. Here, you can pick between optimizing for higher accuracy or latency and size. We'll then have to choose how long to train the model for. Usually, larger data sets require longer training times. In this case, I'm going to go with the default. And, continu and to continue with the demo, I'll jump over to a model that is already trained. Here you can see the results after the model is done training. We can see the precision and recall. And underneath, we can see a breakdown by label of how often the model was correct. This information allows us to decide whether we're ready to use this model or whether we need to continue iterating. Once we're happy, the last step is to integrate the model into Friendly Eats. We can either bundle it with the app or publish it to Firebase so the app can download it as needed to, for on-device inferencing. Note that we've created this model with just a few clicks and no machine learning experience. So let's see if it works. Can we switch to the phone? Please. <laughs> no? Well, let's do this. I'm going to do the demo, and I'll show it to all of you who can see it. And for those of you interested, you can come later to ask Firebase, and I'll show you in person. So here's the dish. <laughs> and here's the model identifying it correctly as churros. Oh, there we go. See that? <laughs> <laughs> so we just walked through how you can use Firebase to train and deploy an ML model for your mobile app without needing any ML experience. Back to you, Francis. Thanks, Elia. <laughs> so since launching Firebase, we've strived to offer fully managed back-end back services and infrastructure that speed up your time to market. Now, our goal is to help you get to the fun part of app development as fast as possible without the fuss of managing servers. Nobody's got time for that, right? Now, we've set up development even more. The emulator suite lets you try your code out instantly on your local machine without deploying it. And AutoML Vision Edge makes it even easier and faster to build and deploy ML into your app. Now, in the coming months, we're going to continue to further integrate these products with Google Cloud Platform so you have access to more cloud services at your fingertips. Now, I'm going to pass it over to Derek, our head of engineering, to talk more about how Firebase can help you run your app more effectively.
Thanks, Francis. Firebase is your partner through every stage of the app lifecycle, from building an app to running it and turning it into a successful business. As your technology partner, we want our products to fit with the way you work and help you be more efficient. With products like Crashlytics and Test Lab and performance monitoring, it's easy to improve your app's quality and deliver a great experience. When you really want to understand your users, Google Analytics and predict predictions can shed some light. And we also offer products like remote config, cloud messaging, and in-app messaging to keep people engaged. Our primary goals are to simplify the complex tasks that you face every day and to surface insights when you need to make decisions. This enables you to focus on doing what you love. And one of the things developers love to do is build features. We can spend endless hours sitting at our computers coding up happy features that all of our users will enjoy. But where there's code, there are bugs. We all know that the best time to identify and fix bugs is before your app is in the hands of users. Nobody wants to learn about problems in their app from app reviews, because bad reviews and bad ratings can have a lasting negative impact on your business. That's why it's so important to get real user feedback and test your app for stability and usability issues before releasing it broadly. But user testing can be a clunky process. You have to recruit testers, give them access to your app, find a way to distribute pre-release builds to them, collect their feedback, and then do it all over again when you have something new to test. So we asked ourselves, is this really how we want to spend our time? No, it's not. And now we don't have to. Say hello to Firebase App Distribution. Firebase App Distribution makes it really easy to distribute pre-release versions of your apps to a group of testers. It provides a central hub where you can manage all of your pre-release builds for both iOS and Android. You can send distributions from the console, or you can use the command line tools that are already part of your workflow. We're launching app distribution with CLI support for Gradle, the Firebase CLI, and Fastlane. To walk you through this, I'd like to welcome Alex. Thank you, Derek. We build app distribution to give you a fast, flexible way to get your pre-release apps onto your testers' devices. There's no SDK to install, forms to fill out, or review process to go through. So I've been working on a highly requested new restaurant filter feature for the Friendly Eats iOS app. To get early feedback, I'll use app distribution to send out a build of my feature branch to testers at the company. This is the distributions page, where I can see any previous distributions and upload new IPAs and APKs. To get started, I'll quickly upload an IPA of Friendly Eats. Once uploaded, there are two steps we need to do to configure a distribution. The first step is adding testers. We'll get this a second to upload, and then we'll start adding testers. Awesome. Now, I can add individual testers or groups of testers that I've previously defined. Our iOS QA team will definitely want access, so I'll make sure that they're included. I'll also add an internal test group. And there's one particular developer who's been asking for early access, so I'll make sure they're in there as well. To give me confidence in knowing who will actually be invited, I can expand a group to see all of the individual testers. The second step is to add release notes. Release notes ensure that my testers know exactly which new features are in this build and what I'm looking to get input on. So I'll let them know new restaurant filter. Check it out. 
And now we're ready to send out this build. After I press distribute, it will automatically be sent to these five testers. They'll receive an email with instructions on how to get started with testing on their device. The distribution card gives me the status of each tester. So I can tell who, ex who exactly is trying out the app. This gives me the confidence to know if a feature is ready to promote to a production release or maybe to a larger beta pool of testers. I've also had a few other people at Friendly ne Eats who have been interested in getting access. I could manually add their email addresses, but what would be awesome is if they could add themselves to get access to the test app on their own. With this, we have Firebase app distribution invite links. I'll create a new invite link, which will allow me to generate a unique URL where testers can go and sign up for access. So let's make a new invite link for Friendly Eats. I'll configure it so that anyone who signs up will automatically be added to that internal test group. And optionally, I can add a domain restriction if I want to make sure that people outside of the company won't be able to sign up for access. And it's created. So now the link is ready to copy and share with folks at Friendly Eats, including Derek, who I know has been interested in testing out an early version. Excellent. Looks like Alex has a new version of the app for me to test out. I've been wanting to check out the new filter feature he's building. So I can click on the invite link, and it'll take me to a sign up page where I can submit my email address to become a tester. In my inbox, I get an email showing me how to get started. I'll go ahead and sign and accept the invitation. Oh, it looks like this is the version that has the new restaurant filter feature, which is just the one I've been wanting to test. I'll download it and open it up. We'll give it a second here to download. There it goes. Finally, I can use that filter feature. So I'll go pick it here. And then, oh, it crashed. Alex, the filter just crashed on me. What's going on? Yes. Seriously? Oh, I thought I fixed that uh, before the summit. Uh-oh. <laughs> All right. Let's hop back over into Firebase, and we'll go into Crashlytics to see that crash appear on our dashboard. So I'm going to load this back up. Oh, yeah, there it is. Let's see what's going on here. Yep, so digging into this crash, it looks like you're running iOS 13. I've actually been doing most of my development on an older device that's still on iOS 12. So I think I have a fix, and I've got a new build that's ready to send out. I want to make sure that I can get it out to my testers and Derek as quickly as possible. I could use the Firebase console again, but I really want to work on automating our distribution process. Our team already uses Fastlane to sign and build our app, and I want to expand our Fastlane configuration to include app distribution. In my Fast file, I've added a new block for Firebase app distribution where I can define the Firebase app ID and groups and release notes. So I want to make sure that this goes out to that internal test group. And I'll let our testers know that this is the fix for iOS 13 crash. Now, to send this out, it's as easy as executing that lane. My testers will automatically get another email letting them know that there's a new distribution to try out, and they can install it right away on their device. Hey, Derek, there uh, should be a crash-free version coming your way now. I can't wait. All I need to do now is download the latest build, and I'm sure this one will finally fix that filter crash. As you can see, 
app distribution gives me everything I need in one console to manage all of my iOS and Android pre-release testing. Back to you, Derek. Thanks, Alex. As app developers ourselves, we know firsthand how crucial it is to get early feedback. We're confident that Firebase app distribution will make this a breeze and take the pain out of distributing pre-release builds. If you're a Fabric developer, you may have noticed that app distribution looks awfully familiar. And it is. It's the next evolution of Crashlytics beta. Now you have everything you need to move to Firebase. As a reminder, we'll be sunsetting Fabric on March 31st, 2020. So if you're a Fabric developer, we encourage you to migrate. We've made the transition as smooth as possible. When you land in Firebase, you'll see a summary of the data that was migrated. And we give you a checklist of tasks that will help you get ramped up on Firebase. As part of the transition, one of the things we definitely recommend you do is to configure analytics. From the very beginning, Firebase has offered a deep integration with Google Analytics that gives you free and unlimited app analytics. Whether you have 100 users or 100 million users, Google Analytics can show you who your users are, what they're doing inside your app, and even why they churn. Google Analytics transforms a mountain of data into insights. We've simplified the process of understanding your users so you can take actions to keep them happy. We're continuing to strengthen our integration with Google Analytics based on your feedback. Many of you have been asking to connect your app data across platforms, because your users often interact with your business through multiple touch points. And many, many, many of you have been asking to get the same rich data and insights Google Analytics, Google Analytics provides for mobile apps for your web apps, too. And you know what? Now that I think about it, that's actually a pretty good idea. So let's do it then. Starting today, Google Analytics and Firebase supports web apps. Now Google Analytics gives you the features you've loved for native apps, like the ability to segment your audiences, build reports to track retention, and understand what actions people are taking. All of these powerful tools are available for web apps, too. Oh, and while we were at it, we added cross-platform support as well, so you can get a complete view of your users' journeys as they move between devices. And now with Google Analytics available with web apps, we just thought we might as well go ahead and add web support for cloud messaging and remote config, too, so you can take action to deliver relevant and engaging experiences. To show you what all this looks like, I'm going to hand it over to Mai. Hi, everybody. I'm Mai Lo, and I'm a product manager in Firebase working for Firebase for Web. So here we are back in Friendly Eats in the analytics dashboard. We should be in the analytics dashboard. <laughs> Could we switch the screen? Awesome. Sweet. All right. So here we are, back in Friendly Eats, in the analytics section of the console. And the entire analytics product works seamlessly for web. But I'm going to focus on three features to highlight for you today. The first is cross-platform analytics. The second is event reporting. And the third is audiences. So once you see that dashboard again, I can show you it live. <laughs> All right. Here we are in the dashboard. And by default, you will see your data across your entire business. And that means all of the platforms that you build on. By setting user ID in the SDK, you will now have all of the reports deduplicated across devices and platform. But you can always drill in deeper. Since web is entirely new to the mix, let's select web. We're going to apply the filter. And they just make it black for like an extra ta-da, you know? <laughs> 
now you see all the web data for friendly eats. <laughs> all right. Now I've covered cross-platform analytics. Let's look about. Let's talk about events. All right. So I'm going to first look at an event that I know is near and dear to any web developer: page view. And this is one of our new automatically collected events specific to web and Firebase. And while this is an awesome and super important metric, I hope at the end of this demo, you will see that Google Analytics takes web analytics way beyond this. So let's select an event that spans multiple platforms, say, Start Review. And here you see I have access to the same filters I applied earlier in the dashboard. And that means by default, you're going to see event count and the user count who triggered that event across your native and web apps. And you can, again, look at just web if you apply the filter. All right, cross-platform analytics, event reporting. Let's talk about audiences, which in my opinion is one of the most exciting features. So audiences can now evaluate users on web and can even evaluate users cross-platform. And if you need a refresher, Audiences are a way for you to group your users along attributes that are meaningful for your business. So for example, users who made a purchase or users who passed a certain level in your game. And just like on native, audiences for web go beyond insight and reports because they're at the heart of targeting in other Firebase products like cloud messaging and remote config. And yes, both of those now also work for web. So let's set up a quick audience. And I'm going to use that audience to show you how cloud messaging and remote config work for my Friendly Eats web app. So in Friendly Eats, power users are considered users who have submitted more than five reviews in any given 30-day period. So I'm going to set up an audience that captures that particular group. We're going to create a new audience. And it's going to be a custom one. And we're going to select the event to be Submit Review. I'm going to add a parameter, event count, and set that to greater than five. And I'm going to check the in any day period box and set that number to 30. I'm going to add another condition and restrict my browser to Chrome. And you'll see why in just a moment. But I want to point out that this is a brand new dimension available in the audience builder that's specific to web. All right, and that's pretty much it. This audience can now be applied as a filter across the entire analytics console, so you can drill deeper into this particular user segment. I actually created this audience earlier already, so I'm not going to save it. I'm going to click out of this window. And let's move on to targeting, because targeting is analytics in action, and plus, I think you're going to love it. So I've been wanting to send my power users in friendly eats a little message thanking them for being so engaged. I'm hoping that will make them feel good and write lots more reviews. I actually sent one earlier already, but then I found out my app was going through some issues in Chrome. So now I want to send another one, but just to the Chrome users, since they missed the message the first time around. And now you know why I limited my audience earlier to just Chrome. So cloud messaging is how Firebase sends targeted notifications to users. I'm going to create a new notification. And I'm going to title it, Your Friendly Eats Rockstar. And in the body of the text, I'm going to say, thank you for writing helpful reviews. Now we're going to get to targeting. And here you see I not only have access to my native apps, there are also web apps in there. So I'm going to choose my Friendly Eats web app. And the user audience that I just created, Power Users in Chrome. And then by default, this message is going to go live immediately. But I could also schedule it to go today, tomorrow, next week. And I could even do a recurring one. It's a pretty handy feature in cloud messaging. So I'm going to review. And before I publish, I'm going to switch to two screens where Firefox is on the left and Chrome is on the right. Ideally, the message should show up on the right, just for Chrome, because these are my power users in Chrome. So let's publish. 
and go to my two windows. And there it is. Thank you for writing helpful reviews. All right, let's say that's not all I want to do for these awesome users in Friendly Eats. Let's say I want to give them a temporary dark mode in the UI, because everybody prefers dark mode, right? So for this, I'm going to use remote config, because remote config allows me to configure different kinds of experiences for different groups of users. So I've created a condition in advance that targets the audience that we created, power users in Chrome. And I'm going to go to the parameters, and I'm going to set my dark parameter value to true for this condition. I'm going to update, publish my changes. All right. So let's go back. I'm going to refresh Firefox first, and nothing should happen, and nothing did. Now let's refresh Chrome, and there you go. Gorgeous. There's that lovely dark mode that I know my power users are going to love. Back to you, Derek. Thanks, Mai. <laughs> Data is at the heart of every good business decision. Google Analytics turns insights turns data into insights so you can understand what actions your users have already taken inside your app and why. But did you know that Firebase can also show you what actions your users are going to take in the future? That's where predictions can help. With predictions, you can apply the power of machine learning to your app analytics to segment your users based on their predicted future behaviors. We've been working hard to make predictions easier to use and we've made some recent improvements to give you more information and more control. To show you how to harness the power of predictions, I'm going to turn it back to Mai. Thanks, Derek. All right, so in Friendly Eats, I have two main revenue streams. I use AdMob to show ads inside my app, and I also partner with restaurants to sell discounted coupons to my users. These coupon purchases are really valuable to me, but I know that only a small fraction of my users is actually going to make that. If I could only knew who those users were, I could optimize the app for them. I could say, limit the number of ads that this group sees to keep them in the core flow of the app as much as possible, and hopefully buy more coupons. Well, lucky for me, Firebase Predictions does exactly that. So here we are in the Predictions console. And I'm going to click on the predicted spend audience. I'm going to expand my graph of active users. And you see they're sorted from left to right in how likely they are to make that purchase. The probability of them making the purchase is on my y-axis. I can use these blue sliders to select the segment. And as I'm moving the blue sliders, you see the bars and the data change on the right to give me more information about the users that I'm selecting. All right, I'm ready to configure the in-app experience for this group of users. I'm going to choose remote config. And then I'm going to select a parameter called limited ads. And this is going to reduce the frequency of the ads that this group of users sees. To make it extra easy, all the targeting information is pre-filled. And here you see that I'm targeting the top 2% of my predicted spenders. All right, let's continue. And once I publish, I know that my highest value users are getting the tailored experience they want. Back to you, Derek. Thank you. OK, so we just saw demos of our new improvements in app distribution, Google Analytics, and predictions. The underlying goal of all of these updates is to help you run your app more effectively with analytics insights and workflows to improve app quality and increase user engagement. With Firebase, we want to free you from the tedious tasks of app development so you can focus on building amazing user experiences. Now, in addition to expanding our own built-in platform, we're working to make Firebase more extensible to support your sophisticated needs by giving you more control, flexibility, and transparency. To talk more about that, I'm going to turn it back to Francis.
Thank you, Derek. So in addition to helping you build and run your app smoothly, we also recognize that you need to do this at scale. Now, as your development team and user base grow, so do the complexity of your challenges. And that's why we're making Firebase more extensible so that you can tailor our products to better meet your needs. Now, one of the ways we do this is by open sourcing our SDKs. So you can peek under the hood, make sure that our SDKs meet your requirements, or even submit your own improvements if you want. Because we believe that in order to create remarkable software, we need to get a lot of great minds involved. And the power of open source is the power of our community. And thanks to you, we now have community-supported Mac OS and tvOS support and have expanded our admin SDKs across server environments, which are huge wins. And since our last update at Google I.O., we've open sourced four additional iOS libraries and four additional Android libraries, including A-B testing and remote config. Oh, and remember, the web SDK that, uh, for analytics and remote config that Maya just demoed, we've open sourced them already as well. Now, I want to take a moment to highlight the work of Infertase, a company that's created a comprehensive React Native library for Firebase. They've recently released the new React Native for Firebase v6 SDKs with quick start guides and support for every Firebase service. It's amazing to see this community library has more than 5,000 stars on GitHub. And we continue to invest time and energy into open source because we want to earn your trust by working with you to build a transparent and flexible platform. So in addition to making our platform more open, we've also taken strides to meet your sophisticated needs to manage and control access to your Firebase projects. Last year, we brought GCP's identity and access management systems to Firebase in beta. And this system lets you set granular, custom, and predefined roles to limit access to your project. And today, I'm proud to announce that we're graduating the system out of beta into general availability. And as a bonus, we've also added per-product roles to give you even finer grain control for each Firebase product. So with this, you can configure who has access to what so you can prevent mistakes and protect your data. So for example, you can enable a team member to just view your analytics report but not mess with your back end. Or you can restrict to permissions to just what's needed so that nobody accidentally sends a notification to all your users. All right, so we've talked about open sourcing more SDKs and refined access controls to your project. All of these are parts of our efforts to make Firebase more extensible. But wait, there is more. We have one more big announcement, and not to be too dramatic, but it signals the beginning of a new extensibility frontier for Firebase. Wondering what it is? Well, have you ever found yourself doing repetitive app development tasks, like, say, resizing an image in cloud storage, wishing that you had a tool to make things even go, fast, go even faster? Or are you tired of being asked to do the same things over and over again, like manually add users to a MailChimp email list? Now, a lot of Firebase developers run into roadblocks like these, no matter where they are in their career. Yet, there are no good solutions to get around them. You yourself may have recently encountered a problem that seems common, but lacks a quick solution and wondered, there's got to be a better way. Well, now there is. We want to give you a better way to tackle everyday problems and make it easy to add functionality to your app so you don't have to reinvent the wheel each time. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce Firebase Extensions. Firebase extensions are pre-packaged bundles of code designed to save you time by automating common tasks in your project. They're configurable, open sourced, and work with Firebase and GCP products. So whether you want to resize an image, add people to an email list, or shorten URLs, we've built an array of solutions that you can plug into your project and get going. There's no need to research, write, or debug code. It's all done for you. But you still have the flexibility to configure and customize the extensions to your specific use cases. So to show you extensions and how you can start using them, 
I'd like to pass it over to Osa and my team to demo it to us. Hi, I'm Osa Omokaro, the user experience researcher working on Firebase extensions. If Firebase were a restaurant, extensions would be tapas, quick and easy bundles of solutions for common use cases in app development. As an example, I want to expand my business globally, so I need to translate the descriptions of my app to multiple languages. I'm going to do this using a Firebase extension. So we'll start off here on the extensions discovery page. Here we have a range of extensions for common use cases, but I'm going to select the translate text extension. This then brings me to the extensions install page. We'll start by reviewing the APIs. This extension uses the cloud translation API and invokes it using a cloud function. Now, normally, I would need to do this manually. I would need to write my own cloud functions, research translation APIs, and put that all together myself. But now, Firebase Extensions takes all those separate pieces and ties them together for me in one simple step. I don't have to write a single line of code. Firebase Extensions are free. I will only be charged for the underlying cloud services like the translation API we talked about earlier. I've already enabled billing for this project. Next, I'm going to review the access granted to this extension. I've taken a look at everything here, and it all looks good to me, so I'm going to click Next to get to the last step. Extensions are configurable. This is where I will set up this extension to fit my specific use case. So I'm going to set my deployment location, and then I'll review my target languages. By default, they are set to English, Spanish, German, and French, but I'm going to add Italian just because it's really easy to do that. Next, I'll give it the path to my Firestore collections where my strings are stored. And then I'll add the field that I want it to translate on. And that's really all there is to it. I'm ready to install this extension. Now, Firebase extensions take just a few minutes to install. But so that I don't overextend your time, I'm going to show you one that I already installed previously. Here's what it looks like. But let's go straight to the database so that we can see this in action. So here's my database. My collection is restaurants. I'm going to add a new document. I'll give it an auto ID. The field is descriptions. And the value will be great for groups. Now, when I hit Save, this is going to translate based on the configurations that we entered in the install flow. So are we ready? I've been waiting to show you that for a really, really long time. Extensions are really cool. And as a researcher, I've worked with a lot of developers just like you to make sure that Firebase got this right. Extensions are easy to install. They are configurable. And they enable you to accomplish a whole lot more for your app with just zero lines of code. Thank you. Back to you, Francis. Thank you, Osa. So Osa just showed you some extensions that were pretty cool, right? And today, we're launching with nine Firebase extensions into beta. To see the full list, just head over to our website. These ready-to-go mini solutions will help you add new functionalities to your app, automate repetitive tasks, and use Firebase product more efficiently. 
Extensions mark the beginning of an exciting new phase for Firebase to help you accelerate your app development, run your app more effectively, and provide more flexibility to support your sophisticated needs. So we just spent the last hour talking a lot about the new work we've done to make Firebase better. As you just saw, we've been focused on three things. First, giving you the building blocks to help you accelerate your app development so you can solve many of the common and core problems in developing an app. Second, helping you run your app more effectively by simplifying your workflows and servicing insights when you need it to help you increase your app quality and user engagement. And third, making Firebase more extensible to support your sophisticated needs by giving you more control, flexibility, and transparency. With every improvement to Firebase, we aim to make app development easier so that you can stay focused on building amazing user experiences. Our mission is to help developers like you succeed. Whether success to you is getting an app off the ground or scaling it into a global business, you can rely on Firebase. Now, as you go out through the, throughout the day, I hope you feel energized and empowered to bring your ideas and passion to life. After all, you are all the architects of the future. We've got lots of technical talks, cool demos, and delicious food ahead. And rumor has it, there may even be chocolate and churros. <laughs> all right, folks, thank you so much for being here. Enjoy the rest of today. Already, which is totally fine, by the way. Um, <laughs> did we? Did we overpromise or did they really deliver? I think we had some good updates, right? OK. The slides are still showing. It's very interesting. Hey, I get that people are ready to get on a break, right? It makes total sense. But I skipped sort of some of the housekeeping things before so that we can do them now. And I'm really bad at remembering things. So what we're going to have during the day is that we'll have some other Firebase friends coming up on the stage to sort of tell you what's going on, to serve as your master of ceremony. And I'm actually really happy to welcome the first one on stage right now, because she's my co-host for the event and the co-organizer for the entire Firebase Summit, Jessica. Rocco. Oh, Thanks, we've Bob. been waiting <laughs> so long for that one. <laughs> hey, everyone. So, Jessica, when people go out for their break, what, what are they in for? What can they do here? There's so much to do, but I have a very important thing I need to start with, restrooms. In case you're not sure where they are, they are to your right, right near the food and beverage. And then if those, that line is too long or you don't want to wait, you can actually go outside the venue and make a left. I love how we're doing the airline thing. You go outside <laughs> and turn left, remember? OK, no, that is great. And what else is there to do? So on my way over, I saw all of the code lab instructors setting up, and we have four new code labs to show case for you today, all part powered by Google.dev. So if you're interested in getting more hands-on with Firebase, grab your laptops and bring them over. Yeah, and it's really exciting because you're going to be sitting at a table with a Firebase, right? And you're all going to be doing the code lab together. I also think we have asked Firebase outside of here. And I saw some of the keynote speakers already heading out there to answer your questions about all the launches. So it's fairly simple today, right? If you, somebody with the, if you see somebody wearing a yellow shirt, you can ask them any Firebase question. And they can either answer it or help you find the person that knows the answer for that. And we're also going to have Firebasers at all of our demos. We have a ton of demos for you today, including some brand new games and, of course, everyone's favorite app ship. Yes. Have we played yet? We have not played yet. So we're totally going to try and get our turn because it might be busy. We'll see about that. OK, so I think we actually have a lot to do. And then, of course, we're going to be reconvening at this stage at 11.30. Right, so we have a short break now. Grab coffee. We I have need snacks. <laughs> yeah, grab some snacks. I don't think I have seen the churros yet that Francis promised, but we'll see. And uh, then we'll see you back here at one of the other activities at 11.30. Does that sound good? Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.
India has been mostly a one TV country, like one TV per household. But data has become so cheap here. So this made your phone your next TV. And that is how this, this market is like now skyrocketing. <laughs> Hotstar was launched three years back. And in the last three years, we have seen our MAU grow to more than 150 million users. Hotstar's mission is TV 2.0, so that you view your content as well as you express your opinions or like make it a social experience on the same platform. It becomes a bi-directional entertainment source. We have an ambitious mission, but our engineering team is only a fraction of the size of most of our competitors. But we are still keeping up and we are doing it with the help of 5S. For example, before the start of 2018 IPL, we decided to completely rebuild our app. IPL is the biggest sporting event in India. We were expecting a huge surge of users. We wanted to use this opportunity to launch uh, new features. Using Firebase Remote Config, we slowly rolled out the feature to a small percentage of users. Our engineering team was monitoring the crashes in Firebase Crashlytics. We noticed that a feature was causing some crashes on few low-end Android devices. We used Google Analytics for Firebase to segment our users on low-end devices. And then we turned off the feature for them using conditional targeting in Remote Config. This way, we saved our users, our millions of users from buggy experience. Amazingly, we were able to do all of this without releasing a new bill. With Firebase, we can make decisions by deeply understanding and analyzing our data. And BigQuery is another crucial resource to achieve this. We export Firebase event logs to BigQuery to uncover insights and patterns about our app. For example, we log app startup time from launch to load of the first screen. Then we ran queries to understand where the most time is spent and optimized accordingly to reduce lags. 2018 was like a dream year for us. We broke many records and the best being 10.3 million concurrent users coming onto your platform at one go. With the help of Firebase, we were able to seize this opportunity to run experiments and do controlled feature rollouts. We increased daily watch time by 38%. Technologies like Firebase and BigQuery are helping us to scale so much that Hotstar is quickly becoming the primary viewing screen for many Indians, not the catch-up destination.
Well, hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the summit so far. My name is Doug Stevenson. I'm a developer advocate with the Firebase team. Uh, there are a couple things I'd like you to know about the summit today. The first thing is lunch. Everyone has to eat, right? Um, the lunch is going to be served between 12.30 and 2.30 in the space right over there. Uh, so don't miss that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to draw your attention to are the games we have here. There are a couple of games that you can play. Uh, one is AppShip, and we have a brand new game called Golf Golf. Now, there's a couple of things you should know about these games. These are multiplayer games, so go together and play them together. If you're here by yourself, go make a new friend and play the games with uh, your new friend. Um, my favorite new announcement at the summit today is Firebase Analytics for the web. This is uh, something I know you've all been waiting for. I've been waiting for it. Uh, and it's not just analytics, it's also remote config and targeted notifications. This is really exciting to me. Um, so I would love to introduce to the stage Mai Lo and Kevin Lamb. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi again. <laughs> All right. So we know building successful apps is hard. And replicating that success is even harder. All of you all are building this huge array of different kinds of apps. And you are all in different parts of those apps' life cycles. So some of you may be just pushing app to production. And you want to monitor its reliability and performance. And some of you may be really focused on user adoption, because you want to get your app into the hands of as many users as possible. Some of you may be even focused on monetizing your app, because you want to start earning some revenue. Firebase is here to help you with all of those things. We want to be here for you no matter where you are in the process. By helping you solve infrastructure problems like secure sign-in or saving data to the cloud, to giving you app analytics so that you know how your app is performing, or if your customers are running into any troubles, and even to creating personalized experiences that delight your users and keep them coming back for more. At least that's been the case for Native on Android and iOS. But we know many of you, maybe all of you here, are building for the web. And we haven't given the full Firebase experience to web developers yet. This year at I.O., we started to close the gap by launching performance monitoring for web. But among the missing pieces was a pretty big one, which was Google Analytics. So you had no insight into your user base, how they were engaging with your content, and so then you couldn't even take any action in Firebase because you didn't know what that would be. But today, we're so excited to announce that analytics, cloud messaging, and remote config are available to use on web. And we're so excited to be here today to talk to you about it. Before we dive in, I'm Milo, and I'm a product manager for Firebase. I work on Firebase for web. And I'm Kevin Lamb, and I'm a product manager for Google Analytics. So here's what we're going to cover today. First, we're going to give you a quick walkthrough of analytics in the Firebase console so that you can see everything that's now been extended for your web app. Then we'll take a look at how analytics powers both Firebase cloud messaging and remote config, and explore the different ways that you can leverage these powerful tools for your very own web app. And last but not least, we're going to put it all together with a live demo so that you can see these features in action. Now let's dive in. As app developers, you know that analytics is key to understanding your business. And it can often give you a leg up on the competition. But getting analytics right is a challenge in and of itself. How do you measure the things that matter? And even if you were able to measure them, what do you do with that information? Now, what you need are powerful analysis tools that are both easy to use and immediately actionable. And that's where we come in. Google Analytics for Firebase was built from the beginning to help you measure what matters most to your business. 
and it stems from our belief in data-driven decision-making and our desire to be your partner in crime as you pour your heart and soul into building your apps and growing your business. And it's to that end that our product has always offered free and unlimited event reporting for up to 500 custom events, no matter how large your app grows. And the best part of all is that it all works out of the box with no fancy code required. Now, without further ado, Mai's going to walk you through what that looks like. So to show you what's really available for analytics and web, I'm going to give you a quick tour of the analytics console, just the major parts that we're pretty, pretty excited about. So this is the dashboard, and this is where you get a bird's eye view of all the metrics that are important to your business. So things like user adoption, engagement trends, revenue metrics if you have them, stability metrics, et cetera. And as I showed in the keynote earlier, here you can have access here you see the filter for the first time, which allows you to drill into a number of dimensions for any of the reports that you see. So things like time, location, and of course now platform. And we're really excited that web is now part of this mix. If you want to drive a little deeper, you go into event reporting. And you'll have this for all the automatically collected events, for the events that you log. And here you get your basic event stats, such as how often the event was triggered and how many users performed that event. And then you also have a demographic breakdown of, of the users that triggered the event. If you want to see how well you're retaining your users, you can use a retention report. And this shows you how many users are coming back to your app on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. And finally, our stream view. This gives you real-time feedback into when and where users are coming into your app and how they're engaging with the content that you created. Google Analytics has always been about more than just getting you insights. We strive to take it a step further by empowering you to take action. And that's why Google Analytics is deeply integrated with so many Firebase products. We want to help you with everything from acquiring your users to engaging with them to experimenting with different user experiences. And that's all to say that our goal is to make your life simpler so that you can focus on what matters most, building delightful moments for your users. The foundation of these integrations is a feature called audiences, which are user segments that you define along attributes that are meaningful for your business. Audiences are an incredibly powerful and popular feature because they not only provide rich insights, they also power action. And that's why we're delighted to let you know that audiences also now work for your web apps. This means that you now have the ability to segment your web users the same way you've always been able to on native apps. You can also apply filters on your reports and dashboards using the audiences you create so that you can drill even deeper into the user journeys of specific segments. As an example, you can now carve out your super users, say those who've spent more than $100 in the last month or users who've made more than 20 bookings in the last year. I can even now isolate the users who experienced a crash on one of the browsers that I support. Now, setting up these audiences is now even easier than ever with a new audience builder that we announced at I.O. this year. While we keep saying that audiences power your action, you may be wondering what kinds of actions. Well, if you're an e-commerce business, how about sending a targeted notification to your most engaged users, thanking them for being loyal customers and offering them a discount on their next purchase? Or say you're a sports app. How about offering regional experiences by highlighting games that are occurring in your users' home countries? We're excited to let you know that you can now do any and all of the above with your Firebase web apps using Firebase cloud messaging and remote config. And Mai's going to tell you more. All right, let's start with Firebase cloud messaging, or what the cool kids call SCM for web. 
Some of you may be wondering right now, I thought FCM already worked for web. Is there actually anything new there? Is it new? Well, what's new is that FCM for web is now powered by Google Analytics. And what this means is that you can send targeted notifications based on new signals that are specific to web, such as browser or OS. What's more, you can send messages to web-based audiences and user properties. So just like on native, this lets you send personalized notifications, which are going to have a much higher likelihood of drawing users back into your app or performing the call to action you put out. So for example, I can create an audience of users who haven't come to my app in the last seven days, inviting them to come back. Or I could present a subset of them with a coupon, because I know they have a higher lifetime value and therefore a greater tendency to make a purchase. What's best is you can create all of this easily in the FCM console. You can also track the success of your notification using the cloud messaging funnel report, just as you have been all this time for native. And this lets you see whether the notification you sent actually brought you the user engagement you were hoping for, and all this in the FCM console. Another way to personalize the experience on web is with remote config. So remote config allows you to have different configurations of your app for different segments of your users. It can be basic, like browser or OS, and it could also be something more complex, like an audience or user property. Say, for example, you want to delight your most engaged users uh, and reward them, maybe with a badge. You can do that by changing your app's background and have a celebratory note there, or maybe a premium offering. It's so easy because you can leverage the power of Google Analytics dynamic audiences. You pick an audience I created earlier from the remote config interface, and that's it. You're done. We just presented a lot of concepts and features. To make this more concrete, let's take a look at a real example that puts everything in a perspective. Meet Friendly Eats, an app that we developed on Android and web. We just covered this in the keynote, but as a quick refresher, Friendly Eats is a simple restaurant rating and reviewing app that allows users to perform three basic tasks. Users have the ability to filter for certain types of restaurants based on category, location, or a certain price point. Users can then provide star ratings based on their own dining experiences, and ultimately write reviews so that other readers can benefit from a collective knowledge of the entire app's user base. Like similar apps, Friendly Eats relies on the community of users who provide those ratings and reviews. And naturally, I'm going to want to grow that community and foster their engagement. So things like confusing or clunky user experiences that prevent my users from, com from completing these core actions, like writing a review and completing them, are really going to hurt my business over time. Now, in contrast, if I want to grow my business, I need simple yet powerful tools that do a few things. I need to be able to monitor how my users are growing over time. I also need it to show me whether or not the techniques that I'm applying are working. And last but not least, I need the ability to take real action based on the insights that I'm gleaning. Now let's look at all of this live so you can get a real feel for what this looks like in the product. Please switch to the demo. All right, woohoo, that worked. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so as Kevin said, the core of Friendly Eats are users writing and submitting reviews. So let's think about what some options are that we can do here. So a quick and easy thing you can do is send a notification to all users who started writing a review, but they didn't finish. I could send a simple message saying, come back, finish that review. So to do that, I first need to create a segment that groups those target users together. I know I have an event that I log when somebody starts writing a review called Start Review. And then I have another event that I log when someone hits the Cancel button called Cancel Review. So basically, I'm going to target the group of users that logs the Start Review event and then afterwards logs the Cancel Review event. So let's go to Audience and set this up. 
And I'm going to create a new audience. It's going to be a custom one. And first, I want to make sure the user even looked at a restaurant. So we're going to say open restaurant listing. And then I'm going to add a sequence condition. And the first step in that sequence is starting a review. And then I'm going to add a step, and I want it to directly follow the start review event. And it's going to be the cancel review event. All right. Here on the right, you see a rough estimate of how many users will be included in this audience. And it's just based on your last 30 days worth of data. So you get a sense of if I were to do something with this audience, how many users would it, would it uh, target? So again, I created this audience earlier. So I'm not going to save it. I'm going to click out. And now I have my audience set up. I'm going to go to Cloud Messaging to set up my notification. So I'm going to create a new campaign. And I'm going to title it, Come Back. And I'm going to body of the text. I'm going to say, please finish writing that review. So now we're going to go to targeting. And native and web are now available for targeting. So I'm going to click the Friendly Eats web app first and the audience that I just created called Canceled Reviewers. And then, because I'm also on Android, I want to target both. So I'm going to go add another app, pick my Android app, and select the same audience, Canceled Reviewers. And then we get to scheduling. So again, scheduling is live immediately by default. But you can always schedule to be on a, on a different date, use the calendar feature. You can have it be recurring. It's pretty handy. And you could even add a conversion event here so that you can take advantage of the funnel report that notifications has in the console. I won't do that for now. So I'm going to review, and I'm going to publish. And I should get a notification. Should get a notification. Well, it would show up right here if Wi Fi was on my side. <laughs> so, let's say that's not all I want to do. So, let's take it a step further. I want to show a dialog box when somebody enters my app. And I want to say to them, Welcome back. Can you finish that review? So, I just want to give them another little notch. So I'm going to use remote config for that. And here I am in remote config. And I set up a condition in advance. It's a dialog for unfinished reviewers. And it targets the canceled reviewers that I set up earlier. So I'm going to go to parameters. And I'm going to set this parameter equal to true for this condition. I'm going to update and publish the changes. And then let's reload this instance. And there it is. Welcome back. We would love it if you could finish the review. All right. I got my notification sent. I got my dialog box up. Now I want to make sure I continue to monitor how my users are moving through the path to the event that's important to me, so submitting a review in friendly apps. And lucky for me, Google Analytics built a bunch of new features that make that really easy. You can access these features by upgrading to the full Google Analytics experience. And some of you who are current Firebase developers may have noticed a little prompt in the UI over the past few weeks that's telling you to do this upgrade. Once you upgrade, you have access to a slew of incredibly powerful and new analysis tools that I'm pretty excited to share with you. They're all just a click of a button away in the Google Analytics UI. So you go straight in here. And while all of these features are really awesome, there's one that I'm just so excited about. And I think you're going to be too. So we're going to go to Analysis, go to Analysis Hub. And yes, the feature is closed funnels. 
So for those who don't know funnels, and are wondering why I'm so excited about it, <laughs> closed funnels are a sequence of events or steps that you expect a user to move through before they do the event that's important to you, which is usually a conversion event. So this report is incredibly helpful to you so you can monitor how users are moving through the path, where they're dropping off, and you can adjust your app accordingly. So you know this is what people are doing before they do this important con conversion, and this is what they're not doing, and that's why they're not doing it. So and I'm going to start setting one up so you can get kind of a feel for the product. So you basically just go into the editing of steps, and then you can name your first step open app, for example, in Friendly Eats. And for us, it's going to be the session start event. You can add another step that says view restaurant. And that event is going to be the open restaurant listing. And I won't be keeping repeating this, but basically you want to do this for every step that's logical for your particular app in the funnel. So I created it earlier, as you saw. And we have open app, view restaurant, start review, and submit review. All right, so another feature that's incredibly powerful that I'm pretty excited to show you is called segment comparison. Let's take these out so I can show you live. And basically what segment comparison is exactly how it sounds. You get to compare two segments side by side. And now because we have platform analytics, you can compare platforms side by side. It's incredibly easy. You can see in the UI the segments here on the left. And you just drag them here into the segment comparisons. And then they update. And there you go. You have two funnels side by side. So you can monitor how users are moving through the path and how it's different for web and Android. All right. I've shown you a lot of stuff. I showed you how to navigate through analytics for web. I showed you how to set up a notification campaign in FCM to target an audience that we built together. I showed you how to use remote config so you can configure a different kind of app experience for any kind of user segment that you want. And then I showed you how to get some advanced analysis so that you can really analyze your strategy from beginning to end. Ultimately, this is going to help get users back into my Friendly Eats app. It's going to help me grow my business. And ultimately, it's going to help all the end users find restaurants that they delight in and have awesome moments there. Back to the slides, please. As Mai mentioned, we covered a lot in this session. But we've really only scratched the surface because there's still so much more for you to explore in Google Analytics using our powerful analysis techniques, including building segment overlaps and exploring user journeys through path analysis. Now, we won't go into detail on those, but we'll let you explore them on your own, or you can come to the Ask Firebase and learn more. With everything we've shown you today, you may be wondering, how do I get started? The great news is that it's incredibly easy. Everything we've shown you today is ready and available to you as soon as you create your next Firebase project, integrate with Google Analytics, and add a web app. Now, if you already have a Firebase project, don't worry. All you have to do, as Mai mentioned, is upgrade to the full Google Analytics experience, add a web SDK, and you're all set. To close, we want to leave you with a simple takeaway, that Firebase is here to help you build better apps and grow your business now on the web. So we want to thank all of you here in the audience and, uh, and those who are on the live stream for joining us today on this journey. We sincerely hope that we helped you get closer to delivering your web app A-game. If you have any questions or just want to chat with us, feel free to find us at the Ask Firebase Sandbox. Again, thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the summit.
Please welcome onto stage Sachin Kotwani and Ibrahim Ulukaya. Hola, buenas. Hoy vamos a presentar una, una presentación de cómo introducir inteligencia artificial en vuestras aplicaciones móviles. Espero que os guste. Just kidding. This topic can be complex enough to talk about it uh, in English, so I won't attempt to do it in Spanish. Apologies to our Spanish speakers in the audience. Hi, everyone. My name is Sachin. I'm a product manager on the Firebase team, and I work on MLKit. And here is my colleague, Ibrahim. And today, we are going to show you how you can introduce machine learning into your applications to make them more powerful and create great experiences for your users. But before we do that, Ibrahim, why don't you tell us what machine learning is? Como? Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> I thought for a second session, decided to go off the script in Spanish. And my Spanish is not as good as him. So I'm Ibrahim Mulukaya from the Firebase team. And today, we'll talk about what machine learning is and how MLKit makes it easy for you to implement in your app. And we'll go through a few real life e examples. Should we get started? Let's roll. So what is machine learning? By definition, machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So what do we mean by that? Traditionally, software development is implementing rules. Let's say we have this app, and we are detecting activities. So we have the speed sensor data. We can say if the speed is below a certain threshold, this is walking. And we go one step further. We do another if and else statement, and we get to running. And if we go even faster, maybe we can estimate as biking. But I just realized that Sachin put another thing on my app, on my slides. And he likes golfing. But how we get go through detecting golfing, just getting the speed is not going to be enough anymore. And in this case, we need a different type of programming. In the traditional programming, we have already rules set. So we'll get the data, and we'll get the answers. But in machine learning, we don't have the exact set of rules yet. So we'll need some of the previous answers to get the rules first. In machine learning, we will need models and training data. So we'll need some of those answers, some labels. We'll need to teach our computer how walking looks like or how biking looks like. Let's say we have like labels and we have a different set of sensors, could be a visual sensor data, and we can say this is what walking looks like. Then we start training our neural network, saying this is running looks like, this is biking, and this is how golfing looks like. So machine learning has two phases. The first phase, we have the previous answers, we created the model. Now we have the model we can go through and create predictions with the data we have. So how does it work? Let's say we have a digit recognition. For us, we can detect that this is eight. But it's a quite intensive step for our eyes and brain. And for computers, maybe we can estimate it's a traditional programming. We can say for eight, it is two loops on top of each other. But is that easy? Let's say we have this example of 28 by 28 pixel, which would give us 784 inputs. And if we use these inputs as zeros or ones or filled or empty pixels, then we can start training our neural network. And we will end up in neurons that should give us answers at the end. Here, there's one of the neural network in action we are actually converging to a model that we can finally detect different digits. Up until now, software development has been all about adding another if and else statement, and we were just using the input data to generate outputs. Here, we cannot explicitly set the rules anymore. We need to train our neural network, tell the machine, this is what this digit looks like. So how about the steps to implement machine learning? 
Historically, this was a big deal involving ML experts, lots of time, and money. A data scientist would collect a training data set. Usually, ML experts or PhD researchers have to develop the model. The expert would then train, evaluate the model, and tune as needed. Finally, once the model is ready, we have to deploy the model to our systems. The de DevOps would do that. And after all these steps, finally the developers can start predicting, can use this model to predict. This is a quite extensive stage. That's how we end up with MLKit. MLKit is Google's machine learning SDK for mobile. With using MLKit, we can simply skip all the stages I mentioned earlier, come up with just inputting the or data to our libraries, and come up with the prediction. And it can be all done by the developer. By using the base API, it's as simple as selecting the model you need. They work both in iOS and Android devices, and we will have actually cloud APIs as well as on-device APIs. If you are an advanced user, you can still use the ML kit to host your models. And it's only a few lines of code to implement. For now, currently we have vision APIs such as barcode scanning, face detection, image labeling, text recognition, object detection, all out of the box. And we have natural language APIs such as language identification, smart replies, conversational smart reply, on-device translation. And if you want to bring your own model, your custom model, we will help you serve it as well. If you're an advanced ML developer and you brought your own model, you don't need to republish your app every time you update your model. If you update your model, you want to implement a new one, you don't have to go back to store and wait for approval. You can just update your model on the fly. Today, I want to present a real life problem. Let's say we have this app. It could be a financial app or a bank app. Let's say we want to submit a valid form of ID. And we realize that often people don't submit the right type of document. And we'd like to catch that in the earlier process. Let's go from the simplest solution first. Let's say we want to recognize the text in the ID so we can come up with some solution. Say that if it's verified ID or not the right ID. We have two flavors of the text recognition API. The on-device API is completely free, while the cloud API is free up to 1,000 API calls per feature per month. While the on-device API is perfect for low latency, such as real-time applications, it does not require network, the cloud API has a higher accuracy recognition. The on-device API is good for sparse text and images. It can recognize Latin characters, while the Cloud API also works with densely spaced text, and it recognizes a broad range of languages and special characters. I would like to go for a demo. Sasha, I like the. So let's go for the valid identification. Let's see first use the real-time application. A text action, and we'll go for one of the IDs we have here. I'm using the on-device API. As we can see, I'm detecting the names, addresses, the other things in the ID. And but if we want to get like a high recurse of resolution, or we want to use it in dense text. We can also use the cloud API, such as I can detect one of the things I just found, eh? the scavenger hunt. Let's take a photo of it. And we'll use the cloud API. Here. Uh oh OK. Yeah, I got like here. So we have detection results. We have a much better detection, higher accuracy, and we were able to work in the Dance the text space. 
So this was only text recognition. What if there's like different pictures on the ID and also we want to see how an ID might look like? We also have the image labeling API. Maybe I can give it a try on that as well. So let's take the picture of the ID here. And we will use the image labeling here on device one. And I thought it was news, but I think we're not going to get that quite yet. So having said that, I want to give it to Sashin, hand over to Sashin, who will go over the more advanced solution. Which one is it? I have this one. All right, thanks, Ibrahim. OK, uh, can we switch back to slides? So like Ibrahim said, uh, what we want to do here is we want to, let's, let's think back of the problem. We want to identify what type of document we are dealing with, right? So that before a user submits it in the application, we can tell them, yes, it's a driver's license, or no, it looks like it's a business card. The image labeling API is generally good for identifying objects. Uh, it, on, on device, it identifies 400 different types of labels. In the cloud-based version of the same API, it identifies 10,000 different objects. Let's see what the, what the on device would say for something like this. Uh, it, for, for Ibrahim, it said news. When I tried it, it said paper, poster, smile, all things that are valid. But not, they're not really useful for my, uh, for my use case. So what do we need? What we need is a custom model for our application, for our use case, that can identify the things that we want. Now, traditionally, you could always create your own custom model in TensorFlow and TensorFlow Lite. But if you don't have any machine learning expertise and you don't want to write a single line of code, we have AutoML Vision Edge. AutoML Vision actually last, uh, launched last year, uh, at, um, and, and there was a, a cloud-based version of it. So like Ibrahim explained earlier, when you're creating a machine learning model, there are two steps. You train the model, and then they use, you use the model. The AutoML Vision Edge product that we launched this year allows you to train the model in the cloud, but then the model runs fully on device. So once the model is actually in the application, you don't need an internet connection. You can just start using it. OK, so how does it work? Going back to the steps of building a custom image classification model, traditionally, you would have to prepare the training data, develop the model, you train it, tune it. Once you're satisfied with that, that takes a little bit of time. You do a lot of iterations. And then you deploy it, and then you use it. With AutoML Vision Edge, you still need to bring the training data, because that's how you're teaching the model, right? You have different classes of objects, and then you bring that data. But the next step is just to give it to AutoML Vision with an ML kit. And it will take your images, it will train the model, it will tune it, evaluate it, and deploy it for you, and, and leave it ready to, you, to be used. So for our particular example, what we're going to do is we're going to take images of driver's licenses, business cards, and then other random images. Because we realize that a lot of times, when you ask people to submit a picture of a document, they'll just point somewhere and take a picture. And we want to catch that as well. Those images then go to the AutoML service. And what you get as an output is a TensorFlow Lite model that's ready to use on device. OK, so let's see it in the console. Switch back to the laptop. OK, great. So I'm in the Firebase console. And I go to the ML kit section, and then I click on Auto ML. The first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a data set. So I'm going to call it license. And here's where you choose whether your data set has uh, single labels or multi labels. So that means a single image can be one, one thing, or it can be more than one thing. In our, in our example, it's just simple, right? We have three labels, so it's a single label classification. And once the data set has been created, the next step is to upload the images. Uh, and you do that. You can do it in a zip format if you want. And the way the zip is constructed is it's three different folders. Each folder is labeled by the thing it has. So I have a folder for driver's license, another one for uh, business cards, and another one for other. And I zip all of that together, and then I upload it. OK, so this is going to take a little bit uh, to upload. So I just, I'm going to show a data set that I uploaded earlier. Uh, and this has images from all those three categories. You can see that they are labeled. Uh, in this browser, I can switch the, the label of the images. I can add more images if I want. You can see that there's a warning here. 
And that's because while AutoML Vision Edge will work with as little as or as few as 10 images, we recommend that you have at least 100. And really, for a good machine learning model, a lot of training data is key. But it will work, so we'll do it for this example. The next step is to train the model. Here, I have two choices to make. The first one is the architecture of the model that I want to choose. I can choose one that's higher accuracy, but it's going to be slightly slower, more latency. Because you can imagine, right? It's a model with more layers, more complex, so the data takes a little bit longer to pass through. It's also a little bigger, but that's the way to do it with higher accuracy. If you care about lowest latency, you want a response really quick. In this case, it's 22 milliseconds versus 105 milliseconds. You would choose the lowest latency. And of course, you have a choice in between as well if you want something that's between the two. The next thing you would do is you would choose the number of hours you want to train the model for. The way I like to explain this is, imagine that you are studying and you have a page, right? You can probably learn the page in a minute. If you have 10 pages or a book, it's going to take you longer. Similarly, with machine learning models, depending on how big the data set is, you need more or less time to train. The good news is that this is an upper bound. So if you say you select eight hours and the model just optimizes and learns quickly and it's done, it will stop uh, training and it will be ready for you to use. OK. So here I would click Start Training, and that would take a few hours. So I'm just going to jump to a model that's already been trained. Uh, and here we can see the precision, the recall, uh, and the expected latency of this model. You can also see a confusion matrix, which basically says, in the test part of the data set, every time we gave it a business card, how did it perform? So it says that it confused it with, with other a few times. That gives you an idea about where your model is getting confused and where you should introduce more data. So you potentially want to add more business cards and more other images so the model learns how to differentiate between the two. So th these numbers are actually not very realistic because I had a very small data set, but it gives you an idea of how it works. Once the model is ready, you can test it within the console. You can upload an image, and it will, it will tell you what it think it is. So that's a good way to test it uh, without, uh, without implementing it in your app. Now notice, we've created a model here, and we haven't written a single line of code. And we don't even need machine learning experience, right? OK. So now that we have the model, what do we do? We have to use the model. And here we have two options. The first option is to download the model and bundle it with my app at build time so it's ready when the application is installed. The other option is for me to publish the model on Google's infrastructure. The benefit of publishing is that if you choose not to bundle it with your app, the initial install size is smaller because the model is not there. Also, when you publish the model, you can, because it's in the cloud and it gets downloaded dynamically to the device, you can swap it whenever needed. And we'll, we'll go through an example of that. So let's say if I have a model and then I've improved it with more data, I can then switch to a different model and I don't have to redeploy my app. OK, so let's go back to the slides. So let's say we want to publish a model. And by the way, the recommended way to do it is that you do both, right? You, you download the model so it's ready to use when the app is installed, and you also publish it so you can swap it. So let's say that I publish it and I give it a name. I call it license model. So then I'm going to configure the labeler. I'm going to load the model. And then I'm going to pass the image to the labeler that I've created. Then I have on success listener, on failure. And then on success, I get all the labels. And then I can start extracting them and see what the predicted labels are for that image. OK, so let's do a quick demo. Switch to the, OK. All right, so let me point it to a driver's license. And you can see it says driver's license. And then let me point it to a business card. And it says business card. OK, great. So. Back to the slides, there were two APIs at use. You saw the first thing that happens was that we created a bounding box around the image. And that's the object detection and tracking API. It's a base API ready for you to use. And then we took the cropped image, passed it to the AutoML model, and it predicted what it was. 
One quick thing to point out, just because this model was really easy to create, it doesn't mean that it's a toy model, it's not good. It's actually state of the art. They're 1.8 times faster than the state of the art handcrafted mobile net V2 models. And those are difficult models to create. There are many possibilities, design is challenging, and there's a lot of iteration involved. Here you just upload the images and you get a model. So what if I want to add a new type of document? Let's say we bring our application to Spain. And here, you know, we have driver's license, business card, and other, but maybe we also want to start detecting passports as an additional type of document. It's not a problem. We add an additional class of images to our data set called passport. We pass that to our AutoML Vision Edge. It generates a new model for us, TensorFlow Lite, ready to use on device. OK, so now I have two models. What do I do? Do I just switch it in production? That's the kind of thing I like to do, but I don't think it's recommended. <laughs> so you can deploy multiple models with remote config. Remember, we published our initial model, and we gave it a name, license model. And in the code in the application, we would hard code the model name. We would say license model, and that would retrieve that model from the cloud. OK, so now what I do is I publish a second model, which I created with the passport pictures, and call it license model ES for Spain. Then I create a remote config parameter. Remote config is a service within Firebase that allows you to create dynamic parameters that you can then switch on the fly or switch depending on the, on the audience. So in this case, I'm creating a parameter called my model. And for users in Spain, they're going to get the value license model ES. Everybody else is going to get license model. So if we, and the condition called Spain is going to be triggered if the user is in the country Spain. In our application, instead of hard coding license model as the string, I'm going to switch it to the remote config parameter. This is what makes it get the right value for that specific user. License model ES if it's a Spanish or user in Spain, and license model otherwise. OK. So that's how we implement uh, a model, an AutoML model, in, uh, in our application. There's still a, a, a part that's a little tricky here to do. How do I get the training data? Creating the model is easy, but how do I get the training data? We actually ran into a similar issue when we were implementing our application. So we created an open source app called Custom Image Classifier. And what it allows you to do is within the app, you can create a data set. So let's say it's for fruit, for example, and I add a bunch of labels. Next, I can start collecting samples. So in this, you know, the my example would be driver's licenses, right? I actually went and took pictures of driver's licenses. Here's an example of collecting a picture of, app, one of an apple. I can even take a short video, which allows me to pan around it really easily and get a lot of different angles. Not only that, but you can collaborate with others. So I can invite Ibrahim to my project, and he can add apples that he has at home, because maybe my apples are red, his are green. And we want to train a model really well. We need a lot of variety in our data. So then once we've done collecting the images, we can go back to the console and start training the model there. Or we can trigger model training from within the application. Once the model is ready, we can take a picture of another apple, for example, and see how well it does. So you can do everything from collecting the data to training and testing the model, all within a single app, open source. So we really encourage you to play with it, download it. It's available for you to download. OK. So to recap, MLKit makes machine learning really easy for you to use. It offers ready-to-use pre-trained models that we call base APIs. In the vision section, we have landmark detection, barcode scanning, face detection, image labeling and text recognition, which Ibrahim demoed, object detection and tracking, which was the bounding box that I showed you in the AutoML example. This year, we also launched a few examples with natural language. Those are language identification, smart reply, and on-device translation, and then for those with custom needs, you can always bring your own custom model, and you can host it with, uh, with MLKit, and we'll serve it to your end users. And if you need help in creating your custom image classification models, you can do so with AutoML Vision Edge. That's all we have for you today. We can't wait for you to try all this functionality and give us feedback. We'll be outside waiting for you at the Ask Firebase session if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Okay.
When a man took the first step on the moon 50 years ago, he was standing on the shoulders of giants. There were thousands of people working behind the scenes on the Apollo 11 mission. The rocket scientists, the mathematicians, the mechanics, the engineers developed the technology to make it possible to safely transport the astronauts to the moon and back. The Mission Control Center in Houston was monitoring the entire Apollo 11 operation 24-7, ready to step in and help the astronauts at any point. And how do we know all that? Because of a very important group of people, the journalists and the reporters. Did you know that there were over 3,000 journalists present at the moment of the Apollo 11 launch into the space from Cape Kennedy? And that moment alone was televised to 25 million people in the United States alone. It brought us all together. It was a really magical moment. I'm still having the goosebumps looking at the picture like this today when I see the entire families, friends, coworkers, and sometimes even complete strangers, gathered in front of the few televisions available in 1969. And looking at that picture, I'm also wondering, what if the moon landing happened today, James? <laughs> well, it might look a little different, right? Uh, maybe it looks a bit more like this. Well, this image is so different. Nobody's even paying attention to the TV in front of them. Everyone is on their own device, seems distracted. What's going on? Well, that was my first impression too, right? Uh, they are not looking at the screen, they're playing with their devices, but media is different nowadays, right? Uh, the kid with the phone, he's maybe reading an article about the moon landing and the milestones that are being accomplished in real time. He's getting push notifications, he's sharing that content with his friends on social media, same with the laptop, you know. Everyone is consuming the content in a way that's suited to them, and they're interacting with it, right? It's a personalized experience. After all, push notifications and interactive infographics didn't exist in 1969. My name is Justina Buck. I'm a go-to-market manager at Firebase in San Francisco. And in my day-to-day -day role, I listen to customers such as yourselves every day, and I help you get onboarded to the Firebase platform and use it together with our Google SDKs. Hi, and I'm James Daniels, developer relations with Firebase. When I'm not at conferences like this or meetup groups meeting awesome developers like yourselves, I'm often splunking around on GitHub and sending pull requests and view reviewing things for our open source SDKs. And today we would like to talk to you about how the media industry has transformed over the years. It all begins with audience engagement. And comparing the two pictures we just showed you, it's clear that the way we engage with media and content today is very different than it was in 1969. We have more hardware choices. We have tablets, mobile devices, uh, so we can interact with media in a different way. We also have different content sources. On top of the official newspapers and televisions, we also have social media, we have blog posts. So things have changed. But what remains constant is the power of the great story, such as moon landing. It still brings us all together. What has changed is uh, how we want to engage with that story. Then there are the most successful media platforms today. They are doing two things to engage their users. First, they allow them to personalize their content experience. And second, they allow them to interact with the content. And content personalization is super important to Sky UK, a British te television and online content streaming platform. They are currently working with Firebase on modernizing their technology infrastructure to be able to deliver fluid and immediate mobile experiences with their many apps to their many users. And it's great to be working with them. The industry pioneers, such as Sky UK, they have really mastered content personalization at scale and make content interactive. And by doing those two things, they have no problem converting their users into paid subscribers. Speaking of media industry innovators, we'd like to tell you the story of a 
200-year-old French newspaper that has completely changed how they interact with their audience and re re reinvented their business model. Le Figaro became one of the first newspapers in France who successfully navigated the transition from print to digital media content distribution. Le Figaro chose Firebase as their main app development platform, currently using 11 of our 18 products to deliver personalized content across their 11 applications, iOS, Android, and web. Let's start with the content personalization, sticking with the moon landing as an example of the narrative that we'll be personalizing for our users. So the moon landing took eight days. So it was physically impossible even for the most devoted fans to stay glued to their screens and to follow the astronaut's journey for the entire duration of that time. And that's where push notifications come in super handy because they allow the media publishers to send personalized notifications to their user base and notify them about the upcoming major milestones. So let's see how we can um, customize this story for two of our users, James and Justina. And let's assume we are about to reach the boost out of the Earth orbit milestone. So as you may recall from our introductions, James and I have quite different roles at Firebase. So it's fair to assume our personal interests are also quite different. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, you're business development, right? So you're used to playing with numbers, focusing in on that. I imagine that you used to be really good with numbers always, right? Probably interested in physics and math in school. Yeah, in fact, math and physics were my favorite subjects uh, at high school. If any of my teachers are watching this live uh, video stream, kudos to you for everything you taught me. So in my personalized notifications about the Earth orbit boost, I would like to know the speed at which the uh, astronauts were moving which was a whopping 39,000 kilometers per hour. So those raw numbers are perfectly fine for me. I would even add maybe acceleration and a bit of other details if we had space. But for someone like James, I don't know if raw numbers really resonate with you. Let's see how we could personalize that notification for someone like James. He travels a lot. How many conferences have you spoken at just this year? Oh, probably something on the order 2030, something like that. Right, so you do spend a lot of time on the planes. So what if I told you that if you could move at the speed with which Apollo 11 boosted out of the Earth orbit, 39,000 kilometers per hour, it would only take you 15 minutes to get to Madrid from our office in San Francisco. That's crazy. Uh, and thank you very much for putting that big number into context for me. You're most welcome. Now, let's take a look under the hood and see what technology infrastructure made it possible for Le Figaro to deliver that type of notification at scale to their users. So everything starts with user authentication. And Firebase Auth supports many different ways of authenticating your user, including anonymous authentication. So I'm not yet a paid subscriber to Le Figaro. I'm just browsing. I may have stumbled upon their website or maybe opened one of their apps. But I would like to try the service. But I don't want to spend minutes of my precious time putting down my name, phone number, email. I don't want to even share the data with them. Not, not yet. Um, so the beauty of Firebase authentication is that the moment I stumble on their website, I will receive a unique user ID. And thanks to that user ID, I can immediately start subscribing to the topics of my interest. And those topics will be stored in Cloud Firestar, which is a real-time NoSQL database. It supports many different data structures. And one of the data structures we can put in Firestar is a user profile. So as you can see on the screen, my user profile is pretty basic right now. Um, I didn't even submit my email address. I just have this user ID but I can already subscribe to three types of notifications. So of course, breaking news world, relevant for everyone. Uh, and then aerospace and astronomy, that's perfect for me. I don't think that would be a little too much for James. Uh, so now, once I experience the content uh, that Le Figaro delivers to me and I'm ready to convert into a paid subscriber, it's going to be super easy to seamlessly do it with uh, Firebase. 
So now you can see my user profile. Uh, I, I added my phone number and my email, and but it's all my topic subscriptions are still the same. Now, the first step in subscribing to personalized notifications is once my profile is saved into Cloud Firestore, that event triggers a cloud function that in turn lets cloud messaging from Firebase know there is a new user, and here are the three topics she is interested in. Perfect. Everything is set and ready to go. So now, when a journalist publishes a new article, uh, it's also going to be saved into Cloud Firestore, super flexible database. It can store complex uh, data structures such as articles. And here you can see in the topic section, there are the keywords that tell you uh, which article it is about. Um, so the moment the journalist pushes this article to production, and what's really cool, the journalist can actually push an article to production without involving development teams. Um, that event triggers another cloud function that tells cloud messaging to send a personalized notification to Justina, because this is an article about astronomy. I will find it super interesting. And I'm super happy with this experience. I'm ready to convert and be a paid subscriber of Le Figaro notifications. <laughs> so the architecture we walked you through was the exact architecture Le Figaro did to deliver personalized notifications at scale to their subscribers. Now, you may wonder, when we approach a big event, maybe Mars landing, hopefully in a few years we all get to experience that, uh, there will be lots of users who want to receive those personalized uh, notifications. So James, can you tell us more about scalability of cloud messaging? Yeah, definitely. So, right, we land on Mars, and Le Figaro wants to push a notification about this event to their users, right? Maybe there's 8 billion people on the planet. I mean, Imagine the, 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 the moon landing had 600 million people watching it on televisions. And the world's population was a lot smaller than they didn't have phones in everyone's pockets. So, you know, it would have a lot of users. So, the best thing about the architecture that Justina just presented is it's completely serverless, right? It can scale from zero to, you know, virtually infinity. And it relies on the Google uh, Firebase cloud messaging solution to deliver those push notifications at scale. And can we handle that? Well, I think we can. So FCM currently delivers 800 billion messages a day to our users on behalf of our developers for free. That's a big scale. We could actually, <laughs> thank you. We could deliver 100 personalized notifications to every single person that's alive on the planet Earth today, and we would still have some buffer. Yeah, a little wiggle room. So we covered personalized content, right? Let's talk about interactive. So say I wanted some sort of infographic, right? I had the article on the moon landing, and I wanted our users when they came to the page to be able to tell where the astronauts are along their path. So what might that look like? So say we have you know, their speed, how much time is remaining, how, how many kilometers are left in their path, um, maybe milestones that they've already achieved, milestones yet to hit, and make it real time, right? So the number of kilometers keep ticking down. So how would we build this, right? Again, start with authentication. The great thing here is using auth, we can actually protect our Firestore from someone pulling down all the data, right? This could be anonymous authentication. They don't need to log in with their account. So after the user has authenticated, you reach out to Cloud Firestore, get the data. And then, you know, it real time syncs to the user again. So Let's look at this data structure. Uh, very simple, we have a named infographic object with the current position, speed, milestones, and maybe last updated. So say the API from NASA is a little slow or you're updating it manually, that last updated timestamp 
could allow you to tween in between the different milestones. And then when those values change, you have that real-time nature, right? So gone is this pull to refresh experience. If the user's on the page, right, they're going to get all those updates, and they're going to see those astronauts ticking along their path. Now, there's a problem here, right? The, the Apollo journey, it, it takes a week. Um, so if you land on that page and you're watching the astronauts tick along their path for a week, not realistic, right? You're going to go to that page for a couple seconds, and then you're going to bounce. So how do we reduce this churn? Well, maybe we could actually add things like a questionnaire, survey content, puzzles, games on the page. Mm -hmm. So in this case, let's do a quick little trivia question, right? Or multiple of them. And the user can answer. So I'm going to guess Gemini. Well, I was wrong. The correct answer was Columbia for the command module of Apollo. And using that real-time nature, as I'm watching this page after I answered this, I can see these values change over time, right? They're interactive. It shows me the live polling data from the users answering questions alongside of me, making this a very cool experience. And I'll likely stick on that page for longer, interact with it longer. So let's look at building this. So we'll add in sub-collections survey questions, right? Uh, we'll put in information such as the options, correct answer, and we'll keep track of the number of users that have answered each question and the total answers. And those together are going to give us the statistics that we need to build those percentages, right? Pretty, pretty simple division. Um, and architecturally, it looks just like the previous one, right? The users authenticate. They go out to Cloud Firestore, it streams back in real time. Now, this has its limits, um, namely that Firestore has a one QPS sustained document write rate. So if you're writing to the same document and you have lots and lots of users on the same page all writing to that document, say they're incrementing those numbers client side, you know, we get couple thousand people on that page, we have trouble scaling. So what we can actually do is we could instead write their answers to Cloud Firestore, as opposed to incrementing those numbers, and then we can trip a Cloud function, and we could do a counter, right? So we could increment on the function side, maybe we shard that counter to get over the QPS, and it goes back to Firestore and then back to the user. So here, you know, we've managed to scale by writing those answers to the database. And if you run into this problem a lot, then actually the distributed counter Firebase extension is for you. Uh, keep watching this afternoon to learn more about that. Now, the downside here for me is, you know, we've hit that scale, but maybe I don't care about the user's answers we're writing a lot of things to the database. Um, ultimately, let's look at our data structure and say, yes, we could, we could fix the scale by writing those out, but how do we hone in on the problem itself? It's really those counters, right? When we have millions of users on the page, those are going to be ticking up and down rather quickly. So maybe we can restructure our database so we don't have to worry about that. So instead, let's just keep the information that we're interested in in the database, the number of people, the ratio of people that answered each question, right? Think of Firestore this way. It's not only your database, but it's your API. What information are you presenting on the page? And organize around that. So let's look at how this is built. Instead of directly writing to Firestore, I'm going to call a cloud function from the client side. And maybe I use memory store. Um, that way I can work in memory. I can jot down their answers, put it in a counter, not have to worry about you know, storing those permanently. Then I have a cloud function on a cron that trips in there. 
Mm -hmm. That writes out to Firestore, and then the user gets their real-time updates. That sounds really great, but I thought we were focusing on 100% serverless solutions. And Memory Star, don't you have to set it up, maintain it, apply yeah. security patches? That's fair. Uh, you know, I've worked with Memory Star a lot, uh, databases like that, and I'm used to setting those up, provisioning them, and scaling them. But yeah, that's focus on serverless. And there's actually some great tools in the GCP toolbox for this. Uh, one that I often reach for is Cloud Dataflow. Um, it's going to build this sort of analytics pipeline for us. And it's functional. So we can do groups and sorts and counts. And we can do these on Windows, right? So the Windows allow us to work around these QPS limits. So we could do counters every 20 seconds, add everything up, and then write it back to Firestore every 20 seconds. So simply, right, we just plug this into the architecture here. And that gets us to where we wanted to go. And ultimately, this problem of scalability, right, it depends on your usage, your data structures, and you know, your access patterns. So it's a complex problem, but we have tools that will help you get there. Now, we might have gotten a little ahead of ourselves talking about how to take this infographic to you know, tens of millions, maybe a billion users, right? A little, little crazy. But what we're trying to get across here, right, is these are things that Le Figaro has dealt with, right? They want these infographics to scale from zero to huge bursts of users, and they don't want to have to manage a lot of servers. And you know, they need that churn reduce. They want that interactive content. They want that rich client experience. Yeah. yeah, we may have gotten a little bit ahead of ourselves here. Also, let's keep in mind that Le Figaro is a newspaper. The majority of their employees are journalists. In fact, they have 400 journalists uh, working at Le Figaro today. So you may wonder how many developers support that team of journalists and create those interactive infographics that James just described. Five. <laughs> five? Someone in the audience just mentioned five. Well, the actual answer is three. Technical journalist is a hybrid between a journalist and a developer, and they solely specialize in data visualizations. But they have 400 journalists sourcing them data points. But the scaffolding that they were able to create with Firestore and Functions uh, with uh, readily available building blocks was so easy that they could do more with uh, fewer teams. So no servers, everything is serverless, and it's all real time. Well, as a disclaimer, Le Figaro has 11 apps across iOS and Android, as James mentioned earlier. So they do have a team of 50 developers supporting those apps. But infographics are supported with just three, three people. And besides Le Figaro, another media innovator, Sky UK, whom we introduced earlier in our talk, they are also moving towards a real-time event-driven architecture. They are working closely with Firebase on that. And you know, content discovery recommendations, personalizing the experience, and tailoring it specifically to your users' needs is really the future of how the media industry is engaging their customers. The media industry is obviously very different today than it was during the moon landing time in 1969. 50 years ago, it took technology and personal courage to pull off the moon landing. Today, the same is true for every major milestone, every innovation. Le Figaro and Sky are innovators in this space. All of you in this room, you're all innovators. You're all playing with new technology, taking risks, trying to build your application and get to market faster. And all of the explorers and innovators need a team. The Apollo 11 crew, they were assisted by thousands and thousands of people. They didn't sew their own spacesuits. They didn't build their own rockets. They didn't catch themselves when they landed in the Pacific. And Le Figaro and Sky, ultimately, they were assisted by Firebase. They didn't have to rack and stack their own servers. They accelerated their time to market and innovation with ready-to-use building blocks from Firebase. 
It is our mission at Firebase to support all of you innovators in your quest of building, running uh, great applications. So whether you are about to develop a new app, a turn a great idea into a scalable app and reach millions of users, and you're looking for app components like authentication, databases, functions, or maybe machine learning capabilities, Firebase has your back. Now, if you already have an application in your store and you have thousands of users and you have to keep innovating, you want to add a new feature, but you are afraid you're going to disrupt the experience for your existing users, we also help you monitor user experience at scale and you can roll out those features gradually, monitoring how they are um, experienced by your users. And lastly, uh, the Firebase Engage family of products will help you reach new user segments. Uh, if you would like to run experiments with different price points or engage users with personalized notifications, uh, we can be also your mission control center. We could be your Houston. <laughs> well, that wraps up our talk. It was a lot of fun to work on it with James, but we're out of time. Well, it was a great virtual journey to the moon and back, and it took us only 25 minutes. Well. Um, I learned something today. That's the amount of time that it would take me to travel from San Francisco to Madrid and yeah. back, right? And back, almost back, and grab some tapas along your side. Well, that was the last joke for today. Thank you so much for attending this talk, and I would also like to extend huge gratitude to Le Figaro and Sky, who allowed us to share their transformational journeys with all of you today. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Please welcome onto stage Timothy Jordan. Hey y'all, how you doing? I just have a couple announcements for you. You're getting up, I can see that, probably because you're still hungry, and that's a good thing because we're still serving lunch. So head on out there and get something to eat. Next up in here, we have a special live edition of Ask Firebase for our live stream. It's the first time we're doing it, so if you want to come back or stick around and check that out, please do. And for the live stream, please stay tuned. In just a few minutes, we'll have Ask Firebase Live.
Hola, and welcome to this very special episode of Ask Firebase Live. Hey, Smith. Donde estamos? Estamos a Madrid, Raquel. Oh. I, pra- I swear that worked when I practiced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That uh, is hard. <laughs> it's very difficult. I'm sorry. Yeah. But, but yes. You are right. We are in Madrid, Spain, for this year's Firebase Summit. And today we have a really special guest and a special format for this very first live episode of Ask Firebase. That's right. Uh, for folks who aren't familiar with Ask Firebase, it's a show that we have on our YouTube channel uh, where we invite guests, uh, different experts for different product areas in Firebase, where we answer your burning fire Firebase questions. Uh, whether that's submitted through Twitter, Stack Overflow, YouTube, whatever social channels you're using, uh, as long as you post it with the hashtag Ask Firebase, we look for those questions and then answer them on the show. Yeah. But what makes today's episode so special is that we will be taking your questions live right here from the Firebase Summit in Madrid, and we'll be answering them right here live as well. Yes, and to submit your questions, just type them into the chat. Uh, if you're watching this, there's a chat window there. Any questions you have, type them in. Uh, we'll be taking a look throughout uh, the course of this episode uh, for your questions and we might get selected. One special note about that is that uh, the questions we'll be looking for are for specific to the announcements that happened at the keynote this morning. And we'll be having guests on who are experts in some of those products that were shown this morning as well. And they'll be answering questions related to that. So uh, when you're posting up questions to increase the chances of it getting selected, make sure it's related to that. Uh, and then also, there's some folks who were ambitious enough to submit some questions before the actual show. They responded to our promo video, and uh, we ha- we've got some questions from there as well that we're going to answer. So stay tuned, because if you submitted a question, we might answer it on the show. So our first guest is going to be Steve Gannam, and he's the product manager for Google Analytics. And so he'll be able to answer any of your questions about uh, analytics for web, remote config for web, um, the new web targeting for Firebase Cloud Messaging. So make sure to stay tuned for him to come on to answer questions about those topics. Mm-hmm. After that, we're going to have on Kara Yu, who is the PM for uh, Firebase Extensions, which was just announced this morning. So any questions you have for that, where to find them, how to install them, what they can do, uh, you can ask all of those questions when she's on, and we'll take the time to answer those for you as well. Um, and then we even got on today Francis Ma, who is our group product manager for all of Firebase. So he's going to be able to answer questions about things that are Firebase-wide, all the new features that might happen in Firebase land from here, uh, from the summit and beyond. Um, he'll also be able to answer your questions about app distribution, numeric predictions, um, and just anything that might have been covered in the keynote this morning. Um, so stay tuned for him. Mm-hmm. And finally, we're going to have on our beloved Puff. Uh, who helped organize the Firebase Summit in Madrid this year. Uh, And he'll be on to answer any questions you have about the Firebase Summit itself. So we're about to get started. Yes. You all ready? ready to go. Yeah. Okay. So our very first guest, welcome Steve. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. Hello. Thanks for being on the show. Good to see you again, too. Yes. Welcome on the show. Yeah. Yes, welcome, welcome. Glad to be here. I'm excited to be here. I love this event. So, Steve, um, we said you were the product manager for Google Analytics. What does that mean that you do for Firebase? For Firebase, I mean, Google Analytics is really well integrated with Firebase. Yeah. And so the, the data from analytics is used to measure your, your usage of other features. And also the data that you use uh, can be used in targeting features of a number of Firebase growth uh, products. Okay, so you kind of do that bridge into the Firebase That's right. I'm, the, the, Firebase I'm world. the bridge between analytics and Firebase. That's awesome. So we have a tradition on Ask Firebase. Tell us a fun fact about yourself, Steve. Fun. I kind of have an embarrassing one. Is that's, that all, right? that's always the best kind. Uh, so uh, I have an irrational fear of mushrooms. You do not. I do. Oh my goodness. Is it a cer- certain color of mushrooms or just all no, mushrooms? No, just mushrooms. <laughs> Is it fungus in general or just mushrooms? Just, just there's other types of fungus. <laughs> well, fu- just, it's no, kind of, no, it's just mushrooms. Just you mushrooms. see them grow, growing in your lawn and then all of a sudden they're on your pizza and you're like, what gives? <laughs> I guess you can't share a pizza because I love mushrooms on mine. but. All I'll right. pick them off, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So Steve, you ready for some tough questions? Bring it on. All right, so all of you out there, make sure that Steve can answer your questions about analytics for web, uh, let's see, remote config for web, and web targeting for Firebase Cloud Messaging. So add them to the live feed, and Summit will be looking for questions, but we have one that was posted earlier. 
So there were a lot of announcements. Those three things, that's a lot of things. Can you give us a brief overview of what's most exciting about some of those three things? This was a massive launch and a massive day for these products. So today we launched the ability to measure your web apps. Measure, okay. And also to engage your end users of your web apps yeah. in ways that weren't possible before. So over the last three and a half years, we've built out these really sophisticated integrations and seamless integrations between Google Analytics and features in Firebase like uh, remote config and notifications that you could use them together to accomplish a number of really compelling use cases to create engaging experiences for your users and to send uh, push notifications to them in a yeah. very targeted way. And customers, this has really resonated with our developers. But of course, a lot of our developers develop web apps too. And the, right. the lack of these, this, these abilities on the web really just stood out. Mm -hmm. So today we launched that same free and unlimited analytics product for web apps as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ability to target audiences that you create in your remote config parameters and conditions and also in your FCM targeting. Um, and it's not just the, this extra ability to measure web apps, mm -hmm. but if you have a web app and say an iOS app and an Android app, we also give you the ability to measure across platform. Oh, across all three. That's right, oh, so that's if, if your users engage with your product across multiple surfaces, uh -huh. like maybe, maybe it's cross device, like they're on their iPhone during the day and their iPad at night, right. or maybe it's cross platform, sometimes they're on the desktop using yeah. web, at work and sometimes they're yeah. using their phone we give you the ability to measure cross-platform in your own identity space. Okay. So if you have your own notion of identity of a user, you can supply that into analytics. And then the whole product lights up in this cross-platform way. That's cool. So um, you can deduplicate all your reports by that user ID, but also create audiences. That's really powerful. That based on users who do maybe some of their activity on web and some on app, okay. uh, and then target those audience with these Firebase features. That's incredible. That's awesome. Yeah. Is there any questions that people have had from the, from the live stream? Well, there's a question that was submitted from someone on Twitter, actually, who responded to our promo video. Uh, it's from SAHan47 mm -hmm. uh, from Auckland, New Zealand. Pretty cool. Auckland? Uh, this is his question, or his or question, I'm not sure. Uh, and sorry for mispronouncing your Twitter handle. Uh, but thanks for the, que thanks for the question. Uh, all right, so um, they're asking, I'm struggling to understand the best solution to show customer offers for users using Firebase? Should I be using audiences or should I be using database lookup to match the offered customer attributes? Any help is much appreciated. Uh, thank you for the question, first of all. Yes. There, there is no real one-size-fits-all solution for this. Mm -hmm. So I, I will highlight what I see as like being the advantages or the nice aspects of the analytics-based solution. Mm -hmm. So they mentioned this custom attributes that they want to track or associate with users. Mm -hmm. There's a, co a matching concept in analytics called user properties. Okay. So it may be that you are already setting user properties for these attributes and you can use those as filters in your analytics reports mm -hmm. and create audiences off of them, which you can then use in other Firebase features. One that really stands out here when I think about presenting offers to users in a sort of targeted or personalized way is Firebase in-app messaging. Mm -hmm. It basically exists for this purpose, to show contextual upsells and messages inside of your app experience to users, and you can send those messages at the right time to the right audience, an audience being the key word there. So you could define an audience based on the values of these custom attributes, and okay. then in your targeting conditions for uh, Firebase in-app messaging, you can make sure that those users see it at the right time that you prompt them. Okay, sweet. Um, now, Steve, I've got some sad news. <laughs> I know it's, it was fast, but our production team is telling us that we're actually out of time wow. for questions on analytics. Time flies. So, yeah, it does. It really does. Uh, but Steve, thanks so much for being on the show. Sure. Really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. This is awesome. It's so exciting. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers, Steve. Take care. Thank you. So if you have any more questions, Steve got into some details. There was a laundry list of things for Steve. But if you have any more questions about analytics for web or remote config for web or web targeting for Firebase Cloud Messaging, go ahead and keep asking them on Twitter, Stack Overflow, or wherever you ask questions. Make sure you tag it with Ask Firebase. And we will maybe ask, answer that question on a future episode of Ask Firebase. Yes, absolutely. Next up, uh, if you have questions about Firebase extensions, we're happy because we, our next guest is Kara Yu. Uh, please come on to the show. Hey, so Kara! Hey, high <laughs> All right, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thanks, Kara. Now, Kara, we know you're a Firebaser. Yeah. 
Uh, we knew you do something with Firebase Extensions. Can you tell us what do you do uh, in Firebase <laughs> with Extensions? Absolutely. I'm the product manager for Firebase Extensions, which just launched under the keynote mm -hmm. a couple hours ago. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. And Kara, as you know, it's an Ask Firebase tradition to ask a fun fact about every guest that we have on the show. So Kara, what's your fun fact? So um, I got certified for scuba diving 10 years ago. Um, okay. And ever since I got certified, I wanted to see a whale shark. I went to Honduras. I went to the Philippines. There were no whale sharks anywhere. Okay. A year and a half ago, my now husband took me to uh, La Paz in Mexico, near California, uh, where finally I got to swim with whale sharks. Whale sharks? Oh, they're fantastic. Huge. They're those like, are those huge ones, right? Yeah, no, they're the biggest fish. Oh my the goodness. biggest living fish. They're 19 meters long, potentially. Uh -huh. um, and their like, tail is the size of me. And so it's like really hard to keep up with these guys. That's and awesome. then right after that, he proposed. So that's like, whale sharks is how I got engaged. Amazing, wow. <laughs> is, is there an expiration on, on scuba, li scuba diving licenses? Because uh, if it's you know, 10 years, I feel like you're just with. in that part. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Whatever you feel okay with, you know, pressure sensing and clearing your mask and all right. <laughs> doing all the things. Cool. Well, Kara, we got some uh, questions for you from uh, the audience that are coming yeah. up soon. Um, ready to dig into some of them? Yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. Um, for the live audience uh, watching, this is the time to ask any questions you have about Firebase extensions, so post them into the chat. Uh, Rachel will now be taking a look through the chat to see uh, any questions you guys have. and. We get picked to ask to Kara and then get an answer to you. Uh, to start off with, uh, for those who might have missed the keynote this morning, so um, can you tell us a bit more about Firebase extensions? Like, why Firebase extensions? How Firebase extensions? Where can I find them? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, I guess we'll start with the last question first. You can find them on the website. If you just go to firebase.google.com, there's an entire section newly newly there uh, mm -hmm. for extensions. Um, our UX researcher, who Osa, uh, who did the keynote, would like to talk about them as if they're tapas, right? If Firebase were a restaurant, they'd be tapas. They're basically... <laughs> <laughs> They're basically very appropriate for where we are too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> That's why we decided on Spain. <laughs> um, they're prepackaged solutions that allow you to solve common use cases super easily without having to write a single line of code. Mm. So things like image resizing, like translating text, these are problems that developers have had to solve over and over again, and maybe in different projects, right? And mm -hmm. so extensions basically takes all of that away. Um, you, they're easy to install, they're configurable, they're open source, and you can add features without writing a single line of code. Nice, right, yeah, because these are kind of things that developers might have been able to do before, but it might take like a few days or maybe a week to like build yeah. something like that. Huh. So there's other very click to install solutions that just work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Cool, all right. So I actually have a question. Um, let's see if I can, um, there's lots of questions in there, but we have a question <laughs> from uh, Digibyte, and this person asks, um, can external resources be used in for an extension? Like, are there other types of resources other than just, um, like, I guess, like, cloud functions or a singular language? Like, right now, what's happening with external resources? Yeah, absolutely. So we have nine extensions we're launching today, um, and several actually feature uh, third-party party APIs. So oh, yeah. um, we have an extension for MailChimp where you it automatically adds uh, users to MailChimp whenever they show up on your database. Um, and we also have um, a Bitly, uh, one that fo focuses on the Bitly API, so it shortens URLs automatically. Um, so yeah, we can, there's, extensions basically allow you to automatically integrate parts of Firebase um, and other cloud products with other services. Okay, so both the third party as well as like Google Cloud Platform oh, services? Yes, absolutely, okay. good question. Um, so yeah, we also have a bunch of extensions that do things like uh, in help you integrate with BigQuery. Um, Ooh. <laughs> that's my favorite one. I'm not supposed to have favorites, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> so a BigQuery one, what's, like, what's, the, what's the connection with BigQuery? What is the... Yeah, absolutely. So whenever a change happens to a Firebase collection, you can specify this extension to listen for changes. Okay. And then whenever a change happens, it sends those updates real time to BigQuery. Uh -huh. So basically, you'll have a BigQuery that, you know, a BigQuery um, view that basically shows what your Firestore collection says. So an easy way to export collections to BigQuery? Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, do you have any other questions from the live stream? Uh, none that I see the live stream yet, but there was one that was submitted previously uh, for someone that actually, I guess, didn't know about Firebase extensions yet since it just got announced this morning, but they asked a question that's relevant to it. Um, so maybe I can ask that one. 
So yeah. this one is from uh, Jean Tejeda, I think, or Jean Tejeda. Sorry for mispronouncing your name, uh, but thanks for the question. It was submitted on YouTube. Um, and uh, this is what Jean had to say. My burning Firebase question is, are there any thoughts on adding a feature to Firestore to operate over multiple documents at the same time with just one line of code? So operations like remove a field, rename a field, change value of a field, uh, or drop all docs with certain conditions. Uh, I've been doing this with Cloud Functions, uh, creating a document on Firestore that specifies the type of operation that I want to perform uh, to then operate over those documents, but I'd really like a simpler way to do this. Absolutely. Um, well, you're in luck. Uh, a lot of what our extensions do is exactly that in different flavors. So, uh, for example, the translate text extension, um, when you change or when you add a field that we're monitoring, it'll basically translate that and write that to our Firestore collection. So, um, yeah, what you're talking about is exactly what our extensions are used for. They're kind of like um, allow you to have. I, you can do that with zero lines of code, not just one, okay, uh, <laughs> in fact. Right, just a click, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. No, and this and some typing. four clicks okay. and <laughs> yeah. a little bit of configuration to tell us which uh, collections to monitor. Because it's it gets configurable for your project, right? Exactly. Or your app. Like, so you can, you're can you going to make it your own, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? So you can, the powerful part of extensions is that you can actually make it fit your own use case because it's configurable and you can tell it which collection to look at, to look for, which field to look for, um, what the name of you know your translations field should be, so uh -huh. you can make it match your Firestore um, database structure. Right. Awesome. Nice. Cool. So if we, so if there's like, so this is like a specific use case, but is there other things that like if are there more extensions coming, like? Yeah, absolutely. So we are launching with nine today, um, and we're always working on more features. So cool. uh, watch out for uh, new launches in the next few months. Cool. cool. All right. Let's see if we have I anything from the stream so far. Will there full text search for Firestore extension? Oh, it looks like people are asking for like full text search for a Firestore extension. That's this been is, a very, yeah. <laughs> really yeah, this is from ask. Anders Auckland. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. From, from Auckland? No, no, oh. his name is Anders Auckland. I see. And he asked, will there be a full text search for Firestore? OK. Full Not text sure if search. we have an answer for that. Yeah, yet. so I guess it would, <laughs> it would search all your strings across your documents, and so it would look for a specific text string? I, yes, I yeah, suppose I think so. so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've heard, actually, we've actually heard that before. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely one of the extensions that we are thinking about. Um, mm. I don't think we have a commitment quite yet to that one, but uh, keep the feedback coming. I think feedback like this really helps us prioritize what to work on next. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of things about It sounds like people are excited. I hear like Samuel Egelzy, he says like, are there any plans for a more official Firebase extension? So it sounds like a lot of people are looking for other types of ways to like find really like these simple solutions to plug and play. Yeah, so if you go to our website um, and you click through to extensions, so firebase.google.com slash product slash, I guess I should That's actually efficient. show this. Oh yeah. Is this is actually actually cut. No. <laughs> I got some sad news. Oh no, it doesn't work. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm okay. always embarrassed. So you news. have to like pay attention to I me just... while I repeat a URL. <laughs> yes. 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 Listen closely. So if you click through to extensions from Firebase.google.com, which is slash product slash extensions, um, and you look at the full list of extensions at the bottom there, we actually say not finding the extension you're looking for, please give us a feature request. So we'll be monitoring that. So as you have ideas for extensions, please tell us um, cool. because we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to make extensions that you know help the most number of people. That's awesome. Yeah. That's so exciting. Cool. All right, Kara. Well, I'm sorry to say it's time <laughs> to wrap up, at least for now, for Firebase Extensions. But thanks so much for having, being yeah. on the show. Yeah. Uh, it's been fantastic to have it's you. It's been great yeah. being yeah. here. Thanks yes. so much, Kara. All right, thank All right, you. See you bye. later. All right, bye. bye. All right, so that wraps up for Firebase Extensions for now, but the fun doesn't stop yet. Uh, please keep submitting your questions, uh, either on the live chat, because we'll be looking back at this, or on Stack Overflow, Twitter, YouTube, uh, wherever else. Uh, we want more questions, because that's more feedback for us on what you guys are thinking about Wonderful. Firebase Extensions. And we might feature that on a future episode. Until then, we have another guest coming up. We do. We were able to get Francis Ma. Hey, Francis. Hey, welcome to the show. Hey, Francis. Thanks for Glad to be here. Yes. Always fun. <laughs> cool. So, right. Francis, we scurried you away from all your stuff because what do you do for us at Firebase? Well, I have the pleasure of being the head of product for Firebase. 
That's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> yes. I bet. Yes. You get to see everything that kind of happens in our world, right? I do. It's 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 really incredible to be able to work with such a great team. Yeah. Um, and be able to see a lot of the innovations and hard work across the team, and uh, of course, you know, we shared a yeah. number of them here today. So it's always fun. <laughs> so yeah. tradition for us, Firebase. Your fun fact, Francis. Hmm. Fun fact. You know, there was one time. I was asked to, or I was challenged to enter into a poetry contest. Poetry. On an on an on, on a radio show. And this is okay. a one time. Yeah. Thing. That sounds like it's gonna be a really and, interesting story. Um, but very and fun. I won it. <laughs> you won and it. I won wow. It. And so you know, I, as a product manager, as a developer, before I write lots of code, but never writing poems. Okay. And so it was really like a, a hole in one. It was like writing a thousand lines of code. Yeah. You know, you're in the flow, <laughs> and all of a sudden you hit build, and everything just compiled flawlessly, <laughs> and it just ran. So it was like that moment. Wow. But you know, every since then, I, I'm not a good poet writer, poetry writer, so it was uh, just this poll in one moment. That's amazing. This one moment in your life. <laughs> Can you recite exactly. Do you still remember that poem? Maybe you could recite it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm too embarrassed <laughs> to say it now. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, you ready for some questions? Yes, absolutely. All right. Well, if for all of you out there when you're posting your questions. So Francis is our group product manager, so he can tell you about all sorts of things about all the different features and things about that are going on in Firebase land. He can also ask your questions about app distribution, numeric predict predictions, or anything that was kind of covered in the Firebase keynote this morning that aren't covered by our other guests. So um, I'm gonna ask you a quick question about everyone's asking and wanting to know, what do you see in the near future for Firebase after post like Firebase Summit? Yeah, there, there's um, a lot of things we're working on. You know, as I as I had talked about, we're always hard at work, just looking um, in ways to help developers succeed. And uh, you know, the, the the main themes for us in terms of investing um, in towards helping developers succeed are around three things. First is helping them accelerate their app development. The okay. next one is helping them run their app more effectively. Um, and then the third one is making Firebase more extensible. And so, um, you know, not to spoil too many surprises going into it, but um, expect us to continue to be able to uh, expand our products and also uh, improve some of our workflows, yeah. uh, ultimately with the idea that, you know, we want to help developers focus more on doing the fun stuff so that we can <laughs> help them uh, take away a lot of the heavy lifting. Yeah, that's a good idea. So do we have any questions on the live stream for Francis? We actually do. Uh, we Ooh. have a question from uh, Camillo F. All right. uh, on the live stream, and Camille is asking, are you going to uh, push support for developing PWA apps? Uh, and are you going to include Dart language to develop Firebase functions? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, as we had, as you might have seen today, uh, we've um, really expanded the support for web developers or web apps uh, mm -hmm. across Firebase. So we're really excited to see that. Um, and definitely, you know, a lot of the uh, work that we've done has been driven from requests from the web community. You know, whether it's web uh, PWA developers specifically or just web app developers more generally. Um, so definitely, that's something that you know we're continuing to invest in, and it's a really big community, an important one for us. Um, and then in terms of uh, supporting for the Dart language. Um, there's uh, not n nothing that I can announce at this point about that, mm -hmm. but I think as a general theme for us is, uh, you know, we talked about uh, open sourcing our SDKs, and uh, you we also have a lot of SDK contributions that are from the community, mm -hmm. and so we've been seeing a lot of these um, innovations driven by the community, mm -hmm. and so that's also another avenue where potentially, you know, we can continue to expand more support as well. Nice. Awesome, yeah. In fact, I think for a lot of those open source libraries, there are a lot of Firebasers involved, too, who are committing to these libraries, too, and adding some uh, some support and some love there. So, yeah, cool. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. just very exciting to see. Fantastic. Cool. Well, Francis, I got some sad news. <laughs> All right. Yeah, sad news. Wow. It's sad news time. I heard from the production team that we're out of time, actually. All right. It's time to bring on our next guest. But um, um, fun time goes by quick. It That's really how it goes, does. right? Wow. So, well, looking forward to have more opportunity to speak and future Ask Firebase sessions. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Get Francis yeah. on the show, Smith. Yeah. Uh, actually, Francis, just before you go, it looks like we might have time for one more question. Oh, one more right. question. Maybe well, one maybe more. You can I don't be, know the, if you got one you can the be lucky winner on the stream. Yes. Uh, one let's more. see. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Can I? Oh, that's a database question. I don't know. Let's see. There's a f app distribution or a predictions one. 
Oh, I actually saw one. Let's ask about how can, so there's one that's about predictions. It's kind of general, but how can they use predictions in their app? Because this is a product that not a lot of people like use right now. Well, we have a lot of interest uh, in predictions, and that's a really good common question that we ask, uh, get, we get asked about is how do you use predictions in your app? And um, you know, a common use case we see is that uh, for people to use in promotional use cases. So okay. you know, whether you're building a commerce app or if you have in-app purchases, uh, common use cases, uh, predicting users that are likely to spend or users that are not likely to spend. Um, and specifically, let's say if a user that's not likely to spend, um, you can then uh, set a target, let's say using remote config, to let's say lower the price, offer a special discount. Okay. So again, really the, the spirit of it is being able to um, take these predictions and offer a more personalized experience with remote config. So that's a very common use case, um, and we recommend that as well. Awesome. Awesome. All right, I just got word. It's Great. time to go to the right. <laughs> Thanks All so right. much for well, being yes, on the show, thank though. You. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. Right, Thanks appreciate so much, it. Francis. Right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. So Francis only got to answer a couple of questions, but we know you probably have more questions about the Firebase roadmap um, or about different things that are coming down the pipeline. Um, or you might also have questions about app distribution or new numeric predictions. Um, so make sure you ask those and tag them with, with hashtag Ask Firebase. And on a future episode, we might be able to get those questions answered for you. That's right. And for now, we have another guest on the show to ask some questions about Firebase Summit. Uh, we're going to have on our dearly beloved Puff. <laughs> Hey, Puff. How are you doing, man? <laughs> good, right. good. How you doing? Hey. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. <laughs> All right, Oops, Puff. I forgot that. All right, Puff. There's, um, Tell me, what questions do you have for me? Oh, well, we have I was gonna, questions. I was going to ask, you know, like every other guest, what do you do at Firebase? But I feel like there's so many different things that you do <laughs> that I, I'd just say you're an all-around Firebaser. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just go to the fun fact about Puff. So I think we know a few already. Tell me. But Can there's you share? so many more. Um, so fun fact about, about Puff. Um, um, most original Firebasers think that I joined before we joined Google, which is not true. I joined afterwards. Uh -huh. I, I, I feel like I, I thought that, and you told me that that wasn't mm -hmm. the case, and I still thought oh, that. Oh, yeah, and it's the, the original <laughs> folks that joined with, with, <laughs> yes. with Firebase, okay. right? No, they all believe that I was there when we joined, like, oh, yeah. which is probably because I say things like when we joined Google, like, right? So, all right. Um, well, because it is a team, right? Like we're all yeah. like in it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. yeah. So. Well, Puff, we got some questions for you. Tell me. I'm, I'm looking forward to this because I haven't been questions, answering questions all morning yet. So like, let's do this. Sweet. And Puff, <laughs> I've got some sad news already. We're just going to be able to ask one question because we're one question. Getting, the, getting the signal to wrap up. That's great. What's Which your is? one question? What's the one thing that everyone wants to know, people? All right. What's I that think one thing? The one question I'll ask is, um, so, you know, Firebase Summit, I think this is the fourth year running that we've mm -hmm. done it. Uh, we had it in Berlin, Amsterdam, Prague, and now in lovely Madrid. Um, so it has a very rich history, and we're doing a lot of stuff at the summit uh, today. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about everything that's happening? You know, there's the sessions, the code labs, there's uh, the women tech makers meetup this morning. Uh -huh. So many things going on. So, so can you much. tell us a bit more about all of that? I'm just happy that you're not asking me to pick one favorite, because that, that's going <laughs> to be impossible. Be that's why I listen to yeah. all that. Yeah. No, right? So yeah, yeah. When, when attendees come in registration, right, we, of course, get them their badge. Then we, they go to pick up their... their Swag, sorry, it's not the nicest word, right? They get a shirt, they get a pin, yeah, uh, right? right? Because they're here. We're very happy that they're here, mm -hmm. right? Then we have um, a, like a few demos. We actually have twice as many demos as last year, huh? um, and we have our famous Ask Firebase, not live on stage, right? But the in-person version outside, where you ask questions of Firebases who are also wearing yellow shirts. We're trying to keep it confusing, <laughs> so. Um, no, so that's uh, always a big one. We have a few games that you can play here, um, but yeah, those are all right. Lightweight activities, as we say, because yeah. the, the the main things that we're doing right are the sessions here on the stage, including, of course, this Ask Firebase Live. Yeah. Uh, and then, right, we're starting in like seven minutes with uh, with the next uh, session here. Yeah. In and fact, yes, <laughs> we, we, we are. No, it's, yeah, and it's, it's, it's it's time to end the wrap up pretty soon. Unfortunately, yeah, no, we have code labs yeah. out here. We have yeah. community talks, yes. and we have Google Dev, of course, being present. Yeah, and then we have yeah. food and drinks. Are, are you are you hungry? And it's yeah. very tasty and amazing. Especially it is, we're in yeah. Spain, so I think it's hard to get food that isn't tasty. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's just tremendous everything that's going on. Yeah. Uh, at, no, at it's been summit, fun. So. Yeah. Like. Well, Puff, we're getting the wrap-up signal already. Okay, <laughs> so totally fine. But uh, to all our viewers who tuned in, 
thanks so much. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, we'll see you on a future episode yeah. of Ask Firebase. Make sure you post any questions you have, Twitter, Stack Overflow, YouTube, anywhere you, quest, you ask questions, hashtag Ask Firebase. We might get that question on a future episode. That's right. And until well, then, know, if it's on Stack Overflow, I might answer it before that. Yeah. You'll definitely answer it before that. So. Yeah. so stay tuned in the live stream. Yes. We'll see you all later. Bye. working on a video for YouTube. But I want to add some pizzazz to it. Everyone has read and write access to my rules, which is bad, which is very bad. So I'll say public is dissed. You know what's always amazing? In my regular life, I'm pretty certain that I get through three sentences in a row, but then as soon as I'm on camera, I'm just like, stop. You release a new version of your app, and suddenly you hear that the new feature you launched is causing crashes. Everything looks okay, except for chat room's wildcard. But it doesn't really involve pizza this time. I don't know why kids get all the fun. Woo! The zombie has power, zombie can jump, and what exactly is the life for a zombie? This is something people really want to know, Michael. Tell me when the release is. I don't know. Just tell me the release date. I'm not answering <laughs> that one. <laughs> so let's open our pod file in Xcode and add Fabric and Crashlytics pods. I'm not a robot, I promise. Oh, who's a smart little database? He's you are. My Furby is dead. I can do what I want. Uh, can we do that one again? It is, ugh. Do you have like a copy of like War and Peace or something? Firebase Semi Live, the live coding show where I live code it right here, but you watch it not live out there. Sharing photos can be hard, especially when everyone's on different devices and using different apps. So we built shared albums in Google Photos, which makes it easy to send photos to anyone using a link. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Firebase Dev Summit. Our mission is to help developers build better apps and grow more successful businesses by providing tools that help you across the life cycle of your app. How did you 
to get into the studio. What are you doing? I gotta go. Jeez. Oh, you blinked.
please welcome onto stage Todd Kerpelman. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Are you enjoying the conference? Yeah. Hey. How many of you have done the scavenger hunt? Raise your hands. All right, good number of you. Were you able to find the pineapple? I think that seemed to be the hardest thing for people to find was the, was the traveling pineapple. If you're still looking for her, I think she's kind of hanging out near the photo booth. Um, hey, actually, while I'm up here and I can talk all I want, um, raise your hands. Now, this is a toughie. Raise your hands if you've ever built something using Firebase. All right, keep your hands up if you know how to write a sentence. Oh, a lot of hands went down, more than I thought. But for those of you who still have your hands up, hey, do you know that we have a Medium publication? Medium.com slash Firebase dash developers. It's made not just for you know, people like me who like to write, but for anybody out there in the community who has maybe done something with Firebase and wants to tell the rest of the world about it. So uh, I think we have now like some, you know, how to submit stories. Um, and if that's not up there yet, you can just like ping me on Twitter. But like if you want to write a blog, want to write about some interesting fact you learned while developing with Firebase, um, you should go ahead and, and uh, tell us about it. And we'll, we'll put you on our publication. And and then you'll get to be famous, sort of. Um, anyway, so uh, we've got, I believe, four talks, four presentations coming up um, that's all kind of follow a theme of like, you know, after you've launched your app to the world, we all know that's just kind of the beginning of making your app successful. There's a lot of work you need to do to kind of nurture your app and monitor it and make sure that it is growing into the successful product that you know in your heart it should be. Um, and our first presentation in this theme is going to be uh, from Rebecca and Rob, who are going to be talking to you about how to take that frightening moment when you first launch your app to the world and make it a little less frightening. Um, so without any further ado, please welcome Rebecca and Rob up onto the stage. You know what's a great feeling? Launching an app. You know what's really scary? Launching an app. Today, we're here to answer the question, what do I need to know before I launch my Firebase app? My name is Rebecca, and I'm an engineer on Firebase app distribution. And I'm Rob DeMarco, engineering lead for Firebase build products. Let's start with a story. Together, we're building a gaming app. It's a really cool concept. We're excited about it. And we want it to be used by people all over the world. We start by building a functional prototype. We're testing it out with our team. We're iterating on it. And we're fixing all of the bugs that we find as we go along. We think we're almost ready. And so we set a launch date. Still, we're feeling a bit anxious. We've fixed all the things that we do know. But what about all the things that we don't know? Even so, launch day is rapidly approaching, and we go for it. Early, early signs look promising. We start seeing downloads. We're generating some buzz. People are talking about it. We're feeling really excited. But then the bug reports start to come in. And on the App Store, we're seeing mixed reviews. We see five-star reviews that we're really excited about, but we also see one-star reviews, and we feel anxious and scared. Some customers are saying that they really don't like a certain feature of our app. And a handful of others are even saying that the app crashes for them. Then, to make matters worse, a few days later, we get a security vulnerability report. Apparently, users can easily cheat their way to the top of a global scoreboard. It becomes this big joke, and people start trying to poke holes into our app. All eyes are on us. At this point, we're obviously feeling pretty bummed. We put a lot of work in. We really wanted that launch to go well. But all of these issues were preventable. So what did we miss? That is what we'll be talking about today. We'll give you the tools to gear up for launch and launch with confidence. So looking back, what happened? We built an app, and then we launched it. But then we started seeing unexpected bugs and bad customer reviews. It seems like our testing had missed something critical. So now, we probably wrote some unit tests. We probably also tested on a few emulators, and everything looked fine. 
But deep down, we were still wondering what would happen after we launched. So knowing this, how can we gain confidence in the quality of our app? The key is understanding that users have different backgrounds and use different devices. Our users are diverse, so our testing needs to be diverse too. Given that, what can we do? First, we're going to need real devices. Testing on an emulator simply is not enough to tell us the whole story. Next, consider what if our users speak a different language than we do, or they use their phone in landscape mode and we use it in portrait. We need to test different situations too. We also can't forget about having a very diverse tester base. We need more users, more perspectives. It would be awesome if we get our app in the hands of real users before going live. Now, we know what we need to do, but it's a lot of work. We're really focused on building something that our users love, and we don't want testing to introduce any additional stress. This is where Firebase comes in. Firebase Test Lab makes automated testing so much easier. Instead of having to go out and buy physical iOS and Android devices, Firebase Test Lab stores those devices in a Google data center, so you don't have to. Instead of configuring emulators for things like different screen sizes, different languages, different locales, and the many combinations of those factors, Test Lab will do it for you. Going back to that example at the beginning, how could we have used Firebase Test Lab to figure out why our app was crashing for certain customers? So one way we could have used Test Lab is by running a robo test. The robo crawler does a depth first search analysis of our app. It will go to different screens, click on different buttons, and really try to test all the user paths. So let's go to the demo and see how this works. Hmm. This should be fun. Thanks, Rob. All right. So now we're in the Firebase dashboard on the test lab page for our demo app. We'll start by hitting Run a Test, and we'll select RoboTest. So an error is occurring while loading this page, so we'll try uploading it here. What we would do is upload our APK. It would validate. And then the next page we would see is a device matrix. So on this page, we have the option to select so many different types of physical and virtual devices. And the default selected a few Pixel 2s, but since I'm trying to figure out why my app was crashing, I want some variety so I can preload a template. And so I will select the Pixel 2, a Pixel 3, and let's just get an older device just to shake it up a little bit. And then at the bottom of the screen, we also have the option to select a different orientation and also different locales if we want to test different languages. We would start by hitting start three tests. This will take a few minutes to run, so let's just look at the results from a previous example. Can we switch back to the slides, please? All right, so after a few minutes, we would have results that look like this. We immediately can see that two of our tests passed and one failed. Let's go through the results one by one. Let's first look at the oldest device, the Nexus 5. So here on the test results screen, we see that our test passed. Our robo was successful in crawling our app. But there are also a few different tabs that we can dig into with more information. Here on the first page, we have the crawler metrics. And then if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see a crawl graph. And this gives us a sense of all the different paths that the crawler took. This is really useful for understanding the coverage of our robo test. But a robo test doesn't just tell us if a crawl was successful, if it crashed or not. On the screenshots tab, we also have the opportunity to really visualize our app. And we can even see where the crawler interacts with user inputs. On the Videos tab, we get a similar but more detailed view where we can actually walk along the entire crawler experience. 
Both the screenshots and the video give us a really great sense of how our app looks and feels across different devices. There are two more tabs, log and performance, that we won't dig into, but those are really useful for debugging issues. All right, so I'm feeling good about the Nexus 5. Let's look at the Pixel 2. So here we see that the Pixel 2 crawl passed, but interestingly, we see a new tab that says test issues. Apparently, we're using an API that will no longer be supported after Android P+. API level 28 is Android P, so we're just safe for now, but doesn't this mean it will be a problem for newer devices? We're feeling concerned. And then if we go back, and this time we look at the Pixel 3, let's figure out why it's failing. So our concerns are confirmed. If we dug into the logs a bit more, we'd find that there was a no such method exception it's because that API was no longer supported. We realized that this is why we were having mixed reviews. Customers on older API levels were fine, but customers on the newest API level were running into this crash. In just a few minutes, with little setup, we found the reason why our app was crashing for our customers. Robotests are really powerful, but we can also run highly customized iOS and Android instrumentation tests. Firebase Test Lab lets us perform end-to-end -end tests for all our apps in one place. Now that we've run Firebase Test Lab, we're feeling a lot more confident about the quality of our app. But no matter how many devices we test on, automated testing doesn't have context. The crawler doesn't understand what your users actually want to do. We need real users to be able to tell us if the user experience is confusing or unintuitive, or if the app is not behaving how they might expect it to. We need some level of manual testing. That's where Firebase app distribution comes in. Let's walk through it. Instead of having to manually send all of your APKs and IPAs to testers, App distribution lets you manage your iOS and Android distributions in one place. In one central location, you can upload distributions, attach release notes, and send to testers. And what's more, you can get started instantly with no SDK. It also provides an intuitive UI for you to manage testers and create groups. For example, you might want to create two internal tester groups, one for iOS and one for Android. For the tester experience, when you upload a new distribution, testers get emailed instantly. App distribution also provides a tester UI, so your testers get to choose which version of the app they want to install. This gives them the ability to easily test different variants of your application. During the keynote, we demoed how app distribution can be used in the Firebase console and with Fastlane. But you can also distribute iOS and Android apps with the Firebase CLI or with the Gradle plugin. We understand how important automation is for you. And we want to give you the choice and the flexibility to use Firebase app distribution with the tools that you're already familiar with. Let's take a look at the Gradle plugin and see how it works. So going back to that example, when we had one star reviews and customers didn't like a certain feature of the app, how could we have used app distribution to get ahead of that feedback? Let's check out a demo. So here, I'm on the Firebase console for my app. I've already distributed two versions of my app to testers using Firebase app distribution, but now I'm ready for version 1.2 because I'm releasing a new feature. So to distribute with the Gradle plugin, I'm in my build.gradle. The first thing I need to do is apply the plugin and add the dependency. Then. In the specific build variant, you can specify a Firebase app distribution block for the parameters that you care about. In this case, we're specifying a few parameters, including a service credentials file, which lets us authenticate, release notes to let testers know what's included in this new version, and groups and testers, the people who we want to receive a distribution of our app. So now that we're ready, we'll go to the command line and run a command. We're going to first assemble the debug version of our app and then run app distribution upload debug. 
So what it's doing is it will upload the debug version of my app to Firebase app distribution, and then make sure my release notes and testers are also included. I also want to point out that it doesn't have to be the debug command. App distribution is variant specific. We want to give you the flexibility to upload a Firebase app distribu distribution and have different parameters for different build types and product flavors. So it looks like it uploaded successfully. So let's go to the console and check it out. So if we refresh the page, we should see a new distribution for 1.2. And we do. We verify that it has the release notes and the right testers. And then if I'm a tester and I refresh my inbox, I should get an email. But in the meantime, let's look at a previous release. I would get an email looking like this, and I'd be able to open it on my mobile phone and start testing the app. And here, the email just came in. Can we go back to the slides? Awesome. So we successfully distributed our Android app. But I want to point out that we can distribute iOS apps, too, using the CLI tools. Using app distribution, you can address feedback before launch and ultimately be more confident that your app will work in the wild. Also, as you may have seen earlier in the keynote today, app distribution is now in public beta. So go to the console to get started. Now that we've tested our app, let's move on to validating its security. Think back to that example at the beginning of this talk. That's terrifying, right? If your app goes live, it's growing, it's met with initial success. But that growth and that success also invites additional scrutiny. We all want to get application security right, but this task can seem daunting. For the next few minutes, we're going to give a brief overview of the application level security model in Firebase and then show you how to use Firebase tools to validate the security of your app before going live. For many of you, this might be a refresher. But let's start with how to think about security for apps built on Firebase. Usually when you build an app, your mobile or web clients connect directly to services that you control. And then those services perform author authorization and authentication checks before they change or mutate data. But when you build an app with Firebase, we abstract much of that infrastructure away. So you don't need to think in terms or keep up with OS level or network level security. With Firebase, we ask only that you think in terms of application level security. But we still need to ensure that only authorized services, clients, and users are able to read or write the correct bits of data. So how do we secure those requests from untrusted client devices? The answer is, with security rules. Security rules are the tool used to define Author, whether or not authorization should be gr granted for requests to your database. We're going to walk through the tools that Firebase offers to help you learn, write, and test security rules. First, let's see an example of how security rules can be helpful. Let's say I'm working on my new game called Goldmine. In the game, users collect gold as they go through each gameplay. They also have the ability to compete against each other and place in a global scoreboard. Each of these data types, the users, the gameplay, the leaderboard, has a different security need. Let's dig deeper into the security need of users. So we want user records to be publicly readable, but user editable. This means that only the user themselves should be able to edit their own profile. Makes sense. So how can we enforce this using security rules? Well, writing rules can be complicated, especially if we've never done them before. This is where the security rules simulator comes in. The simulator is an in-browser playground that lets you safely experiment with security rules. You can simulate reads and writes without actually needing to modify your database or having to set up a development environment. Let's go to the console and see a demo of how this works. So here, we've started writing security rules for our app. The first thing we need to do 
is match a specific document. In this case, we're matching the user document. And then inside this block, we can write rules to match read and write operations. Let's think about reads first. We want reads to be, we want user profiles to be publicly readable. Anyone should be able to read it regardless of if they're logged in. So we're going to write a rule that's allow read if true. Pretty straightforward. Now let's move on to writes. So for writes, remember, we only want the user themselves, the user who is logged in, to be able to edit that profile. So let's try taking a stab at it. All right, given my limited security rules knowledge, I think this is right, but how do I validate it? Let's go to the simulator. So here in the simulator, I'm logged in as myself, Rebecca, and I'm trying to update Rob's profile. This shouldn't be allowed, so I'm going to click Run. And the simulator tells me that the write is denied. All right, that makes sense. So now let's try to edit my own profile. If I hit Run again, the write is allowed. This looks good, so I'm going to publish my rules and save them. Let's go back to the slides. So now, the security rules simulator is useful for learning and experimenting. But once you start building an app for production, you want to start developing, testing, and deploying rules following the same best practices you apply to the rest of your code base. And for that, we turn to the Firebase emulator suite. The Firebase emulator suite lets you run our production services on your local machine, including Cloud Firestore, Cloud Functions, Firebase Hosting, and the Firebase Real-Time Database. During the keynote, we saw how the emulator suite can be used for local development. But even more importantly, the emulator suite is essential for thorough testing. Running locally is super fast, it's free, and it doesn't introduce the risk that you'll in any way harm a running production application. Going back to my goldmine game, let's move on to securing the global leaderboard where users can post their best scores. Using rules, I'm trying to prevent fraud in this game by making sure that users can only share scores for games that they themselves played. And those scores need to match the official gameplay result. No spoofing. Let's use the Firebase emulator suite to validate this behavior with thorough integration tests. Let's switch over to the demo. Here in my IDE, I've started writing some integration tests for rules to secure that leaderboard. First, I'll start the local emulator suite with a single command using the Firebase CLI. With that, I have a local instance of Cloud Functions, Firestore, the real-time database, and Firebase hosting all running on my local machine. As you can see, each time I save my security rules, the emulator suite is noticing the change, picking them up, hot reloading those rules, and applying them to my databases. Now let's take a look at my tests. Compared to what the simulator is capable of, this is much more advanced. This is far more rigorous. This test, for example, will clear the Firestore database, bootstrap it with some gameplay data, and then I'll write a test that is going to check to see whether or not a user can share that result with a mismatched score. It passes. Great. But remember, when testing security, always test both code paths, both the access granted and the access denied. Think of this just like code coverage. If we test the if branch, we also need to test the else branch. Adding the complementary test and rerunning, we'll see that we've got a bug. It looks like I've got a typo in my security rule. I'll fix this typo, save my rules, 
the emulator suite will hot reload the change, and I'll rerun my test. All right, it passes. That's what the Firebase emulator suite is all about. Rigorous, comprehensive security testing for your apps before launch. Let's go back to the slides. So at this point, we've corrected all the problems with the initial launch. We're feeling confident. But how do we make sure we launch with confidence every single time? The answer is with automation. Automating lets us maintain stability and security without sacrificing velocity. Building great apps is hard. We've all got things to do. Speed matters. That is why all of these tools were built from the ground up with continuous integration in mind. We understand how important automation is for you and how important speed is for you, and we want to help you succeed. Let's see an example now of how you can integrate Firebase Test Lab, Firebase App Distribution, and the Emulator Suite together in your CI CD pipeline. So here we have an example continuous integration configuration. First, we'll need to download and install the command line tools for Firebase and Google Cloud. Next, we'll invoke our unit and integration tests using that Firebase emulator suite. This lets our security tests run locally, quickly, and in a safe, isolated environment. Running the tests in this way also ensures that the emulator suite is spun up fully before tests are run and cleanly shut down after running tests is complete. Then we can run our test lab robo test. In this example, we're testing it on two devices. If all of our tests pass, we deploy our changes to Firebase and distribute the latest version of our app to trusted testers using Firebase app distribution. If we wanted to, we could customize this further, doing things like distributing different app versions or variants to different tester channels. So let's summarize. We've built our app. We've tested it. We secured it. We've added automation. And now we're ready for launch. Remember. These app stability and security problems are preventable. Firebase is here to give you the tools you need so you can launch with ease and confidence, the first time and every time. Go back to your teams. Try these tools out. Let us know what feedback you have and how we can help you further. Thank you. That
please welcome onto stage Mayank Jain and Steve Wilbur. Hey, I'm Steve Wilbur. I'm the engineering manager for Firebase Remote Config. And I'm Mayank, the product manager for Remote Config. We're so excited to be here in Madrid to speak with you all today. It's so valuable for us to speak with you directly, to learn how you're using Firebase, and to get your feedback. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come be here. Yeah, today we'd like to talk to you about something which is such an important part of our day-to-day -day journey as developers, and can also cause a lot of trouble and stress at times. We have some tips for you that we think can ma make this experience of launching new features troublesome and worrisome. And with that, let me share a personal story with you all. So once upon a time, we had a small office in New Delhi on a third floor walk up, and it took 45 minutes just to get to the office. We had an amazing team of six developers, marketing folks, product manager, and a designer. And we were working on a recently, app, recently launched ride-sharing app. We were developing a rating and review feature, which had been heavily requested by our customers. And we all thought that this would be the needed feature that would build the trust in our ride-sharing community. I clearly remember the two-week sprint in which we were building, in which we, in which we were building the feature to, uh, to allow rating, uh, rating the rides in our ride-sharing app. This new feature was heavily requested. We all worked really hard in that dev sprint and did a lot of internal testing on it on as many devices as we could find. Eventually, we felt that we had a very good test coverage and we were ready to go live. We crossed our fingers and we hoped that this new feature would be loved by our customers and uploaded the builds to the app stores. That, that day, we felt really confident. The initial metrics looked really good and we could already see that customers had started, started using the feature. We started giving each other high fives, and the mood was jubilant. And we all thought that this would definitely be the deciding factor in bringing trust in our ride-sharing community, and that the cool hard cash would be flowing in the very next day. That evening, we packed our bags and went home in a celebratory mood. Well, when we all came back the next morning, things looked very different. Our app, was, our app rating was plummeting with a ton of one-star ratings and we had a bunch of angry customer complaints in our support channel. Worst, our order funnel was down by a full 15%, and it caught our entire team by a total surprise. I distinctly remember reading one of this App Store reviews. Thank you so much for the discount. I can't even open any rides on the app. What do I do with the discount? I wish I could give you zero stars. This is not something you want to read the first thing in the morning when you come to office, right? So what happened? Well, we, our team quickly went into a war room-like situation, and we realized that there was a fatal app crash that was happening repeatedly for most of our customers. And it seemed like we hadn't handled a very specific image fetch failure condition. It was so bad that our, our users were not able to open any rides. Looking at crash analytics, we found that there were so many internet, so many conditions caused due to low bandwidth internet that we had not even thought about testing our app with. And these low bandwidth internet conditions are now causing all of these fatal crashes. As more users got exposed to these builds, the problem got even worse. And we couldn't control it from spreading. The situation was getting out of control. We spent the next two full days and nights in office trying to work out on a possible fix. It took us more than 48 hours to become fully confident again that the fix would potentially work. And then the only available option for us was to actually send a hotfix upgrade, which took another one to two days to reach fully to our customers. As a result of responding to, you know, responding with delays to this critical bug, we not only lost a ton of hard-earned customers, but our CSAT and NPS took a nosedive. And we were forced to have some very uncomfortable conversations with some really annoyed investors. One of them even said, can't you handle even these simple launches? What are, what are you going to do with our funding? Those couple of weeks were the harshest experience our team had ever seen. I'm sure that everyone here today who's been building and launching new features for your app know that such a situation is a death nail for your product, that if you need three to four days to respond to a production emergency, you know you lost the opportunity. And with that, I would like to bring in Steve, 
who could show us some really cool, idea, cool ideas that could have worked for us. Steve? Well, thanks, Malik. Wow, that sounds like a really tough launch. Yeah. Wouldn't it have been so much nicer if Mayank and his team could have rolled out that new feature in a way that lets them stay in control of the experience that they are delivering? What if they could have tested that feature on a broader variety of devices and then only enabled it for a small portion of their customers? What if they could have monitored that new build in the wild and had the ability to roll that feature back if anything went wrong? What if they could have shipped with the confidence of knowing that they weren't going to end up with a wall of bad reviews on their app listing? Well, this is exactly why developers started trying some new app release workflows to solve some of these problems. So let's take a step back and look at some of the methods that developers have been trying. In the beginning, most developers just ship to the app stores, cross their fingers, and watch their metrics. You do as much internal testing as you could, but it wasn't uncommon that you would ship a major bug that impacted many of your customers. You would race to prepare a fix and then just hope that you could get an expedited review to stop the bleeding, like my uncle and his team experienced. And then came tools like Beta by Crashlytics and TestFlight. Those tools made it easier to deliver builds to your private beta testers, which would help you get more test coverage before you sent those builds out, those builds out to the app stores. But when it came time to release your app, you were still stuck hoping for the best. Next, the app stores introduced phased releases giving you the ability to slowly roll out a new version of your binary to your customers. And that helps a lot when it comes to minimizing the risk of shipping a new build. But there are still some major challenges to overcome. One challenge is that once a customer gets that app update, there's no way to downgrade them back to the previous experience. So you can minimize the number of customers that get exposed to a bad release. But for those that get it, they're stuck with it. Another challenge is that your team is probably trying to develop multiple features at the same time. And it can get really difficult to coordinate adding those features into a build of your app that you're going to ship to the app stores. And working around this can get really complicated, and it can lead to some anti-patterns, like working in long-lived feature branches or doing testing in one-off builds. Not only is it complicated, but it can slow down feature development because you're not able to easily get feedback from customers on the new feature that you're building. So some of you may already be starting to think about the answer to these problems. It's using a best practice called feature flags or feature switches. With feature flagging, you can keep all of your code on master, but turned off behind a feature flag. You can remotely turn that feature on for any set of customers that you wish. And you have the ability to turn it off if customers aren't getting the experience that you want to deliver. There's no need to wait for an App Store release, and there's no need to wait for your users to update the app on their device. As soon as you flip that switch, the feature goes out, or it can roll back immediately. Having your features behind a flag means that you've separated exposing new features from shipping a particular build of your app. And that gives us some huge wins, both in terms of developer productivity and delivering value to customers more quickly. Developers love it because it greatly simplifies their workflow. They can merge their code to master anytime they please knowing that it will be safely tucked away behind a feature flag until the time's right to expose it to customers. And the flexibility to choose when it's exposed makes it easy to get feedback early from your customers and to build something that they're really going to love. So you may be familiar with feature flagging, and maybe now you're wondering how you can get started using it in your app. The power of feature flagging that we've just been talking about could have saved Mayank's team from the wake of a bad launch that caused them so much distress. And experiences like those are what led Mayank and myself to start working on remote config. We wanted to make it super simple for anybody to launch features in their app with confidence. So let's take a look now at how you can use remote config to apply some of the concepts that we've been talking about. First, we'll take a look at how you can get remote config integrated into your app. You can think of remote config as a key value store that lives in the cloud. And we can use those values that we pull down to dynamically configure how the app will behave. Here's an example of how I'll make a call in our app to grab the configuration from remote config. As you can see, there are just a few lines of code, a few lines of code to get started. We'll make a fetch call to remote config to pull down the configuration. And then once we're ready to make use of those values, we'll call activate so that they're ready and available to the app. And this is how we'll use the flag once we've got it pulled down. Hopefully, no surprises here. We'll just grab the value from remote config 
and make use of it like a standard Boolean value. If it's true, we'll turn this new feature on for this customer, or if not, we'll just stick with the old behavior. So once we have our app coded up, then we can use remote config to enable that flag for internal testing. As we stabilize that feature, we'll expand our group of testers, and then we'll start a small percentage rollout, and we'll use Firebase to monitor how the release is going. We'll fix any issues that come up, and then we'll increase the percentage until the feature is completely rolled out. Let's check out a demo. OK. We're going to walk through releasing a new feature that allows reviewing a driver in a fictional ride sharing app called RideSpotter. That might sound like a familiar scenario. As we walk through, we'll see the steps that Malink and his team could have taken to have a relaxed and confident release. In the current version of RideSpotter, the app lets you see the driver that you're about to call, but there's no way to know what other riders think of that driver. So let's add that now. The first thing that we'll want to do is test the feature internally before we expose it to any customers. So let's set up a feature flag that will allow us to do that. We'll open up remote config, and we'll create the, the parameter that's going to be our feature flag. We'll call the parameter driver review enabled, and we're going to set the default value to false. That way we won't accidentally expose it before we're ready. Now we're ready to start making our feature available to our internal testers. We're going to use something called a user property from Google Analytics for Firebase. That's a key value pair that we can set in the client to give it a particular state, which remote config can then use to target the behavior to this particular app. In this case, we're going to use it to tag the username of the user that's in the app so that we can serve up this new, this new feature to a specific user. In remote config, we'll set up a new condition to enable our feature. And the condition is going to make use of a user property called username. We've already coded up our app so that when the user logs into the app, we'll set the value of username. So let's call that condition member of dev team. And we'll say it applies if that user property called username contains swilber at google.com. And now that we have that condition set up, we'll say if member of dev team is true, then we'll enable the feature. And once we publish that change, it's automatically live in our app. And with that, we'll be able to start doing internal testing of our feature. As you can see, our driver review feature is now visible in the app for testing. OK, so let's fast forward in time a little bit. And the dev team has stabilized the feature a bit, and they want to get some more eyes on it. A great next step at this point is to open up the feature for dog fooding for anybody at the company to take a look and test it. So let's create a new condition. And we'll call this one company employee. And we'll have this one apply if that username contains any at google.com email address. And we'll set that one to true as well to start our dog food. OK, so we've tested our feature, and we're feeling pretty good about it. It's time to release it out to our customers. Now, thinking back to my own story, this is where things got a little iffy. But we're going to do a couple of things differently. We're going to start by exposing that feature to just a small portion of our customers. And since we're using remote config, we're going to have the ability to turn the feature off if anything goes wrong. And so with that in mind, we can confidently ship this build out to the app stores. With our build out, now let's go back to remote config, and we'll create a new condition to start the rollout. We'll call that condition driver review rollout. And we're going to say this one applies if the user is in a random percentile. And we'll start with just 1%. That'll be a nice, slow start to rolling out our feature. If anything at all goes wrong, it'll be contained just 1% of our user base. And once we publish our changes, we've begun our rollout. So, now that our feature's out in the wild, we definitely want to start monitoring it more closely. So let's switch over to Crashlytics to check on the stability of our new feature. Sure enough, it looks like there's a new bug that's popped up here. So let's dig in by clicking on this issue. OK, if we look at this stack trace, I think we can see that fetching new images for our review feature is failing for some customers, and that's causing the app to crash. 
So now that I've identified that this new problem is caused by my feature, I'm going to roll it back so that I can limit the impact of this bug. I'll switch back over to remote config. I'll go to my feature flag. And I'm going to set it to false for all of my production users. I'll hit publish. And just like that, I've gotten all of my users back into a good state. My uncle, wouldn't it have been amazing if you could have done this during your launch? Absolutely. Yeah, now I'll go create a fix for this bug, and I'll get it shipped out with my next release. So let's imagine that we've gotten that fix shipped, and now we're ready to start our rollout once again. Let's go back to our feature flag, and we'll again set it to true. And then we'll hit publish. And with that, we've restarted our 1% rollout. From here, we'll slowly ramp up the exposure of our feature by increasing the value of that percentile condition. We'll continue to monitor the health of our launch in Firebase as we ramp it up, and eventually we'll get to 100% of our customer base. And with that, our feature will be shipped, and it's time to celebrate. Switch back to slides. Back to slides, please. So in this scenario, we did a straightforward percentage rollout. But I want to highlight a couple of other powerful options that Remote Config can help you with. Sometimes it can be helpful to do a region-based rollout. For example, maybe that new feature that you're building is only available in Spain to start. Or you might want to target a Firebase audience. For example, all of your users that have made uh, purchases in your app in the past. Remote Config can allow you to target these groups and even mix it with a percentage condition so that you can do, apply the same rigor to these targeted types of rollouts. OK, so those are some tips on how you can use remote config for a rollout. But we've been working on some pretty exciting new stuff. Mayank, can you show us? Absolutely. Thank you. Wow, Steve. Where were you when we were building a ride-sharing app? We could have certainly used that expertise of feature flagging. In fact, feature flags and percentage rollouts in remote config have received so much love from developers that a couple of months ago, our team decided to got together and make this experience of shipping new features even simpler and even more powerful. I would like to give you all today a sneak peek of what our team has been building. We call it feature rollouts. It combines the power of products you already love and use every day in your life, Google, Google Analytics, Remote Config, and Crash Analytics. It makes it a whole lot easier to roll out new features while constantly monitoring their stability metrics. So let's go back in time and assume that my team was building the ride-sharing app with feature rollouts in remote config and see how we could have benefited from the best practices that Steve just described. So as Steve, as Steve mentioned, we could have used remote config and created a new feature with the needed config parameters for the rating and review feature. And notice how cleanly all the parameters are now organized on the remote config UI. And with feature rollouts, it takes just one, just few clicks to set up both an internal testing track and a production track, something which required quite a bit of conditions in remote config. And since feature rollouts is built on top of remote config, it manages all of that complexity for you under the hood. And the percentage rollouts are now extremely simple to manage. Roll forward or roll back in just one click, instantaneously. And this is probably the best feature I love about feature rollouts. You can clearly see your crash-free users, how is that trending for your overall app as compared to your users who are just exposed to this feature. This information previously was very hard to get in Firebase and is now a huge statistical data point for you to take the next probable action, which in this case looks like a potential rollback. And with the change history for all of the rollout, your team can now collaboratively work together in launching anything you are building. We've built feature rollouts on battle-tested remote config, which is already serving more than 3 billion app instances per day, and is completely free for you to use. With remote config and feature rollouts, we are trying to remove the guesswork needed in launching new features consistently, reliably, and confidently every time. You no longer need to build and maintain complex feature flagging systems for yourself. Rather, just focus on building the best apps. If you're interested in developing with feature rollouts in remote config, I'm happy to share that we are opening up our beta program today. Scan this link or open this link. Scan this QR code or open this link on your phones right now and reserve your spot. 
We can't wait to see what you'll build and launch with remote config and feature rollouts. We'd love to have you try out the beta of feature rollouts, but there will only be a limited number of spots to start. So zoom in, scan the QR code, or go to the URL and sign up for access to our beta. Feel free to reach out to either of us on Twitter if you want to chat about remote config or anything Firebase. And if you have any questions after the session, my uncle and I'll be back in the Ask Firebase area. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
please welcome onto stage Michael Reed and Shobit Chu. Hi, folks. Thanks for coming. We're here to talk about Crashlytics and how Crashlytics can help you move quickly, even as your app is scaling. I'm Mike Reed. I'm a developer on the Crashlytics product. And hi, I'm Shobit Chug. I'm product manager for Crashlytics. To compete, you must move fast. You must release features as fast as your competitors. The stakes are high. Now, if you're a fast-growing app, you might remember the early days. You know, when you just started off, and uh, you started with an idea, you ran some experiments, you started to get some initial traction. And then the idea started to catch. You got more users, more funding, more revenue. You hired a bigger team. But with this growth comes competition and you're no longer the only one in the market. So to compete, you must keep moving fast. But as you grow, you often become more risk averse. And we found four factors related to app stability that cause teams to slow down as they scale. Let's look into them. First of all, even smaller issues can affect a lot of users. Crashes have a real downside. We have found that when leaving one-star reviews, Google Play users often mention stability issues or bugs. And so you might be tempted to just slow down as a result and try to fix every single issue. How do you make sure you keep an eye on important issues and keep moving fast? Second, you face more edge cases. Once you have more functionality, more complex code base, so many users and so many variety of devices, a lot of edge cases start to emerge. You might have never seen these edge cases when you were building the app, when you were testing it. So how do you make sure you quickly triage, reproduce, and fix these edge cases so that you can keep moving fast. Third, your effort to just release and monitor goes up dramatically. I mean, you might spend a lot of time just keeping an eye on your tests, your alpha, beta, gamma, theta, production releases. And it, it could become very onerous. So how do you make sure it does not become onerous and you keep moving fast? And last but not least, the number and variety of issues that you face that impact your app stability increases. Your issue list could look like an endless to-do list, which is what my days look like most of the days. But let's talk about Crashlytics instead. So how do you make sure you don't react to crashes one by one, but instead systematically start addressing root causes so that you can keep moving fast? So here we are. You've grown. You're a successful app, but has started to move slowly. Now, you might think of Crashlytics as a place where you come to see how bad things really are. But what if, what if you used it as a tool to ship faster? Using examples from real customers, we're going to tell you how to do just that. Let's begin the first topic. So the first problem, your tolerance for shipping bugs to customers for instability has decreased. Because even small issues can affect a lot of users. But sometimes, in spite of all your code reviews, testing, you might ship a version to production that might start crashing. And you don't want negative app reviews or customer support tickets to be your first sign that something's really broken. Instead, you want to know immediately if any issue has become a major concern so you can do something about it. Fix the code, turn off an experiment, roll back the release, do something about it. 
But also, since you have so many different issues to deal with, so many different crashes, you want to be notified just at the right time. So for example, for low and medium priority issues, you might just want to monitor passively. But for high priority issues, you might, might want to get notified immediately, even get paged if needed. Crashlytics offers three kinds of alerts that maps to this priority order. There's new issue alerts, which occur when a new type of crash occurs for the first time. This is low priority at this time. We've just seen the crash for the first time. Then there's regression issues. You fixed a bug, marked it as closed, and then you ship a new release, and again, the app starts crashing in a new version. Low to medium priority. And then there's velocity alerts, which are a true signal that there's something significant wrong in your app. Let's see how they work. So what we're doing is Crashlytics is monitoring every single issue in your dashboard to see what percentage of user sessions it is affecting. When a crash starts to affect more than a certain percentage of users, we raise up a velocity alert. And by default, this percentage is set to 1%. So that's a significant issue. Earlier this year, we also launched the ability to fine-tune this threshold so that you can change it based on your app size, your workflow, your particular needs. Now let's see how a customer uses these alerts to keep moving fast. Swiggy is one of India's largest food delivery services. And if the app crashes, the users cannot order food. And Swiggy loses money. Speaking of food, I'm starting to get a little hungry. Um, but the Swiggy team wants to know about all issues. But they want to focus on the most impactful issues first. So in order to do that, they connected velocity alerts to PagerDuty and Jira, which are out-of-the-box integrations that Firebase offers. This way, if something is truly wrong, the on-call person will be notified, will be woken up in the middle of the night if necessary, and they will have a Jira issue looking for them to investigate. In, ad in addition, Swiggy also wanted to make sure that their engineers were kept in the loop for lower priority issues. So that is why they connected new issues as well as regression alerts to rooms in Slack. And they created uh, separate rooms for their iOS and Android teams so that they can pa passively monitor, triage, and pick up any crashes, especially if it's related to code they own and they might have changed recently. This allows Swiggy to keep shipping fast with the confidence that they'll be notified in the right manner for high priority crashes as well as for low priority crashes. Now that was keeping an eye on issues, even as you ship fast. To tell you about edge cases, here is my teammate, Mike Reed. Thanks, Shobit. So let me make sure I get this straight. The velocity alerts become pages, and the new issues go to the Slack room. Y you catch on fast, Mike. Okay. I think for my temperament, I should hang out in the Slack room. I don't like to be woken up at night. As long as you don't send me any messages, okay. you're cool. OK, deal. Handling edge cases. So as your user base grows, they're going to experience bugs that you did not discover during development. We've all heard this joke, right? Works fine on my machine, but usually it's not a joke, right? And I bet we've all spent countless hours trying to debug issues without enough information. And I know I found myself wishing I could meet my end users. I'd ask them questions. What were you doing? What steps had you taken prior to the crash? Were there items in your shopping cart? But I can't meet every end user, and I can't ask them all these questions. So how am I going to debug the issue? Well, we want to know what caused the crash, and we can see this through the stack trace, right? It shows us which line of code caused the crash. But stack traces aren't the whole story. What's also important is the state of the application and the steps taken leading up to the crash. And Crashlytics can help gather this data. 
So we have three tools that help developers capture state and sequence of application usage prior to a crash. So let's see how we can use these tools to find and fix edge cases quickly. So back to our questions for the end user. One of them was, did you have items in your shopping cart? And wouldn't it be nice if we could capture this information and enhance our crash reports by adding it to our crash reports and sending it to our server at crash time? Well, that's a leading question, a trick question, because we can do that, you can do that. It's a feature Crashlytics calls custom keys. And here we see how easy it is to do. It's a function, you call the function, you name your key, and you programmatically set a value for that key. And our SDK will capture these key value pairs and send them to our server with your next crash. So, okay, cool. We see it's easy to instrument the code. Where does the data go? Well, the key value pairs are visible right next to your stack trace. So now at crash time, no more regrets that you can't meet all of your end users and ask them 100 questions because we've captured custom application state of your choosing and it's available at crash time. But how about logs? Often we do our best debugging with logs, but they're usually a luxury available at development time right in your development machine. Now that's not the case when you're using Crashlytics because since the beginning of the product, we have supported custom logging. And here's how it's done. It's a one-liner. You call a function and you provide your log string and that log is uploaded just like custom keys with the next crash to our servers. And where are these logs available? Well, like custom keys, they're next to your stack trace. So now you can have your application state you can have your custom logs, and just as always, you get your stack traces too. So debugging these edge case, hard to reproduce bugs is getting a little bit easier. But suppose you're experiencing crashes and you haven't yet instrumented your code with custom keys or custom logs. Well, if you integrate your Google Analytics SDK with Crashlytics, we can capture automatically predefined analytics events. We call them breadcrumbs. And with no code modification at all, they're captured and they show the actions taken prior to the crash. Now, if you're using Google Analytics, you've probably already defined custom events with finer details specific to your application. And these are also captured. And like custom keys and like customs logs, they're shipped to our server with the next crash. And the theme repeats. Next to your stack trace, you'll also find your Google Analytics events. And you can use these breadcrumbs to understand the events which led up to the crash. For example, maybe you have an event which shows the provisioning of a shopping cart, and maybe you have a custom key which shows how many items were added to that shopping cart. So now rather than imagining and reasoning what might have occurred prior to a crash, you can do what some of our other users do. They go to the device locker, they grab a device, and they use the custom keys and the custom logs and the Google Analytics breadcrumbs to repeat the steps that the user took prior to the crash and it helps them reproduce these bugs. So I hope you'll give it a try. Instrument your code, custom keys, add custom logs, and integrate your Google Analytics SDK with the Crashlytics, and then we can help with these debugging efforts. So, breadcrumbs. I, I mentioned I was feeling a little hungry earlier, and those breadcrumbs sound really yummy right now. Can you get me some of those? I'll hook you up. I will, I will bake you a loaf of bread. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Now, even with all these tools, you may still have a fair amount of manual work to do, which you could automate. And we could try to tell you how to automate it, but why? Why not bring on stage a customer who has automated their release processes? So please join me in welcoming Mattis, product manager for the release team at Spotify. Hi. All right, hi. My name is Matthias Kastigren. I'm the product owner of the Spotify release team. And we are the ones responsible for releasing new versions of the Spotify app for Android and iOS. And I will share a little bit about how our journey has been and how we use Crashlytics. But I wanted to start with just sharing some numbers just to set the scale. 
And I think the first one may be a bit surprising to some of you, and that is that there are more than 65 teams that contribute to the main Spotify app. Each platform has more than a million lines of code. We release new mobile releases every week for both Android and iOS. And of course, when we do it, that version is rolled out to more than 200 million monthly active users. So I would say our biggest challenge in the release team is to do all this in a way that isn't stressful, either for us as the release team or for our developers. So the release team was started three years ago. And one of the first things we did was we did an inventory of all the manual steps required to release our app. And this is an actual picture from that meeting. We basically filled an entire whiteboard with all the things you had to do, from signing and uploading nightly builds to monitoring tests, pinging teams with open bugs, sending status emails, uh, all those things. And then over time, we started automating these things one by one. But one of the really big manual steps eluded us for a long time, and that was crash monitoring. So we used Fabric for this, and for a long time, whoever was the release manager had to log in to, to Fabric pretty much every day to look, see if there were any new crashes on our alpha or beta builds. And of course, this was tedious. But it was also stressful, because this was one of the few times where you could kind of mess up as the release manager. Maybe you were busy, you were fighting other fires, you forgot to look at Fabric for one day, two day. Well, maybe there was a big crash. And maybe we lost two days of debugging, had to cancel the release or something. So that was a big issue. And that is why we were really excited last year when we could go over to Firebase Crashlytics. And there was exactly one feature that I was really, really eager to start using. And that was crash data in BigQuery. That had been my dream feature ever since the release team was formed. And a quick note here when we talk about big data is that in order to protect the privacy of our users, we always disable data sharing for all the crash data we collect. But anyway, having direct access to the crash data has been a game changer for us in the release team. We let Crashlytics handle the gathering, the grouping of crashes, the visualization of individual crashes. But apart from that, our automatic tooling now does everything. The release manager never has to log in to Firebase. Our tooling will monitor incoming crashes for alpha and beta builds. We have exact rules for when to file tickets. And we can even use the stack trace to assign those tickets to the right teams. And I want to end with a quick screenshot of what we're working on right now. And that is to take the crash data from Crashlytics and actually integrate it into our own tools. So this is a, a screenshot of uh, our own tooling where you can list the crashes for one specific team. And it is shown in the same tool where that team would look at backend requests or test results. And to me, that is the power of Crashlytics in Firebase. You have a UI with a lot of really powerful features that works for most apps and most use cases. But as you grow, you can start writing your own tooling and take full control of the automation in any way you like. Anyway, that is what I have. Thanks for having me. I included my ancient Twitter handle. I haven't used it in years. But feel free to reach out if you want to discuss releasing a scale. Uh, thanks for having me. Back to Mike. Thanks, Mattis. I love your app. In fact, I use it all day long. Identifying broader trends. What do we mean when we talk about broader trends in the context of app stability and app quality? Well, as we know, the landing page for Crashlytics shows crashes sorted by impact, highest to lowest. But is fixing crashes one by one, top to bottom, necessarily the only way to pursue your bugs? Maybe not. It's a good start, but you may be missing an important quality signal if it's the only way you visualize your crash data and the only way you prioritize which bugs to fix. So if not this ordered list, then what? You have all this data. How can you best visualize it? You've got pie charts and line graphs. Now, I'm no data scientist, 
but I believe that's a lampshade. It's a lampshade, right? Okay, this is where BigQuery and Data Studio can come in. Firebase products allow you to export your data to BigQuery, and BigQuery lets you run custom queries on that data. And it also enables integrations into in-house custom workflows, as Mattis just showed us. Now, Data Studio is a dashboard and reports builder, which is backed by your BigQuery data. So you get a data warehouse and a UI builder provisioned for you with just a few clicks. And this is the BigQuery IDE, and as developers, you're going to feel quite at home there. You write SQL queries, and they're linted, and they're validated real time against the Crashlytics schema. But most importantly, you'll have the opportunity to run ad hoc queries on your data in a custom manner. And so that's great. You can write SQL queries. I can write SQL queries. But how do we present our learnings to our teammates? Well, that's where I would use Data Studio. With Data Studio, you can build visualizations, and you build them graphically using an IDE. And you'll enjoy all the features you've come to appreciate from Google Docs, like real-time collaboration and version history and the like. And Crashlytics has helped you get started. So we've created this template. And you can clone it, and then you connect it to your BigQuery data source. And once you've cloned it, you're dropped into this IDE. And you start with a real dashboard backed by your real data. And in fact, it looks a lot like the Crashlytics user interface. But it's easy to customize. You can add new visualizations. You can choose charts from the pull down. Once you've chosen your charts, you can populate them with data by choosing dimensions and metrics graphically from the user interface shown on the right. And there's a style panel there so you can round your corners and touch up your color schemes. And there we have it. So we've added a pie chart. And it shows that, in this case, 21% of our crashes are caused by the embarrassing null pointer exception. So we have some friends who develop an app. They have a nice large user base. And they use the default issue list, as we all do. But they were also interested if there were broader app quality issues spanning across their issues. And they found one by using Data Studio and applying the technique we just talked about. They added a pie chart. And it showed their issues grouped by exception type. And there was a surprise waiting for them. More than half of their issues were caused by out-of-memory exceptions. Now, they knew their app was using memory, of course, but they didn't know how much. And they were allocating heaps and maps and lists and queues, you name it, and it all adds up. And by using BigQuery and Data Studio, they could visualize the impact. So what would you do if you learned that half your crashes were caused by memory usage? Well, our friends, rather than fixing issues one by one top to bottom, they switched focus and they targeted reducing their memory usage. They did a few targeted sprints focused solely on reducing the memory footprint, and then they were back on task. So with BigQuery and Data Studio, you can perform custom queries, and you can visualize your data and perhaps uncover problems that wouldn't be apparent in their traditional view of independent issues. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. I, I really like the lampshade. <laughs> and, and the one in purple, it matches my shirt perfectly. So can you, can, can you get me one of those? I, I can hook you up. Thank you. I'll get you. Thank you. Cool. So to wrap up, we're here to tell you that there's no need to sacrifice your development velocity, how quickly you ship, even as your app grows. With Crashlytics, you can keep an eye on important issues via notifications, so you can ship faster with confidence. You can reproduce and fix edge cases faster. You can start to automate release monitoring. And you can identify and act on broader trends so you can go and fix your crashes faster. I'm Shobit. And I'm Mike Reed. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you have any questions, we will be in the Ask Firebase area back over there somewhere. I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the summit and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks.
please welcome onto stage Ali Koshefian, Christina Holland and Stella Gaitini. Hello everyone. I want to start with a question. How many of you have ever heard complaints that your app is slow? All right. And how many of you immediately knew what to do about it? All right. So this is exactly what we're here to talk about today. I'm Stella Gaidani. I'm the product manager for Firebase Performance Monitoring. I'm Christina Holland. I work on the Firebase JS core team. And I'm Ali Kajafian, and I'm a software engineer on Firebase. So let's talk about slow. What do we mean by an app being slow? Well, there are two perspectives. From our perspective, as web developers, when we think about an app being slow, we think about many different things. We think about page load times. We think about runtime slowness. However, from our user's perspective, this is all the same. The app is slow. And a slow app means that our users are sad because they're having a frustrating experience on our site. So we want our users to be happy. And what do we do? We start to think about performance. And the first thing that comes to mind is we're starting to look for things to cut. And this is a great place to start. Because more often than not, there are things that might not be serving us or our users and are slowing our site down. However, at some point, we get to this trade-off. We have a feature that is helpful, adds value to our users, but it is impacting our performance. We might at that point say, well, it is what it is. This is the functionality I want to deliver to my users, so I have to take the performance hit. However, we think there is a better way. What if, instead of thinking about performance as this trade-off between the features we want to have and the speed, we think about performance as a game of Tetris, where we think about how to line up our features in the most optimal way to minimize their impact on our site's performance. So how do we do that? The first step is to understand what our users are experiencing. And this is where Firebase Performance Monitoring comes in. Firebase Performance Monitoring will tell you what your users are actually experiencing when they're coming on your site. Then we will think about how to only download the bare minimum of code that we need to put data on the page, and then bring the list later as we need it. Finally, we will close the loop, and we will check how the changes that we're making are impacting our site's performance. Are things looking like they're getting better? Is it the same? Did we make anything worse? We want to show how to do all of this in action. And we have prepared a demo to show you exactly that. I'm going to turn it over to Christina, who's going to walk us through our demo app. Christina? Thanks, Stella. Can we get the demo up? So here we have a simple stock app. It has a list of popular stocks that update every minute for, say, the casual day trader. For this demo, I just uh, loaded a bunch of old stock data into Firestore. So it's just replaying August 28th over and over again. So don't use this data to make any stock trading decisions. So we have a home page that anyone can see without logging in that has the most popular stocks. And maybe in the future, you add a feature where you let people log in, and they can create their own custom lists. But this home page is open to the public. So we've got our app. We put it up. And we get lots of hits, which is great. And like a responsible developer, we're going to check in with our channels for user feedback. And we're going to ask the users, what do you think? Well, I played around with this app. And I have to say, the app feels slow. So the developer is going to want to ask, slow how? Is it slow initial page load and rendering? Is it slow data fetching? Or does the UI feel sluggish and unresponsive? I don't know. It just feels a bit slow. So can you please fix it? So that's frustrating feedback, because it runs fast enough on my machine. So how can I figure out what the users are seeing? This is where Firebase performance monitoring comes in. Stella? So let's see what Firebase performance monitoring can do for us. And let's go back to the slides now. Excellent. So Firebase performance monitoring is a real user monitoring tool. What this means is that it shows you how your users are actually experiencing your app out in the wild. 
you have users coming on your site from different devices, from different countries, on different connection speed, their experience on your site might be very different based on those conditions. So the way that Fireperf helps you understand what is going on is by showing you the full distribution. Instead of just providing you with one data point, let's say the median or the 95th percentile, which is very important because we want to understand how our app is doing at its worst. But it also shows you the full distribution of, let's say, the load times for your users. So you can see how many of your users are on the happy side of the curve. That means they have fast load times and a good experience on your side. And how many of your users are on the other side? They're on the long tail of users who are experiencing long load times, are frustrated, and these are the users that you want to be really thinking about. So, so far I talked about page load time, and this is a metric that is very common when we're thinking about performance. But Fireperf also gives you additional user-centered metrics. The reason is that page load time by itself can be a bit misleading because, for example, you can see how long it takes for, the full app, for your full page to load, but if your users are seeing useful information in the meantime, they might not be noticing any delays. So let's see what Fireperf shows you. It gives you some metrics such as the first contentful paint, which is the time that it takes for the first content to show up on your page. And it also shows you the first input delay, which is the time that it takes for your site to respond to the first action that your users take on your site. So these metrics, in addition to, of course, page load time, will give you a more complete picture about what your users are actually experiencing. So now, I want to turn it over to Ali, who's going to first tell us how to integrate Firebase Performance Monitoring to our app. And then he will show us what the Fireperf console can tell us about the demo app, so we can understand what is going on there. Thank you, Sela. Integrating with Firebase Performance Monitoring can be as easy as dropping a few lines of code in the HTML page, or if you have a build system in place, you can download and install the NPM package. Now let's go to the console and see what the developer of the stock app sees. Out of the box, Firebase Performance captures uh, metrics related to the page load of our application. This is very helpful if, to find out if any of the pages are running actually a little bit slow. Also, as we will see later, we capture all the network calls made from the web app, which is helpful in finding out if any of those calls are taking too long. So let's start by going to the page load table and check out the main page of the application. This is the URL of my app. Star star means all pages under this pattern. We currently only have one page. So let's go here. And this is the full distribution of all the metrics associated with the page load. Let's check out a few of them. For example, first content full paint, the median is over three seconds, and the 95th percentile is a little bit shy of five. The load event end, which is basically the time it takes the page to load all the assets. The median is around three seconds, but there's a long tail of users who experience much longer load times, as high as around 30 something seconds. All of this is good to know, but what we are really, really interested in is to find out how long it takes the users to start seeing the stock data. Right? And this is very specific to this app. In other apps, it could be other custom metrics that we are interested in. So can we customize Fireperf to capture such um, custom metrics? Yes. We can use custom traces and custom metrics to uh, capture whatever we are interested in. In this case, as I said, we are interested in the duration between the navigation start until we load the initial stock data. Let's call it initial data load time. Once the developer of the stock app applies the necessary modifications, the initial data load time will start showing up in the durations table. Let's take a look. This is the full view of the data, and this is the distribution. As you can see, the median is around 4.4 4, 4 seconds, but there is a lot of users who experience much longer load times, up to 38 seconds, which is a long time. How can we find more information about these users? One of the features of Firebase Performance is that it allows you to dissect the data by various attributes, such as browser, country, so on and so forth. 
This is very helpful if you want to find out if any, of, if any segment of the users are experiencing the app differently. For example, if my app does not render well on a certain browser, or if my page loads very, uh, takes a long time to load in a certain country or certain region. A particularly uh, interesting one is the effective connection type. Effective connection type allows us to see if there is any difference between the experience of users on the faster connections with the slower ones. Let's see what we can learn here. First of all, there are the possible values are 4G, 3G, 2G, and slow 2G. 4G capturing all the users on faster networks. And these all come directly from the navigator API of the browser. It seems like around 60% of my users are on faster networks, which basically means that 40% of them are not. And the users on faster networks are only taking a few seconds to start seeing the data, but the users on slower networks are taking much, much longer. This must be painful. What could be the reason? Usually, when there is a significant difference between the experience of users on faster or slower networks, the culprit is a network call which is taking too long. So let's see if this is the case in here. We can do that by going to the network tab. And as you can see, we capture all the networks made from the web app. So let's first filter by the page that we are interested in. We can change the duration. And I'm going to change the sort to response time so the longest call appears on the top. The longest one happens to be firebase.bundle.js. Sounds familiar. It's actually the package which includes all the code from Firebase JS SDK. So here, the response time, the median, is 1.75 seconds. But there is a long tail of users who take up to 30 seconds to load this package. And this makes sense because the payload size is 210 kilobytes. It's a large package. It must be painful to download this package on slower connections. Let's confirm that by going to the full data view of response time, see the breakdown by the effective connection type, and yes, users on slow connections are taking a very long time to download this. So we are downloading a large package, and this is affecting the experience of our users on slower connections. Now, equipped with this insight, let's see how we can fix it. So it looks like we need to cut some code. The good news is that cutting code doesn't necessarily mean sacrificing functionality. The first thing we should check is if there is some code we're sending down to the user that we don't need to be. So how might that happen? If we open up the console, you might see this warning message that says we should only be importing the Firebase components we need. So that's a good place to start. If we take a look at the code, the first line is import Firebase from Firebase. Pretty standard. And I'm going to tell you ahead of time, this is where the problem is. But let's step through the app and just see how it works. So after we import Firebase, the next step is to subscribe to Firestore. And then when we get the Firestore data back, we'll immediately render it for the user. What the code looks like is that after importing Firebase, we initialize the app. And then just this one line gets performance started. That's all you need. Then we'll subscribe to Firestore. Once the data comes back, we'll render the page with it. Uh, just so you know, there's nothing magical inside the subscribe to Firestore function. It's a simple subscription to a Firestore collection called Current using on snapshot. Every time a snapshot comes back, we format it and render it. The first time we get some data, we will log this initial data load time custom metric. That's how we got it into the dashboard. So. The first line is the problem, because we are importing all of Firebase, including components such as auth and storage, which we're not even using in this app. Instead, let's just import the components we need. So we're going to import the Firebase core app, which is very small, and then Firestore, of course, and then performance to measure what we're doing. So having made just that one change from importing Firebase to importing these components, let's see how it performs. I'm going to put up a demo of the two apps side by side. On the left is our original app, and on the right is importing just the components we need. And this is throttled to 3G, because that's the users that are having problems. 
And it looks like we've got a speed improvement. So that's pretty encouraging. But again, works on my machine is not good enough. So we need to get this out to the users. And then we're going to check the dashboard again to see how it's performing for them. Let's take another look at firebase.bundle.js and how it was affected by the changes that we made. So here it is. Let's take a closer look. The median is down to around one second, which is good. But still, we have a long tail of users who are experiencing some delay. And the 95th percentile is over 16 seconds. Improved, but still not that good. And here is the payload size. We have cut our payload size to less than half. Great. Let's see how this is affecting the initial uh, data load. We go back to the on device tab, and this is initial data load time. This is the time view of our data. The x axis is time. The bottom of the blue area is the fifth percentile, and the top is the 95th percentile. The dark blue line is the median. Pay attention to how we shaved off the 95th percentile from 30 something seconds to 20 something seconds. This is when we made the change. So, this is great, a lot of improvement. Let's focus on the latest version of the app. We can see that the median is around three seconds, but the long tail is still here, and it's taking some of our users more than 23 seconds to start seeing the data. So, we made improvement but some, some of our users are still suffering, which begs the question, can we do even better? So yes, I think we can do better for our users. So if the first easy win is to cut out any large chunks of code that you're not using, the second is to see if there's any large chunks of code we can bring in later. As you can see, we cut the bundle size down by a half, which is great. What if we could effectively cut it down to zero? What if we could get them their whole page before we have downloaded any of the Firebase libraries. So you might be thinking, OK, lazy loading. I know how that works. We're going to render as much of the page as we can before we get the data. And where we don't have data, we're going to put placeholders and spinners. But no, because from the user's point of view, a page that has spinners on it is a page that is not done. Let's do better for them. Let's get them a complete page with all the stock data before we've downloaded any of the Firebase libraries. Is that even possible? Well, I don't know how many of you know this, but uh, Firestore has a REST API. That means we can hit a REST endpoint with HTTP GET and get JSON data directly from Firestore. So what's that look like? Here's a typical URL that will hit the Firestore REST endpoint and get data from a collection named current. That's our stock data. So if I was to curl, I get the JSON data for all our stocks. So I can use that and render the page. But this is a stock app, so users are going to want their real-time updates. And the Firestore library makes that really convenient. And it's a lot more cumbersome with just REST. So is there some way we can get the best of both worlds? Yeah, so we're going to look at our game plan. We're going to first fetch the REST data very fast, render the data immediately. So now the user has a complete page, and they're happily looking at their stocks. And only then will we dynamically import Firebase components in the background. And once they've downloaded, we'll subscribe to Firestore. And they'll have their real-time updates before even the first minute refresh is up. So what that looks like is let's review. We originally imported all of Firebase. Then we imported just the components we need. Now we're importing nothing from the Firebase library initially. Instead, we're going to put that URL in a variable. And our very first step will be to Use the native browser fetch to fetch from that URL. We'll get JSON data, format it, and we've got the data. So we can log the initial data load time metric, render the page. So when we have a happy user looking at a complete page, and only now will we dynamically import Firebase. Once that's downloaded, we'll initialize the app, get performance started, subscribe to Firebase, and swap in that live data 
without the user even knowing. So there's nothing magical about this dynamic Firebase import. It is just three import statements to import those three libraries we imported earlier, and then returns a promise. Imports not supported in older browsers. So if you're supporting older browsers, know that you will need to use a polyfill. So we've got that plan going. Let's see how it plays out. I'm going to demo three apps now. On the left is going to be our original. In the middle is going to be just the components we need. And on the right is going to be our REST and dynamic import, which finished loading before I even explained what it was. So that's pretty fast. So that's a pretty good progression. You can be pretty excited about that. <laughs> but again, I just checked this on my local machine. So that's not good enough, right? We've got to get it out to the users, and we're going to check the Firebase performance dashboard to see if they're seeing this great improvement. All right, thank you, Christina. Now, let's check out the initial data a little time again. So in the first set of modifications, we shaved off the 95th percentile from 30-something seconds to 20-something seconds. With our recent changes, the 95th percentile is around a few seconds only. Let's focus on the latest version. All right. So the distribution shows us that the median is around one and a half seconds, and the 95th percentile is less than five seconds, which means that for the vast majority of our users, the app and the data loads in, in a few seconds, which means that the vast majority of our users are happy ones. So that's a pretty great outcome. Can we have the slides? So you've seen some tips to make your web app a little faster. Can we do even better? Like, for example, we provide you with the ability to import just the components you need, such as auth and Firestore database and storage. What if we could modularize even farther, and we could provide you with just the methods you need? For example, on a lot of home pages, you just want to know if a user's logged in or not. So you just need get current user without bringing in the rest of the auth library. Is that something we can do? Well, that is a great suggestion. Thanks for, thanks for suggesting it. And we are definitely looking into how we can get something like that to you. So keep an eye out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ali and Christina, for making our demo app users very happy. So our key takeaway from today is how you can use Firebase performance monitoring to understand what your user's experience is like, and then start thinking about how you can only download the bare minimum to get your data on the page, and then bring in the rest later as you need it. Our mission here at Firebase is to help all of you succeed by providing you with the best tools to help you build amazing user experiences. We hope today you got some helpful tips on how to speed up your apps using Firebase. This is our GitHub repo if you want to check out the code that we use for this demo. And we will be all hanging out at the Ask Firebase booth after if you have any questions. Thank you, and have a good night. Please welcome onto stage Peter Friesen. Hello, everyone. So congratulations for making it this far. It has been a very long day, and this has been a very long session, and we're not done yet. So after the break, there is going to be more content, and make sure to be back here at 4.30. But given this is a very long day, I would encourage you to stay hydrated and also stay energized. So there is more great food outside. There is more drink outside. So Enjoy some of the food, make sure you're hydrated, and also catch some of the nice sunlight. And then don't forget to be back at 4.30 for more content. Thanks.
The first time I came to get my first round of chemo, I was so nervous. The whole experience of accepting that your child has cancer and um, being able to not take it away was probably the hardest thing as a parent. Health has always been our greatest wealth, but often healthcare visits are surrounded by pain and fear, especially when children are involved. My name is Luke Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of Mighty Immersion, and I work developing virtual reality tools to reduce pain and anxiety in pediatric patients. The way VR works is it keeps the child engaged. They are focused on what's going on in the virtual world, and that allows them to, to really uh, be removed from what's going on, in some cases around them, which can be stressful or painful. I feel like it really helps all around because when you're watching yourself get like a needle put in your port, it can be hard to watch, especially if you're already not a big needle person. The second we started seeing success in the experiences that we were developing, uh, we realized that we needed to distribute this at a larger scale. We had to grow the, the headset base from a couple headsets to 10, 20, even 50 headsets in certain hospitals. That's when we needed Firebase in order to manage all these devices through a simple web portal online. Using Firebase made developing a management system extremely fast. We were able to have this idea and put it into practice immediately. We, we didn't have to focus on any of the back-end development. We could rely on Firebase and really focus on the core of what we were building. So much is taken away from you when you're a patient in a hospital, and to be able to smile and, and enjoy your life a little bit is actually extremely powerful and brings us a lot of joy as well. Please welcome onto stage Patrick Martin. Hi everybody. How are you enjoying Firebase Com or Firebase Summit so far? Pretty good? 
Are, are you all awake for the final stretch? All right, so um, I'm a games developer. I focus on games development. So I think the, the best way to keep everybody's mind engaged is to play the most strategic game of all, rock, paper, scissors. So either turn to your partner or against me, especially if you're viewing at home. We're just going to do one round, all right? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. All right, I, I see some scissors. I got you. Paper uh, people, you're kind of jerks. And it looks like I tied with uh, a third of you. So um, coming up uh, next is going to be uh, Firebase extensions. This is a really cool way you can, as app developers, reuse existing content without like, you know, following all these dedicated steps of like, building this thing out over here or this thing. It kind of ties a lot of the back end stuff together. Then we're going to uh, go a little bit into offline support. Um, not everyone may realize that Firebase still works great without an internet connection. And uh, we'll, we'll just talk about that and see uh, how you can service your uh, players wherever they are. And then finally, if you already have an existing application, we're going to go into how you might integrate Firebase into your existing application without having to tear everything up and build it all from uh, scratch. So with all of that said, I would like to welcome Michael and Annie up onto the stage to talk about Firebase extensions. All right. Welcome back from the break. It's really exhilarating for me to see so many Firebase developers in one room. In fact, this is the first time I've been able to make it to one of the Firebase summits, so I think this might be the most Firebase developers I've seen in one place ever. And you know, I know it sounds cheesy, but it's also true. Firebase is driven by the developers who use our products every day. In fact, that's actually how Firebase came to exist in the first place. Firebase started with the real-time database. And you may not know this, but the real-time database started as a hosted service to allow websites to let their users chat with one another. And the users of this service, it turned out that they wanted to do more than just send messages. So they were using this service, but they weren't sending text like, hello, or how's it going? They were sending JSON payloads and using it as a real-time sync service. So talking to these developers, we realized that real time was very powerful and also very difficult to implement. And so a new product was born, a product, a database that lets you store any kind of data and synchronize it in real time to lots of connected clients. In other words, Firebase. But we weren't done listening to developers, because once you can synchronize data in real time, how can you let users write to it while still keeping it secure? So we listened to that, and we built Firebase authentication to manage users and to have powerful authorization logic through security rules. But we still weren't done listening, because once you can build an entire application using nothing but HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, where are you going to put it? So we built Firebase hosting to make publishing your static assets as easy as typing Firebase deploy. And we kept on listening, and we kept on building, we joined forces first with Google, then with Fabric. And today, I can show you how to build almost any type of application on almost any platform using nothing but the suite of tools that Firebase gives you. But we're still not done listening to you. We've heard that you don't just want new pieces to fit into the puzzle that is your application. You also want help fitting them together into a larger picture. On the, one way to do that is with Cloud Functions for Firebase. Functions are deeply integrated into Firebase and give you a trusted serverless environment to run your code. You can write functions to do almost anything. And believe me, talking to you here today, we've seen some pretty creative use cases. But like I said, we've been listening. And when we talk to you, we hear many of the same things come up time and time again. Now, we can and kind of do spend a lot of time answering questions on Stack Overflow or our mailing lists or even providing code samples to help you save a little bit of time. But at the end of the day, what we really want to do is just solve these common problems for you so that you can go back to working on the things that make your app unique and awesome. So we're here today to introduce an exciting new part of the Firebase platform, Firebase extensions. 
Extensions are open source prepackaged solutions for common problems we've heard about from developers like you. Extensions can tie together existing products from Firebase and Google Cloud Platform, integrate with third party services, or even just implement patterns that we've seen out in the wild. We built extensions as a platform to bring new capabilities to Firebase faster than ever before. Extensions leverage the powerful infrastructure already available in Firebase without the need for you to write a single line of code. When you install an extension, you provide a few simple configuration parameters and we do the rest. We create new resources in your project like cloud functions and we connect those to existing resources like your cloud Firestore database and then perform actions like sending email or anything else that, you might, that might be a problem you need to solve in your application. My name is Michael Bly and I'm an engineering lead on the Firebase develop products. And rather than just tell you how easy extensions are to use, what I really want to do is show you what extensions can do in your Firebase projects. For that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Annie. Hey, everyone. I'm Annie Ryan, and I'm a UX designer for Firebase. Now, Michael has showed you a bit of the what behind extensions, but I'm going to talk through how we've thought about the journeys because, well, I'm a user experience designer. Now, here's our app Friendly Eats. And we've been thinking about adding a share feature to these restaurant pages. Now, there is an extension that can help us with that. So I'm going to get right to demoing how just that one extension can get that feature up and running. Hey, Michael, I think I need your help over here. Passwords. Typing is hard. There we, there we go. go. Awesome. So here we are in the Firebase website in the Firebase extensions page. Can we get that up on the screen? So we're not there yet, but we're almost there. Oh, we're switching to the demo now? go. Ta -da. Ta -da. <laughs> so now here we are in the Firebase website in the Firebase extensions page. And as I scroll down, you'll see a list of all the extensions that you can install today. And these are solving common you know, developer problems such as resizing images to various thumbnail sizes you may need in your app to um, deleting user data, which deletes data keyed on a user ID from such services like cloud storage and real-time database. But I just spoke about adding a share feature to Friendly Eats. And the trigger email extension could help us do that. So I'm going to click and see more details. Now, each extension has a robust detail page such as this, which tells you a bit more about how this extension will work in your project. It also provides links to the Firebase documentation on extensions and also a link to the source code. And there's also details on billing and what billable services this extension is going to use. You can see more details on exactly what you can configure and also the resources that it's going to generate. Now, I'm going to install this extension through the Firebase console, but you could also install the extension through the Firebase CLI if you want a more like, programmatic way of managing your extension. So now we've given this page a quick look through. I'm going to get right to installing it. Which this is going to bring me right to the Firebase console. And I'm going to select a project to install the extension within. And since we're talking about Friendly Eats, I'm going to select the project Friendly Eats. And that brings me right into the guided step-by-step -step flow to install this extension. 
The first thing I'm going to do is review that it's using just one cloud function called process queue, which is going to process the document changes in Cloud Firestore. And then I previously talked about billable services, so it's letting me know that again. But I'm only going to be charged for the usage that exceeds Firebase's free tier, and go read more about that as well. And now I need to give this um, extension permission to do things in my project. And it's going to generate just a service account that has the cloud data store user um, role. And that's basically going to allow this extension to access my database instance. But now we're getting to the fun part, which is modifying this extension to meet friendly apps, need, friendly eats needs. I'm going to leave the deployment location as US central, but here I need to provide my SMTP credentials for my email delivery provider. So let me just paste those in here. And then I also need to specify a collection for the email documents. I think mail sounds good, so I'm going to leave that as the default. And then I'm going to use a no reply, oops, for my default from address. That looks good. I'm also going to use that as my default reply to address. And users collection, I'm going to leave that blank for now. I can go back and edit that later. And then I'm going to use the templates feature, which allows me to use reusable handlebars templates to render these emails. And I'm going to call that templates. And that's it. After just a few steps and a few fields, I'm ready to install this. And so as this extension is installing, I'm landed in the extensions details page in the Firebase console, where I can see a list of all my installed extensions. And that's it. Uh, this extension will be fully deployed in just a few minutes. <laughs> so now you've seen the process of installing an extension. And you may have noticed that this is a bit different than other prepackaged solutions out there. Well, user research played a huge part in making this a full end-to-end -end platform. Quite simply, we listen to developers like you. In fact, 700 of them. And this encompassed 10 different research methodologies over the course of 10 months. We listened for hours, literally. We tested three iterations of the experience along the way and continually reevaluated the array of extensions that you can install. Now, these extensions have been put through the test to ensure that you're getting through these common app development problems quickly and efficiently. So that's all good to know, right? But how did this research help? Well, it gave us some guiding principles to keep us on track. One principle being transparency. And simply put, we strive to be respectful to our users. And one way to do that is to provide you with a transparent experience that's mindful of your needs and your expectations. And we heard directly through de from developers throughout this process about the ways and they wanted extensions to be a more transparent experience. And one of those ways being the source code. One developer called out that even just seeing a link to the source code, one link, up their trust tenfold in the product. They wanted to be able to access that more frequently during the install process. So I'm going to take a closer look at how this affected what I just showed you. So immediately as you're browsing through the details page of this extension, you're provided with the source code. And as Michael has said, all Firebase extensions are open source. Now this is something we know developers are really keen on because it's a direct view into the glue that holds this functionality together and allows you to trust that it's going to do what it says it's going to do. Also, as you're going through that guided installation flow, you can view the source code at any time. As the extension is deploying, you are still provided with more opportunities to view the source code. Another developer early on in our process specifically called out that the permissions needed to be more descriptive. We weren't displaying enough information. 
So right as you get to step one of that install flow, you know it, the exact cloud function that's going to be evoked, along with an explanation as to why it's even being used at all. We also made sure to provide you with a complete list of roles, so you know the exact access that this extension will have in your project. You're provided with both a description and a rationale as to why it's being used. So there's really no surprises here. And top of mind amongst nearly all the developers that we listened to was understanding how usage relates to cost. So we really took this into consideration in later iterations. So right within the details page of the extension on the Firebase website is a section on billing. And we know this is really important when you're choosing a service to use. So these details provide you with information on how this extension will consume usage for those specific services within your project. Now our simple second principle is control, and that's about flexibility. So you can get up and running quickly, no matter what your expertise level is or what workflows you have established. And we kept hearing about customization th during this research. Developers wanted to know how much flexibility they would have before they even installed. Like, how well is this going to work for them and their needs? So how do we take action on this? Well, the extension's details are also super explicit and open as to what this extension will do once installed in your project. For example, with Trigger Email, you know exactly, nearly step by step, how Firebase is going to render and send those emails from Cloud Firestore. And again, to let you know if this extension will work for you, you can view every way in which the extension can be modified and exactly what it's going to generate in your project. And when we first started testing, we were testing CLI only. But many participants said, you know, I'm not super familiar with the Firebase CLI. And we know not everyone works in the same way. So multiple installation options have been provided to you. All you need to do is to choose the path that you are most comfortable with. So we could have thrown all of these solutions up in a GitHub repo and told you to have at it, but we wanted to make sure that this was an excellent developer experience and something that you could trust to work seamlessly for you. Now Michael's going to show you how Trigger Email will work within Friendly Eats. Great. Thanks, Annie. Can, all right. We're already on the demo. And it's working this time, so we're already running at 100%. So here I am in my Friendly Eats app, and this is just running on a local web, on a local Firebase serve instance. And you can see that if I click through to my prime spot restaurant here, I've already done a little bit of the UI work that I need to implement this new email sharing feature. So I have this add a review button, and next to it I have a share button. So I'm going to click the share button. That brings up this prompt, and let's see, what's a good test email? How about Amy test at mail? There we go, and check out this restaurant live on stage. And I'll click the share button. Oh, wait, I got an alert here. To do, send email here. I hope this isn't super hard to implement. Right, I have to actually implement the feature. Uh, so let us jump into our editor. And here we have the function that just got invoked. So you can see here's my alert that has the to do. And let's. Annie's just told me about this cool extension that she installed in the project. So let's figure out how we can use that to send this restaurant recommendation. So if I jump over to the console, I can see in the extensions dashboard that I have a trigger email extension. And if I click through, I can see how this extension works with detailed documentation. Now, Annie chose sensible names for all of the things, but this is actually populated with the values that you provide. So if she had called the collection churros instead of mail, then that would show up here as churros. We just wanted to make it really easy for you to understand and jump into extensions. And we were talking about using the template feature because we're going to be sending a lot of these emails. We want to send them directly from the client. And so we want to be able to reuse the same thing without having to paste in an entire email body from the client every time. So let's see. You know what? I'm reading the documentation, but I'm just going to copy from the docs because that's what we do, right? So let's just go back over here, paste that in, and OK, we're not quite done yet. So we're sending to, this is sending to a user, but I want to send to an email address instead. So I'll just send that to the email that's passed into this function. Uh, we're going to call the template share, 
And here we're going to have the note and the restaurant information for the recommendation. All right, so I'm going to save that, going to hit refresh, and we'll try sharing this again. Check out Prime Spot, it's live. So this time I hit share and there's no alert, which means that my code has changed at least. And if I pop over to the Firestore console and go to mail, I can see this document here where not only does it have the data that I added, but it also has this delivery data. And oh, the state looks like error. And if I see error tried to render non-existent template share. Well, that makes sense. I told it to use a template, but I didn't actually create the template. So why don't we go ahead and do that? I'll create a new collection called templates. And this is called share. We need a subject line for our email. So let's say friendly eats restaurant recommendation. So these are just uh, handlebars templates so I can use the data that I sent uh, along in the message. And then HTML, you know what, I am not going to sit here and make you watch me write email HTML live on stage. So instead I'm just going to copy this template that I've already written. You can see here it has my note, it has a little bit of information about the restaurant, but it's really just straightforward HTML. So I've created my template and that's stored in Firestore. So that means whenever these templates are updated, any future mail that is sent using the trigger email extension will automatically get the latest version of the template. So going back to my mail collection, I can use another feature which allows me to retry mail that, was fail that failed to deliver for some reason if I think it's going to succeed on another attempt. So I'm going to change this error to retry, save it, and you can see it processes and this time, Great, we have a success, we have the attempt number went up because I've tried this twice now, and hopefully, all right, I've got mail. So I've just received this email, and if I click through, there's the message that I typed and information about the restaurant, and I've implemented my sharing feature. Can we go back to the slides? So I just walked you through how I was able to implement a social sharing feature much faster than I could have otherwise by using Firebase extensions. But of course, sending email is just one of the ex extensions we're introducing today. There are nine of them in all, and we've tailored each one to solve a specific problem quickly while being flexible enough to work for a wide variety of applications. Of course, this is really just the starting line. As we said, we've been listening to you, we're going to keep listening to you. So we're excited to have you try these out and we're also excited to hear what other extensions you want to see in the future. Now, if you want to dive in and get started with extensions, you can find all of these on firebase.google.com, just look for extensions. And we're also opening up the extensions repository today. So if you go to github.com slash firebase slash extensions, you can find the source code for all of these extensions, both that we've released today and that we'll release over the coming months and so forth. So that's all we have. I, for one, can't wait to see what all of you build with extensions. If you have any questions, Annie and I will be heading over to the Ask Firebase area right now, and we'd be happy to talk to you more. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the Firebase Summit.
please welcome onto stage Todd Kerpelman and Susan Goldblatt. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. So we have like a boatload of knowledge we're about to like drop on you today. Um, so I hope you had your coffee and or your siesta because we're going to talk kind of fast. And for that, I apologize in advance. Um, hey, this here is Susan. Hi, and this is Todd. Hi, and we are here today to talk to you about Firebase Offline. What works, what doesn't, and what you should know. But you know, Susan, my phone has like three bars on it right now. Should I even care about offline? Ooh, what a leading question, It is Todd. a good question. <laughs> um, of course you should care. We know that when we're building out apps, we're often on a good Wi-Fi system. But we want our apps to be able to handle situations where our users go offline, maybe a crowded place or they go underground. Um, and so we want to build out our applications to handle this case. All right. Well, then I guess I will care. Thank you. So the general philosophy when it comes to offline support is that Firebase is not an offline first platform, but we are offline tolerant. So what does that mean? Well, let me explain. The idea is that you can take an app that is powered by Firebase and go on like a long plane flight from San Francisco to Madrid or take it on like a super long elevator ride or take it with you in a hike in the mountains and your app will generally continue to work. Yes, there might be a few degraded experiences here and there, but it will still still generally be functional. But it is not an app where you could expect to provide either an offline first experience or an experience where your user stays offline for weeks or you know, months at a time and maybe syncs with Firebase once a month, once a season, right? And you will generally see that philosophy in most of our products. Now, the good news here is that most of this offline support mostly just works without your having to do a whole lot. Most of our products use some combination of either caching things locally or performing exponential back off and retry. And that's when Gmail is says like, oh, I'm going to try and connect in two seconds. OK, now four seconds. OK, now eight seconds. And you know, hopefully, eventually it does. Um, so between these two strategies that Firebase uses, we're able to provide you with a fair amount of offline support without your having to do a whole lot. And that's nice. Um, but there are ways you can affect this offline behavior in both positive and negative ways. And as always, I find that the best way to make sure that you are doing the right thing in the right circumstances is by understanding how things work behind the scenes. But maybe all this would make more sense if we had a more concrete example. So let's create an app with the power of our imagination because we didn't have time to actually make one. <laughs> um, so we love olives. Um, I've actually only been eating olives here in Spain. It's been delightful. Um, and we know that Spain is one of the world's largest olive producers. So we thought we would make an app uh, for those olive farmers so that they can take photos of their olive trees and upload them to the cloud and have a history, like a database full of olive tree photos to compare different things with. That sounds like it might be useful if you're an olive farmer. Um, and it just so happens that Olive Journal was built um, Ooh, in our imagination. That's surprising. What? Yeah, using, using Firebase. <laughs> um, and so there are a number of Firebase products that are powering our apps behind the scenes. We got like auth so that our users can sign in. And we have Cloud Firestore, our NoSQL database in the cloud that stores um, a lot of like our, our um, farmers' like readings and measurements and notes that they want to take about their trees. Our images, um, our large binary objects, are stored using cloud storage for Firebase. And of course, we've got a combination of analytics and performance monitoring and crashlytics to find out how our users are interacting with their app, how well it's performing, and if they are running into any issues. But this app is primarily used by growers that are touring their olive groves in the countryside. And while these olive groves might be known for their like majestic beauty and their rolling hillsides, they are not always known for their strong and robust cell phone coverage. So what happens when one of our farmers attempts to use Olive Journal in the middle of an olive grove and they are not connected to the internet? Well, let's find out by looking at all those Firebase products that are powering our app. And uh, we'll see what happens. And let's start with Firebase Auth. Susan? Cool. So Firebase Auth is Firebase's identity as a service product. It allows users to log into their application. It keeps track of the logged in users. And it allows them to sign into services like Firestore and storage. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. So you have an app. Your user logs in. It talks to the Firebase Auth server. And Exchange gives you a token and the logged in user. You then use that token to talk to services like Cloud Firestore. You also have access to the user object with things like the email, the user ID, and the photo URL. Um, that token expires after an hour, but we refresh it underneath the surface. So let's talk about what happens when you go offline. 
When you're offline, you only have access to the user object, so the email, the user ID, and the footer URL. And let's talk about what doesn't work. You can't log in because you can't talk to the server. So anonymous login doesn't work here. You have to be able to talk to the server to log in. And you can't talk to the Firestore or storage because, once again, you're offline and you can't talk to the server. So uh, let's talk about the gotchas here. Um, so the main gotcha is not being able to log in. So if you're not logged in already when your app goes offline, you won't be able to log in. The second kind of related gotcha here is called auth persistence. It's a setting that you can configure, and it allows, it tells you how long you stay logged in. So if you have an app that's like used a banking app, maybe used in a library, and when you close your tab, you want the user to be logged out, if you're offline, you won't be able to log them back in because you've set your auth persistence to be none, to be a little bit more secure. Um, so that's kind of a trade off you'll have to consider when you're thinking about offline experience and security. All right. Let's move on to Cloud Firestore, uh, because this is the primary driver of functionality within our app. Um, and luckily, it is also one of the best in terms of providing a smooth offline experience. So we're going to break this up into two parts. First, we're going to talk about reading data, in our case, using real-time listeners, and then writing data uh, to the cloud in Cloud Firestore. So uh, why don't you talk about some reads? Yeah, so when you read data from Cloud Firestore, um, two things happen. The first thing is that we get a um, callback from the cache, so your data comes back immediately from the cache if you have data there. The second thing that happens is we go to Cloud Firestore um, to get the data there to see if there's any updates or anything like that. If the data is the same, the SDK is smart enough to not send you a second listener, so you only get that first firing. However, um, if the data is different, the server sends you back the new data, and you get a second listener that fires, and your cache updates with the new data. To the user, this might look like there's two reads coming in. Um, but uh, it's, oh, to the user, it won't look like there's two reads coming in, excuse me, because it'll look like it's just gradually filling in, but it's actually two, two reads. So what happens when we go offline? Well, we still get that first read from the cache, um, and so that information comes in, but we don't get the server read. If you're intermittently offline, you go offline, you come back online, maybe you're in a spotty area, um, you'll get that second read a little bit later, so it'll have that like, slow fill-in process. Um, but the thing to notice here is you can actually also query your cache differently than what you had initially queried it. Um, and also, since you can do that, your cache data might not be exactly the same as your server data. So you might have something, information in your cache that um, is different from what you have in your server. So your results might look a little bit different. I think this would be a little bit more clear in an example. So let's go through this with our olive trees. So let's say I've decided to look at all of my olive trees in Spain. And I have um, those in my cache. And then I ask my app to tell me the tallest olive trees. If I'm offline, I'll only get back the tallest olive trees in Spain, even though in my server I have olive trees that are taller in Greece and Italy. Italy. <laughs> Italy. <laughs> Italy. Um, so just be aware that um, the data on your server might be a little bit different. So that's reads. Let's talk about reads. Let's talk about writes. So uh, when you write data, uh, a couple of things happen. Um, your data is written to the cache right away. Um, and sort of like with our real-time reads, you know, when you write data to the cache, that will once again fire off your real-time listener, giving you back your updated data nearly right away. This happens you know, locally. It's very fast. But now in the background, your data is still being sent over to the real Cloud Firestore database that's hanging out there in the cloud. Now this data will get updated in the cloud, and Cloud Firestore will once again send that document back to the client. Now, like before, if these two documents are exactly the same, by default, Cloud Firestore will quietly ignore that second callback. It says, eh, I've seen this already. I won't bother the user. You can change that behavior if you want, but by default, it won't tell you about it. Now, the benefit of all this is that you get some uh, really nice latency compensation, right? From your user's perspective, it looks like all the writes that they have performed in your app happen right away because you're not waiting for that round trip to come back um, from your server. So uh, it's really nice. It's, it's a fun little benefit. Um, oh, yes. So what happens when you go offline? Well, basically, just the first part of that process works. So for writes, once again, that local write will trigger your callback right away. Your real-time listener will fire with your cache data. right? Um, and I should note that in the case of uh, document modifications, not just new documents, we kind of play back local writes on top of your original data. That original data doesn't get modified until we get confirmation from the server that these writes have gone through. 
So when, we, when network connectivity is finally reestablished, those writes will be sent down to Cloud Firestore in the cloud in the order that they were written um, within your app. Once that data has been received, Cloud Firestore will verify it and send back your new documents with your data back to your device. And again, if this is already what we have cached locally, if this looks exactly the same, by default, the local SDK won't tell you about it, but it will go ahead and confirm those pending rights and bake them into your cached data. But of course, in some cases, these updates might include new data. Maybe other people have written to those documents in the meantime. Um, and that's fine too, right? If this data looks different than your cache, that will just sort of once again, um, you know, update our cache and uh, trigger our real-time listener. So uh, speaking of that cache, I bet you people are wondering just how large it is. Yeah, I'm definitely wondering. And um, the answer is on mobile and web or mobile devices, it's 100 megabytes, and on 40 on blah, on, uh, on the web, it's 40. Um, and that's actually configurable in your settings. So you could actually set the cache size to be unlimited, which would remove all the cleanup and it could bloat your app out. But it is a setting you can configure. The other really cool thing about the cache that I was curious about is if you have an app and you're frustrated, you swipe out of it, um, your cache actually stays in Firestore. So you can go back into that app and access the information. All right. So, so uh, let's talk about a couple of gotchas here. Um, the first one that I've probably seen most often in the real world, and maybe even in our own sample apps at some point, is that write completion handlers don't fire until your write has been confirmed by the server. And uh, what does that mean? Let me explain. Um, so Right in here, you can see an example of a write where we are adding a new journal entry to Cloud Firestore, and in the callback, we're saying, okay, you know, now go ahead and dismiss that new you know, journal entry view controller. So the problem is that um, if we were running this app while offline, that callback would never fire. And from our user's perspective, it would kind of look like our app is frozen because this view controller is never going away because we're waiting to get that response from the server. And you know, that's bad. You don't want your app to look like it's frozen. That's something I learned. Don't. Oh, surprise. It's, it, it's an anti-pattern. <laughs> don't have your app frozen. Um, so the right thing to do here is actually just dismiss that dialog box essentially right away. You don't have to dismiss it in your callback. Because remember, as far as our app is concerned, those writes have happened immediately. They've been added to the cache, and you are allowed to work with those right away. So save the callback for things like maybe changing the appearance of a journal entry to show that, yes, this has been you know, confirmed and written to the cloud, or logging any errors that are returned by your server. Uh, the second gotcha is that uh, currently this on-device cache is not indexed. So we like to say that Cloud Firestore queries are very fast because we index every field in every document in every collection, and that is true in the cloud. But on your local device, there is no indexing right now. So uh, when you do a search, we basically have to unpack and scan every document in the collection that you are searching through. Not only that, but remember how we replay all those pending writes on top of your data? We have to do that as well, which means that if your cache, if your local cache is too big or has too many writes or you're just running on a sort of slow or old device, this can run quite slowly. Now, you can fix this by not preloading your cache with like too much data, even if you think your user will be offline. This will probably do more harm than good. Like I know some developers are like, I'm just going to go ahead and like download the entire database and get millions of documents when we first run, um, you know, in anticipation of maybe having a better experience, but, but this will not work. Don't like overload your cache. Kind of trust that your user will probably be making queries similar to ones they've made in the past, and let your app or let your cache sort of develop naturally based on your user's natural use pattern. You can also, by the way, um, adjust your cache. You know, go ahead and keep your cache size reasonable if you notice that your user is running on a slower device, right? If you detect that the device is old or slow, and maybe you think the cache is going to take a while to run, make it smaller. All right, so now let's talk about cloud storage for Firebase. Um, this doesn't have quite as robust of an offline solution as Cloud Firestore, but it is still smart enough to generally do the right thing and not break your app, which is, you know, good. If you're not familiar with cloud storage, this is a service where you can save large binary objects to the cloud, like, you know, images or movies or PDFs or big data streams. Um, and you generally do this by specifying a reference, which looks a little like a it's over here. Looks a little like a path. Uh, and then asking Cloud Storage to go ahead and upload an object to that path. Downloading is very similar. Start with a reference, which once again looks like a path, um, and then go ahead and download it. And then in our case, say, hey, go ahead and convert that data stream into an image. So uh, what happens when you go offline? 
Well, if you have an app where you have some kind of pending upload, generally speaking, Cloud Firestore will、um, retry this with exponential back off until it finally does upload.、Um, and this does generally continue working even if you were to switch to you know, another app and then come back. When you come back and this app is once again in the foreground, it will go ahead and try and、um, redo any pending uploads it has. However, If your app is killed or suspended and then starts up again,、uh, this behavior is also killed. Your app doesn't remember about these pending uploads, right? And if these image files are something that you've only saved as local variables, for instance, that data is also lost.、Um, so if we assume that, that keeping these photos are important to the users of Olive Journal and we want to fix this,、uh, what would we do? Probably something like this.、Um, when our user takes a photo, go ahead and save that photo first to local file storage.、Um, along the way, go ahead and keep a list of files, again, stored locally that we want to upload to,、um, to cloud storage. Then, once a photo is successfully uploaded in cloud storage, the SDK actually has a method that says, you know, upload from local file,、um, which makes this, this pattern fairly easy. Once it's been uploaded, go ahead, delete the local version, and remove it from our list. And so the nice thing here is that when your app is killed and restarts, well, we still have a record of those local files, and our app says, oh, look at that, I still have some、uh, pending uploads, and it can go ahead and try uploading them again. Let's talk about downloads. Yeah, so downloads work、uh, nearly the same. They have an exponential back off to try and get files from the cloud.、Um, so, the thing to note here is that storage doesn't have a cache like Firestore does.、Um, so, if you want that functionality, you're going to have to build out your own. It's fairly easy to do, but、um, we have some simple open source solutions、um, that do this for you. So, in Android, there's the Firebase UI and Glide. Um, which allows Glide to understand Firebase storage references, the same as it does URLs. And on iOS, there's a library called Firebase Storage Cache, which creates an NS cache to store images downloaded through cloud storage for Firebase.、Um, the other thing you could do here to kind of create a cache for images is talk to storage and get a publicly accessible URL, and then use that publicly accessible URL to.、Um, Use an existing library that can、um, cache images loaded through URLs. So, a library might be Glide or Kingfisher or Pin Remote Image.、Um, the drawback here is that if you're already offline, you can't get those publicly available URLs because you have to be online to get them. So, let's talk about the gotchas. The first storage gotcha is pretty similar to the Firestore gotcha. It's about、um, this completion handler. So, if you're waiting to close a dialog for confirmation that you uploaded your data to cloud storage,、um, if you put it in that completion handler and you go offline, it'll never close the dialog.、Um, so, maybe you say, write to Cloud Firestore to be like, hey, image uploaded, here's where I saved the file.、Um, if you're offline, you won't ever get to that point.、Um, and so, the solution is just to take The Firestore writer, whatever you have outside of your、um, completion handler, and just assume that the data was correct. Then, in that completion handler, you can say, write to Firestore and be like, upload true, so that you have a reference that the data was uploaded or not. All right.、Um, now, let's talk about all the measurement libraries, all of them, or at least three、uh, analytics, performance monitoring, and crash analytics. Uh, and I'm grouping all these together because one, I only have about five minutes, but you know, two, they generally follow similar strategies. So, in general,、uh, data that you are recording using analytics, crash analytics, or performance monitoring is already stored locally in a cache. Because if you think about it, at least for、like、the analytics and performance monitoring data, like, we're recording this stuff constantly. And we wouldn't want to be constantly sending this data you know, off to Firebase's servers because that would be a terrible drain on your user's battery. So, instead, we already store batches of this data locally、um, and then go ahead and upload them during regular intervals or certain moments in your app's lifecycle. Specific moments depend a little bit on your device and on your library.、Uh, one note here is that on Android, all this uploading is done by Google Play Services, which means it can send this information even if your app is not running. That's why, for instance, if your app were to crash on Android, you get that crash data right away because Google Play Services is able to see that crash data and upload it for you. On iOS, we have to wait for the user to start up your app again before your app can go ahead and upload that crash data to, you know, to our servers. So, what happens if we can't connect? Well, basically, they all follow the kind of the same strategy, which is exponential back off and retry, either while your app is running on iOS or Google Play Services does this for you on Android.、Um, and in the meantime, we keep accumulating data from these libraries up to a limit. And、uh, what is that limit, you might be wondering? 
good question because it's on the next slide. <laughs> um, it's about you know, 10 megabytes of data in performance monitoring, about 100,000 analytics events, um, and about nine crashes. All these subject to change, so all of you taking pictures right now don't get angry when this changes. Um, one interesting note is that on analytics, if we hit this limit of 100,000 events, which admittedly does not happen very often, we will stop collecting the more recent events and keep the older events. And this is because for a lot of developers, uh, the one thing they, they really care about most when it comes to analytics is that first open event um, and the attribution data that's associated with it, and maybe some of those sort of initial going through your app's lifecycle events like signing in or creating an account or completing the tutorial and that sort of stuff. And so if, if we have to make a choice, we will keep that data and sort of drop the more recent events. But again, it doesn't happen too often. As for gotchas, I think the biggest thing you need to be aware of is most of these libraries, and this is a technical term, they kind of freak out when they encounter data that's too old, right? Because they need to ask themselves, all right, is this data actually really old? Or, you know, because your user has been offline for a week or a month, or do they not trust your system clock, right? Because both these things are equally likely. And a lot of these libraries do some clever work kind of behind the scenes to adjust for clocks that might seem off, but you know, they're not perfect. And at some point, they're just not sure what to do with a date that seems really old. Uh, Crashlytics will generally address this, by the way, by just like changing the timestamp so that it looks like the crashes happened today. They're like, eh, it's fine. You probably want to see this crash data anyway. Um, performance monitoring and analytics, they'll generally discard data that looks like it's more than 72 hours old. So again, if you have an app where you're expecting your users to be offline for like weeks at a time, which again is sort of not a pattern we recommend with Firebase, uh, some of your analytics data is going to get lost and your app's usage might seem lower than it actually is because some of that old data will get discarded. All right. Well, let's see if we can sum up everything that we've learned in the last 25 minutes. Cool. So when you're offline, things mostly just work. We have two strategies for doing things. It's caching things locally or exponential back off and retry. Um, but Firebase is designed for occasional offline moments. It's not offline first. Um, so if you need completely offline experience, it's probably not the right tool set for you. Let's go over the gotchas. So for auth, the main gotcha, can't log in. Right. You're offline. Uh, watch out for those Cloud Firestore write callbacks. They will not fire if your user is offline. So, you know, don't have that view controller up there forever. Um, cloud Storage doesn't have a cache, so you'll need to write your own. Or use a third or party, a third third party, party open source library. That would be love. fine too. And our measurement tools, they're just a little suspicious of data that seems too old. Uh, so, with that, we are out of time. Thank you so much. I hope uh, we know it's a lot of information, but if you want to take anything out of this talk, I hope you learned something about how offline works across different Firebase products that you feel empowered to build with offline in mind. And maybe go check out how your existing app works. See if you can actually close dialogues when you're offline. <laughs> Yeah, it might, the answer might surprise you. Uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and rewatch this again on YouTube at like 0.5 speed, because again, I know we spoke kind of fast. Um, and otherwise, if you're here at the, at the event, why don't you meet us at the Ask Firebase Lounge, where we can take this conversation offline. Off Got him. We did it. <laughs> After you.
please welcome onto stage Rafi Khan and Mega Bangalore. Hey everybody, how's it going? Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know it's I know it's late on the day, but like you guys have been a, done a really good job. Yeah. Powered through. Okay. Don't worry. We have a really good closing presentation for you. You know, like worked really hard on it. Really excited to share it with you guys. So it's like, <laughs> all right, let's get to it. Okay. All right. So developers are drawn to Firebase because it lets you create rich app experiences, gain deep customer insights, and grow their business. However, they think that they need to start from scratch. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Well, in fact, let's say that you have a mature enough app to actually focus on things like increasing your user engagement with in-app messaging or decreasing your new user churn with push notifications. Even if you haven't been using Firebase from the start, just by adding the SDKs to an existing app, you can start iterating your user app experience to improve any of your key metrics in a thoughtful and really measured way. At Firebase, we design our products to be standalone, easy to integrate with existing systems. Today, we're going to show you common problems that customers run into and how they solve them. Hi, everyone. I'm Rafi. This is Mega. We're both engineering managers here at Firebase, and we're here to talk to you about how to add Firebase to existing apps. For this talk, we assume that you have a high-level understanding of a lot of the different Firebase products, and we're going to focus on specific architectures and integration strategies when working with them. Let's dig in. Okay. In recent years, more and more apps are popping up with rich, real-time, collaborative experiences and they work offline or handle unreliable connections. This is a common problem for logistics companies who need live order tracking in spotty delivery zones, or media companies that have engaging live content and want their customers to be able to use it in public transit when they're going in and out of service. When developers look for ways to do this, they find Firebase. Often. They're using other databases like SQL or some other database technology. And when they look at Firestore or the real-time database, they think they have to switch. So what do they do? Well, we at Firebase build products knowing you work with other services. And we've built ours to meet you where you are. So guess what? You don't need to abandon what you have. You can keep your existing systems and get all the great features of real-time synchronization and offline support that Firestore provides. And I'm going to show you how. So to pull this off, we need to start with a little bit of planning. And we start by asking ourselves, for whatever our scenario is, what is the data that needs to be live? For delivery apps, this could be something like the order, its status, or the location of a driver. For media companies, you could, be, you could be tracking the election, and you want to show a live vote count. Usually, this data has a life cycle to it, and you want to know where those changes happen, and you want to know where it's going on in your code base, from creation to updates to completion. Next, we think about security. Now, security is super important. We all know that. And we want to be sure that only the people that should see our data can see our data and nobody else. Okay? So we're fundamentally asking the question, who should have access to our data? Now, there's lots of ways to do this. But for the examples I've given, that I've given, we have two models. In one case, specific users, specific users need access. So it's like the customer, the restaurant, maybe the driver. Or nobody needs access because all the data is public, like with election data. Once you know this, you can answer two really important questions. Do I need to use Firebase auth? And what are the security rules that I need to write? So you now know what your live data is. And you know your security model. Let's map out the integration. Okay. So to talk about an integration, it helps to start from a reference architecture. Now, I know everybody's architecture is different, but 
in most of the products we work with, there's a couple of uh, common uh, there are a couple of common patterns. Okay, often a customer has a website or a mobile app, often both, and users can log into both uh, at the same time and have multiple sessions that are active. You know, a customer will also have an auth service that they can use to manage their session tokens, and lastly, they'll have an API server that can write to their database. So at a high level, when you think about the integration, what you're doing is using Firestore as a caching layer that's directly accessed by your client. Okay? Also, you're using Firebase auth and security rules alongside your existing architecture in order to secure it. So now we know where Firestore plugs in, and we know how security will be approached. Let's talk about code. So first, we're going to go to all of our clients. And at login or startup, or really whenever your app establishes a session with your auth service, what you want to do is you want to go to your auth service. Then you want to talk to Firebase Auth and get your hands on a custom, uh, custom token that has the user ID and any custom claims that would be useful for your rules. Once you have that, you're going to give that back to your client and have it hold on to it. Once the client has it, then it's going to use that token to connect to Firestore with offline support turned on. Now, Todd and Susan just gave uh, an amazing talk on offline support, and so there's a little bit more involved in there. But this is kind of the gist of where that comes, comes into play here. All right, so your app is warmed up. Let's pipe some real-time data into it. So, what we're going to do next is we're going to go to the back end, and we're going to find where our live data gets created. Okay? For a delivery company, it could be when an order gets created. For an election, it could be when a candidate is registered or polling starts. Wherever it is, you want to go there. And once you're there, you want to create a document with a little bit of starter data, just the bits that need to be live. And you want to put it into Firestore. Once Firestore has it, it's going to pass that along to the client. Now, also, as part of this, you want to tell your client where this live data is going to be so it can listen for live updates on it. Now, make sure that your client is also remembering where, this, where, where to listen. Because if your app restarts or, your browser, or the browser gets refreshed, you, it needs to know where to rehydrate the connection and start listening for updates again. Now, your back end could be written in anything, Node, Python, even Java. Okay? Wherever it is, our admin SDKs are there to meet you where you are so that you can talk to Firestore and put these objects in. So once that data is written, the client will automatically start to receive it, and it'll start to render it. And that's it to get it started. OK, so the client is connected. It's listening for updates. It's got its first bit of live data. What's next? Well, we go back to our server and ask another question. What is the life cycle of our data? For a delivery app, it could be when the order is being prepared, when it's out for delivery, or a last minute change gets, uh, happens to it. For election data, it could be when the polls open or when votes start coming in. Whatever it is, you want to find all those places in your back end, and you want to update the same document that you created earlier with whatever the new data is. And the moment that that document gets updated, it's going to get propagated to all the clients across all their sessions, across all their devices that are listening for it. And just like before, you'll use whatever admin SDKs match your tech stack. If you're using more than one tech stack, like if some of your operations happen out of band, you'll just use more than one SDK. Okay. All right. So the data is live. The client's getting updated. What else is there to do? Everybody's favorite part, clean up. Okay. Here, we're going to do the exact same thing that we did in all the previous steps, which is we need to find where our live data isn't needed anymore. So for delivery, it'll be when the order completes. For the election, it could be when the polls close. 
you want to go there just like before and use the admin SDKs to delete the data from Firestore, tell the client to stop listening for it, and have it forget about that path. Because now that the data is dead, either if the app restarts or the browser refreshes, you don't care about it anymore. So this more or less covers the integration. Now, with the setup, what do we have here? Well, at the highest level, we've tapped into the life cycle of the data. And anytime something happens to it from creation to update to deletion, we're just updating Firestore. Okay? You see, the beauty of this approach is that your backend doesn't need to care about the client at all. It just keeps sending the relevant real time, the data that needs to get updated straight to Firestore. All of your clients across all of your sessions, across all of your devices, are always going to get the going to get the latest view. If connectivity is lost with any of them, you don't need to worry about it, because Firestore is going to hold that state, and when the app comes back online, it's going to pull the latest view and be able to render it. Security is covered with Firebase Auth and security rules ensuring your data is safe and the wrong people don't see it. Now, let's pull back to our architecture. See, you didn't have to leave your existing database. Okay? See how it harmonizes together? And there you go. How to use Firestore as your caching layer and your real-time synchronization with offline support. All right, so now we've got our app. So how do we get users to come in and stay? This is a really hard part of any app. And we all stumble here. It's a really tough problem. Fortunately, I have a resident expert here with me to tell you all about it. Mega? Thanks, Rafi. So it's really exciting how Firebase can meet developers wherever they are in, their la in, in building their app. So building a great app is critical. But we all know that running a live app is more than just that. We want to keep users engaged with high quality and truly delightful content that is both relevant and timely. Sometimes we think of building an app and growing your app as two completely different, disparate workflows. But with your engineering team very focused on building and maintaining the app, and your product team really focused on growing your business. But aren't things better together? I don't know if you know this about me. This is my favorite phrase, because it's really true. Things are better together when you actually have a bunch of different teams working together and not having those barriers. Firebase has the tools to make this a really collaborative process and break down those barriers. We help app developers, PMs, and the whole team work together to build that really enjoyable user experience. Firebase has the tools to help you bridge that gap between build and grow. And you can start benefiting from them regardless of how mature your product is and how much has already been built. So a lot of people, when they think about growth, they tend to focus on acquisition, user acquisition. And don't get me wrong, it's super important. As a side note, if you haven't looked into AdMob publishing, take a look. Right, that will be really helpful there. But in order to best leverage those newly acquired users, you have to make sure that they stick. How do you ensure that users are spending time and coming back to your app? Let's take a very specific focus, increasing user engagement in an app that is new to Firebase, but already live and doing great. So it can be more important to have 50 super, really dedicated users than have thousands of casual users. But Firebase can help improve your user engagement and turn more of those casual users into super users. We provide you the tools to help create a truly tailored and personalized experience. So that's really cool and all, but what can Firebase actually add here? Let's take a look with the help of some case studies. So the first one, Cliveni. Cliveni is a really cool company that's focused on smart utilities and has a bunch of different apps. It has a global audience and tons of users, but they're having an issue with discoverability. Users were missing out on a lot of really amazing secondary functionality. And worse, they weren't hitting the pages that Cliveni had instrumented with ads. They had tons and tons of eyeballs, but were missing that extra link to actually monetize them, which I, I don't know about you, but I think that's a tragedy. So they wanted to make some changes to their app, and they turned to Firebase for help. So there were two really big challenges that they had. 
First, they had to be able to change the app's behavior dynamically without having an app update to be able to play around between two different options. Then, second, they had to split the app's traffic to compare the performance between the two groups. With remote config, you can do both of these without any difficulties. So I'm going to show a code snippet here to wire up remote config to allow you to dynamically change the app's behavior. This sample will be an Android, but RC supports iOS, and as you all heard in the keynote, web as well. So first, what you have to do is go to rem remote config programmatically and get the parameter that you care about, in this case, native ad design. Once you've gotten that from the server, uh, you'll actually start gating your logic in your app based on the value in that parameter. So in this case, if the ad design equals big size, uh, we want to display a native ad where the size and the, the call to action are bigger than the normal one. And in the else case, we want to display the normal native app. So we could have chosen to use a Boolean or maybe an enum with a bunch of different options here if we wanted to. But in this case, we just wanted to experiment with those two variants. So after releasing the update and ensuring that enough folks have actually updated and have this new code and this new logic, we can move on to the Firebase console. So by creating a condition here in remote config, we can split the traffic between 50% using a random kind of percentile. When you actually do this creation of a remote config parameter or condition, you can apply several different criteria when you're building it, such as filtering on, based on language or country or some of the audiences that you generated in analytics. So here is an example of the design before and after. The difference is significant, uh, maybe not on the screen here, but especially if you're on a tiny phone. By testing to improve this native ad design, we're now ready to go on to the next step. Feature discoverability. So drawing attention to the in-app advanced features is really important so that users will notice them, learn how to use them quickly and effectively, and eventually stay longer in the app, generating more revenue for you, the developer. So Cleveni wanted to highlight some key features that were unique to ClevCalc, one of their apps. To help with a smoother adoption process, they decided to leverage push notifications and launch something they called the tip of the day. So the tip of the day was designed to be a more subtle form of offering assistance that could display tips on some of this advanced functionality, making the information available, but not necessarily hammering or bombarding the user. So first, what they did was they figured out how were they able to track users who are visiting the help center, the place where all of this advanced functionality was like detailed. They decided to log a custom event, user seen activity help, and this was done programmatically in their app. That's all they had to do programmatically, so let's go back to the Firebase console. In the Firebase console, they were able to create a new audience that was based on whether this custom event had been fired. So in this case, we're saying a new user, if, if there are users seeing activity help, and you have at least one uh, triggering of that event, so you've at least been to the help page once. Now they moved on to the Firebase Cloud Messaging Console, and that's where they were able to configure the push notifications they wanted to send to their users. So this screenshot shows part of the Cloud Messaging Compose UI. Um, and as you can see here, you can set the message content, send, schedule when it's going to be delivered or if it's recurring and then go into the targeting, which is the cool part. Um, also, one thing to note, you can also provide images here if you want to show an image notification. But here, we're just focusing on text. So going into the targeting part, which is one of the most powerful features of cloud messaging, because you're able to target users based on audiences that were defined in analytics. So they used three different audiences to make sure they're targeting the right user. I'll go over what, what they are first and explain why they're important. So in specific, they made sure to ex exclude users who are a member of at least one of these audiences. The first one is active users, premium. These are users that they think are very important, and they don't necessarily want to interfere with them. Or people who have gone to the help center at least once, because if they've already gone to the help center, they know where it is. You don't need to remind them. And finally, purchasers. These are users who have actually made in-app purchases. Now, the reason they wanted to exclude these people is these people are already using, doing those high value actions that Cloveni liked. They didn't want to distract their, those, the users who are already doing all the right things with all of this extra information. And all of this, as you saw, could be done super easily using the Firebase console directly from Firebase. So if their users weren't a purchaser 
and had never been to the Help Center page before, they would get this push notification as a tip of the day. Um, if they click on it, they can navigate via a Firebase dynamic link and get to the actual Help Screen page, which had a bunch of pro tips that they help, could help them learn more about the advanced features. Now, this is really cool. It was very easy to do, but what was the actual result? So it was actually spectacular and a great success, and I'm not exaggerating that. Um, so they were able to in increase their ad mob revenue. They were able to increase their user engagement. But better yet, they were able to they saw no change in app uninstalls. They weren't hammering or annoying their users because they were able to be really targeted and really focused on the users who actually could benefit from this information. So this is really cool and all, but what other types of apps can Firebase help? Games are actually a place where Firebase can fit really well into existing apps. So let's talk about a few of them. First, Dan the Man. So Halfbrick Games was able to use Firebase to increase revenue, not just increase user engagement. So they constructed an, a Firebase A-B test where users were gifted credits. So the control group received no credits. One group received credits at level three. And the third group only received credits if they were in the Firebase prediction will churn segment. So these were folks who Firebase was able to predict were likely to churn. The users in the will churn test group had a 20% increase in seven day retention versus the other groups. As another example, Rockbite Ga Games was able to use predictions in a slightly different way, the, based on the prediction of spending or not spending. They used Firebase Remote Config to dynamically change their in store game for these two groups. They actually discovered that players were more likely to make in-app purchases if these cute little animated chests were featured at the top of the store. So they also gave users who were in the unlikely to spend, so unlikely to make in-app purchase group, the option of viewing an ad to earn in-game currency, being able to monetize these users who would un otherwise be unreachable. So Firebase was able to help Rockbite boost revenue by 25%. So We've seen that you can use a bunch of different Firebase tools kind of combined, like cloud messaging, um, Firebase dynamic links, remote config, A-B testing, and many more. But we also have other tools to help you re-engage, increase engagement, or modify your user's experience, ensuring that more of your users are able to get a personalized and delightful experience and stay engaged. And we're also making updates to them, as you saw in the keynote, constantly improving and iterating based on the feedback we're getting from you. So we've also seen you can add Firestore or the real-time database as a caching layer for existing applications. But we also have services like machine learning, serverless offerings, and other products to help you build scalable, robust infrastructure that grows with you. And though we didn't mention it in this particular talk, there are also some really great stability and performance tools that you can get just by adding the SDK. So in closing, we at Firebase know you work with other systems and will meet you where you are. Firebase can be used foundationally when you're just starting to build your app or additively as you start exploring new and new features that you think you need. Products are standalone and work better together. For example, the analytics that I just showed you works really well with a lot of the engagement tools like in-app messaging or push notifications. But the really important key takeaway here is that Firebase is there for you at scale, whether you're starting from zero users or maybe two, just the development team, to millions of users, we're able to handle that and grow with you and continue to support you going forward. So I want to spend a quick second. I know everyone wants to get up, but we have a bunch of really cool, exciting closing remarks to go. Uh, so I want to send it back over to Puff and Jessica to close us out. and. By the way, you all did a great job. You stayed through all, all of this. Thank you. And there are so many people still here. It's amazing to see you all. Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Rafi. Thank you, Mega. And thank all of you for being here at the Firebase Summit in Madrid. Round of applause. I need to be careful with Amy. Um, actually, I'm really so happy that you're all still here because it's been a long, long day, right? We have so much content. Can you like, imagine that we started only eight hours ago? Um, 
quick question. I always love knowing what happens and most efficient ways to do this with a show of hands. So raise your hand if you've been to every session in this room. Oh. Oh, wow. We Kudos were... to you. That is great. And for those of you that weren't able to make it to all the sessions, they have all been recorded and they are going to be posted on YouTube in just the next couple of hours. Yeah. So do you have oh. any questions for the audience? I do. I do. Who here made a new friend today? OK, good. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the highlights for me, of course, right? Meeting so many of you, uh, including uh, some of the kids here. I just met Chloe, a adorable two-year-old, and I think a future firebaser. I also re-met an old friend, because Amy joined me here today. So if you were still waiting to take pictures with her, she's been showing her face. Um, what other questions do we have? Who took a code lab? Nice. That's great. And again, for those that couldn't make the code labs, they're all going to be available on google.dev. So hopefully you uh, signed up and registered for that today. And if not, there's still a little bit of time left. What other activities did we have for everyone, I think? We had AppShip. We had Ask Firebase. We had so much that I'm not sure we can cover it, just the two of us. So how are we going to solve that? We have a video for you. Ooh, let's play the highlight reel. Hola, assalamu alaikum. Hey. Hello, marhaba. Ciao, Firebase. Welcome, everyone, to the Firebase Summit. If Firebase were a restaurant, Extensions would be tapas. This is my first time. My first time in Spain, in Europe. It's my second. I was in Prague last year and it was amazing. I'm just really eager to learn and uh, sort of see the breadth of ideas and topics that are covered today. I just want to see uh, what's new, uh, ask the devs firsthand. on a video for YouTube. But I want to add some pizzazz to it. Everyone has read and write access to my rules, which is bad, which is very bad. So I'll say public is dissed. You know what's always amazing? In my regular life, I'm pretty certain that I get through three sentences in a row. But then as soon as I'm on camera, I'm just like, stop. You release a new version of your app, and suddenly you hear that the new feature you launched is causing crashes. Everything looks OK, except for chat room's wildcard. But it doesn't really involve pizza this time. I don't know why kids get all the fun. Woo! The zombie has power, zombie can jump. And what exactly is the life for a zombie? This is something people really want to know, Michael. Tell me when the release is. I don't know. Just tell me the release date. I'm not answering <laughs> that one. <laughs> so let's open our pod file in Xcode and add Fabric and Crashlytics pods. I'm not a robot, I promise. Oh, who's a smart little database? He's you are. My Furby is dead. I can do what I want. Uh, can we do that one again? It is ugh. Do you have like a copy of like War and Peace or something? Firebase Semi Live, the live coding show where I live code it right here, but you watch it not live out there. Sharing photos can be hard, especially when everyone's on different devices and using different apps. So we built shared albums in Google Photos, which makes it easy to send photos to anyone using a link. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Firebase Dev Summit. Our mission is to help developers build better apps and grow more successful businesses by providing tools that help you across the life cycle of your app.
did you get into the studio? What are you doing? I gotta go. Jeez. Oh, you blinked.